Section 32 of Memoirs of the Court of Queen Elizabeth. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Memoirs of the Court of Queen Elizabeth, Volumes 1 and 2, by Lucy Aiken. Chapter 20, 1582 to 1587, Part 3. The Earl had actually embarked at a small port in Sussex, when, his project having been betrayed to the government by the mercenary villainy of the master of the vessel and of one of his own servants, orders were issued for his detention, and he was brought back in custody and committed to the tower. The letter just quoted was then produced against him. It was declared to reflect on the justice of the country, and for the double offence of having written it, and of attempting to quit the kingdom without license, he underwent a long imprisonment, and was arbitrarily sentenced to a fine of one thousand pounds, which he proved his inability to pay. The barbarous tyranny which held his body in thraldom served at the same time to rivet more strongly upon his mind the fetters of that stern superstition which had gained dominion over him. The more he endured for his religion, the more awful and important did it appear in his eyes, while in proportion to the severity and tediousness of his sufferings from without, the scenery within became continually more cheerless and terrific, and learning to dread in a future world the prolonged operation of that principle of cruelty under which he groaned in this, he sought to avert its everlasting action by practising upon himself the expiatory rigours of asceticism. The sequel of his melancholy history we shall have occasion to contemplate hereafter. Thomas Percy, Earl of Northumberland, brother to that Earl who had suffered death on account of the Northern Rebellion, by his participation in which he had himself also incurred a fine, though afterwards remitted, was naturally exposed at this juncture to vehement suspicions. After some examinations before the Council, cause was found for his committal to the tower, and here, according to the iniquitous practice of the age, he remained for a considerable time without being brought to trial. At length the public was informed that another prisoner, on a like account having been put to the torture to force disclosures, had revealed matters against the Earl of Northumberland amounting to treason, on which account he had thought fit to anticipate the sentence of the law by shooting himself through the heart. That the Earl was really the author of his own death was indeed proved before a coroner's jury by abundant and unexceptionable testimony, as well as by his deliberate precautions for making his lands descend to his son, and his indignant declaration that the Queen, on whom he bestowed a most opprobrious epithet, should never have his estate, though it may still bear a doubt whether a consciousness of guilt, despair of obtaining justice, or merely the misery of an indefinite captivity, were the motive of the rash act. But the Catholics, actuated by the true spirit of party, added without scruple the death of this nobleman to the, quote, foul and midnight murders, end quote, perpetrated within these gloomy walls. Meantime the opposition to popery, which had now become the reigning principle of English policy, was to be maintained on other ground, and with other weapons than those with which an inquisitorial high commission, or a fierce system of penal enactments, had armed the hands of religious intolerance, political jealousy, or private animosity, and all the more generous and adventurous spirits prepared with alacrity, to draw the sword in the noble cause of Belgian independence, against the united tyranny and bigotry of the detestable Philip the Second. The death of that patriot hero, William Prince of Orange, by the hand of a fanatical assassin, had plunged his country in distress and dismay, and the States-General had again made an earnest tender of their sovereignty to Elizabeth. She once more declined it, from the same motives of caution and anxiety to avoid the imputation of ambitious encroachment on the rights of neighbouring princes, which had formerly determined her but more than ever aware how closely her own safety and welfare were connected with the successful resistance of these provinces, she now consented to send over an army to their succour, and to grant them supplies of money, in consideration of which several cautionary towns were put into her hands. Of these Flushing was one, and Elizabeth gratified at once the Protestant zeal of Philip Sidney and his aspirations after military glory, by appointing him its governor. It was in November 1585 that he took possession of his charge. Meanwhile the Earl of Leicester, whose haughty and grasping spirit led him to covet distinction and authority in every line, was eagerly soliciting the supreme command of this important armament, and in spite of the general mediocrity of his talents and his very slight experience in the art of war, his partial mistress had the weakness to indulge him in this unreasonable and ill-advised pretension. The title of General of the Queen's Auxiliaries in Holland was conferred upon him, and with it a command over the whole English navy, paramount to that of the Lord High Admiral himself. He landed at Flushing, and was received first by its governor, and afterwards by the states of Holland and Zealand, with the highest honours, and with the most magnificent festivities which it was in their power to exhibit. A splendid band of youthful nobility followed in his train, 
The foremost of them all was his stepson, Robert, Earl of Essex, now in his nineteenth year, who had already made his appearance at court, and experienced from Her Majesty a reception which clearly prognosticated, to such as were conversant in the ways of the court, the height of favour to which he was predestined. It was highly characteristic of the jealous haughtiness of Elizabeth's temper, that the extraordinary honours lavished by the states upon Leicester instantly awakened her utmost indignation. She regarded them as too high for any subject, even for him who enjoyed the first place in her royal favour, whom she had invested with an amplitude of authority quite unexampled, and who represented herself in the council of the states-general. She expressed her anger in a tone which made both Leicester and the Belgians tremble, and the explanations and humble submissions of both parties were found scarcely sufficient to appease her. At the same time, the incapacity and misconduct of Leicester as a commander were daily becoming more conspicuous and offensive in the eyes of the Dutch authorities, and the most serious evils would immediately have ensued, but for the prudence, the magnanimity, the conciliating behaviour, and the strenuous exertions by which his admirable nephew laboured unceasingly to remedy his vices and cover his deficiencies. The brilliant valour of the English troops, and particularly of the young nobility and gentry who led them on, was conspicuous in every encounter but the want of a chief able to cope with that accomplished general the Prince of Parma precluded them from effecting any important object. Philip Sidney distinguished himself by a well-conducted surprise of the town of Axel, and received in reward among a number of others the honour of knighthood from the hands of his uncle. Afterwards, having made an attack with the horse under his command on a reinforcement which the enemy was attempting to throw into Zutphen, a hot action ensued, in which, though the advantage remained with the English, it was dearly purchased by the blood of their gallant leader, who received a shot above the knee, which after sixteen days of acute suffering brought his valuable life to its termination. Thus perished at the age of thirty-two Sir Philip Sidney, the pride and pattern of his time, the theme of song, the favourite of English story. The beautiful anecdote of his resigning to the dying soldier the draught of water with which he was about to quench his thirst as he rode faint and bleeding from the fatal field, is told to every child, and inspires a love and reverence for his name which never ceases to cling about the hearts of his countrymen. He is regarded as the most perfect example which English history affords of the Preux Chevalier, and is named in parallel with the spotless and fearless Bayard, the glory of Frenchmen, whom he excelled in all the accomplishments of peace, as much as the other exceeded him in the number and splendour of his military achievements. The demonstrations of grief for his loss, and the honours paid to his memory, went far beyond all former example and appeared to exceed what belonged to a private citizen. The court went into mourning for him, and his remains received a magnificent funeral in St. Paul's, the United Provinces having in vain requested permission to inter him at their own expense, with the promise that he should have as fair a tomb as any prince in Christendom. Elizabeth always remembered him with affection and regret. Cambridge and Oxford published three volumes of Lacrimae on the melancholy event. Spencer in verse, and Camden in prose, commemorated and deplored their friend and patron. A crowd of humbler contemporaries pressed emulously forward to offer up their might of panegyric and lamentation, and it would be endless to enumerate the poets and other writers of later times who have celebrated in various forms the name of Sidney. Foreigners of the highest distinction claimed a share in the general sentiment. Du Plessis Mornay condoled with Walsingham on the loss of his incomparable son-in-law in terms of the deepest sorrow. Count Hohenlohe passionately bewailed his friend and fellow soldier, to whose representations and intercessions he had sacrificed his just indignation against the proceedings of Leicester. Even the hard heart of Philip the Second was touched by the untimely fate of his godson, though slain in bearing arms against him. We are told that on the next tilt-day after the last wife of the Earl of Leicester had borne him a son, Sidney appeared with a shield on which was the word, Sparavi dashed through. This anecdote, if indeed the illusion of the motto be rightly explained, which it is difficult to believe, would serve to show how publicly he had been regarded, both by himself and others, as the heir of his all-powerful uncle. The death of this child, on which occasion adulatory verses were produced by the University of Cambridge, restored Sidney, the year before his death, to this brilliant expectancy, and it cannot reasonably be doubted that the academic honours paid to his memory were, like the court mourning, an homage to the power of the living rather than the virtues of the dead. But though he should be judged to have owed to his connection with a royal favourite much of his contemporary celebrity, and even in some measure his enduring fame, no candid estimator will suffice himself to be hurried, under an idea of correcting the former partiality of fortune, into the clear injustice of denying to this accomplished character a just title to the esteem and admiration of posterity. 
on the contrary it will be considered that the very circumstances which rendered him so early conspicuous would also expose him to the shafts of malice and envy and that if his spirit had not been in reality noble and his conduct irreproachable it would have exceeded all the power of leicester to shield the reputation of his nephew against attacks similar to those from which he had found it impractical to defend his own philip sidney was educated by the cares of a wise and excellent father in the purest and most elevated moral principles and in the best learning of the age a letter of advice addressed to him by this exemplary parent at the age of twelve fully exemplifies both the laudable solicitude of sir henry respecting his future character and the soundness of his views and maxims in the character of his son as advancing to manhood he saw his hopes succeeded and his prayers fulfilled nothing could be more correct than his conduct more laudable than his pursuits while on his travels young as he was he merited the friendship of hubert languet he also gained just and high reputation for the manner in which he acquitted himself of an embassy to the protestant princes of germany though somewhat of the ostentation and family pride of a dudley was apparent in the port which he thought it necessary to assume on the occasion after his return he commenced the life of a courtier and that indiscriminate thirst for glory which was in some measure the foible of his character led him into an ostentatious profusion which by involving his affairs rendered it necessary for him to solicit the pecuniary favours of her majesty and to earn them by some acts of adulation unworthy of his spirit for all these however he made large amends by his noble letter against the french marriage he afterwards took up with a zeal and ability highly honourable to his heart and his head the defence of his father accused but finally acquitted of some stretches of power as lord deputy of ireland this business involved him in disputes with the earl of ormond his father's enemy who seems to have generously overlooked provocations which might have led to more serious consequences in consideration of the filial feelings of his youthful adversary these indications of a bold and forward spirit appear however to have somewhat injured him in the mind of her majesty his advancement by no means kept pace either with his wishes or his wants and a subsequent quarrel with the earl of oxford in which he refused to make the concessions required by the queen reminding her at the same time that it had been her father's policy and ought to be hers rather to countenance the gentry against the arrogance of the great nobles than the contrary sent him in disgust from court retiring to wilton the seat of his brother-in-law the earl of pembroke he composed the arcadia this work he never revised or completed it was published after his death probably contrary to his orders and it is of a kind long since obsolete under all these disadvantages however though faulty in plan and as a whole tedious this romance has been found to exhibit extensive learning a poetical cast of imagination nice discrimination of character and what is far more a fervour of eloquence in the cause of virtue a heroism of sentiment and purity of thought which stamp it for the offspring of a noble mind which evince that the workman was superior to his work but the world reabsorbed him and baffled at court he meditated in correspondence with one of his favourite mottoes aut viam invenium aut facium to join one of the almost piratical expeditions of drake against the spanish settlements perhaps he might then be diverted from his design by the strong and kind warning of his true friend languet quote, to beware lest the thirst of lucre should creep into a mind which had hitherto admitted nothing but the love of truth and an anxiety to deserve well of all men End quote. after the death of this monitor however he engaged in a second scheme of this very questionable nature and was only prevented from embarking by the arrival of the queen's peremptory orders for his return to court and that of fulk greville who accompanied him it would certainly be difficult to defend in point of dignity and consistency his conspicuous appearance as formerly recorded at the triumph held in honour of the french embassy or his attendance upon the duke of anjou on his return to the netherlands the story of his nomination to the throne of poland deserves little regard it is certain that such an elevation was never within his possibilities of attainment his reputation on the continent was however extremely high don john of austria himself esteemed him the great prince of orange corresponded with him as a real friend and du plessis mornay solicited his good offices on behalf of the french protestants nothing but the highest praise is due to his conduct in holland to the valour of a knight-errant he added the best virtues of a commander and counsellor Leicester himself apprehended that it would be scarcely possible for him to sustain his high post without the countenance and assistance of his beloved nephew, and the event showed that he was right. His death was worthy of the best parts of his life. He showed himself to the last devout, courageous, and serene. His wife, the beautiful daughter of Walsingham, his brother Robert, to whom he had performed the part rather of an anxious and indulgent parent than of a brother, and many sorrowing friends surrounded his bed 
their grief was beyond a doubt sincere and poignant, as well as that of the many persons of letters and of worth, who gloried in his friendship and flourished by his bountiful patronage. On the whole, though justice claims the admission that the character of Sidney was not entirely free from the faults most incident to his age and station, and that neither as a writer, a scholar, a soldier, or a statesman, in all which characters during the course of his short life he appeared, and appeared with distinction, is he yet entitled to the highest rank. It may, however, be firmly maintained that, as a man, an accomplished and high-souled man, he had among his contemporary countrymen neither equal nor competitor. Such was the verdict in his own times not of flatterers only, or friends, but of England, of Europe. Such is the title of merit under which the historian may enroll him, with confidence and with complacency, among the illustrious few whose name and example still serve to kindle in the bosom of youth the animating glow of virtuous emulation. Leicester never appears in an amiable light except in connection with his nephew, for whom his affection was not only sincere but ardent. A few extracts from a letter written by him to Sir Thomas Heneage, captain of the Queen's Guards, giving an account of the action in which Sidney received his mortal wound, will illustrate this remark, while it records the gallant exploits of several of his companions in arms. After relating that Sir Philip had gone out with a party to intercept a convoy of the enemies, he adds, quote, Many of our horses were hurt and killed among which was my nephew's own. He went in change to another, and would needs to the charge again, and once passed those musketeers, where he received a sore wound upon his thigh, three fingers above his knee, the bone broken quite in pieces. But for which chance God did send such a day as I think was never many years seen, so few against so many." The Earl then enumerates the other commanders and distinguished persons engaged in the action. Colonel Norris, the Earl of Essex, Sir Thomas Perrault, quote, and my unfortunate Philip, with Sir William Russell and diverse gentlemen, and not one hurt but only my nephew. They killed four of their enemies' chief leaders, and carried the valiant Count Hannibal Gonzaga away with them upon a horse. Also took Captain George Cressier, the principal soldier of the camp, and captain of all the Albanese. My Lord Willoughby overthrew him at the first encounter, man and horse. The gentleman did acknowledge it himself. There is not a properer gentleman in the world towards than this Lord Willoughby is but I can hardly praise one more than another, they all did so well. Yet every one had his horse killed or hurt, and it was thought very strange that Sir William Stanley, with three hundred of his men, should pass, in spite of so many muskets, such troops of horse three several times, making them remove their ground, and to return with no more loss than he did. Albeit, I must say it, it was too much loss for me, for this young man, he was my greatest comfort, next her majesty, of all the world, and if I could buy his life with all I have, to my shirt I would give it. How God will dispose of him I know not, but fear I must needs greatly the worst, the blow in so dangerous a place and so great, yet did I never hear of any man that did abide the dressing and setting of his bones better than he did, and he was carried afterwards in my barge to Arnheim, and I fear this day he is still of good heart, and comforteth all about him as much as may be. God of his mercy grant me his life, which I cannot but doubt of greatly. I was abroad that time in the field giving some order to supply that business which did endure almost two hours in continual fight and meeting Philip coming upon his horseback, not a little to my grief. But I would you had stood by to hear his most loyal speeches to Her Majesty, his constant mind to the cause, his loving care over me, and his most resolute determination for death, not one jot appalled for his blow, which is the most grievous I ever saw with such a bullet. Riding so a long mile and a half upon his horse, ere he came to the camp, not ceasing to speak still of Her Majesty, being glad if his hurt and death might any way honour Her Majesty, for hers he was whilst he lived and God's he was sure to be if he died. Prayed all men to think the cause was as well Her Majesty's as the country's, and not to be discouraged, for you have seen such success as may encourage us all, and this my hurt is the ordinance of God by the hap of the war. Well, I pray God, if it be his will, save me his life, even as well for Her Majesty's service sake as for mine own comfort." Sir Henry Sidney was spared the anguish of following such a son to the grave, having himself quitted the scene a few months before. It was in 1578 that he received orders to resign the government of Ireland, having become obnoxious to the gentlemen of the English Pale by his rigour in levying certain assessments for the maintenance of troops and the expenses of his own household, which they affirmed to be illegally imposed. There is every reason to believe that their complaint was well founded. But Elizabeth, refusing as usual to allow her prerogative to be touched, imprisoned several Irish lawyers, who came to England to appeal against the tax and Sir Henry, being able to prove that he had royal warrant for what he had done, was finally exonerated by the Privy Council from all the charges which had been preferred against him, 
and retained to the last his office of Lord President of Wales. The sound judgment of Sir Henry Sidney taught him that his near connection with the Earl of Leicester had its dangers as well as its advantages, and observing the turn for show and expense with which it served to inspire the younger members of his family, he would frequently enjoin them, quote, to consider more whose sons than whose nephews they were, end quote. In fact, he was not able to lay up fortunes for them. The offices he held were higher in dignity than emolument. His spirit was noble and munificent, and the following, among other anecdotes, may serve to show that he himself was not averse to a certain degree of parade, at least on particular occasions. The Queen, standing once at a window of her palace at Hampton Court, saw a gentleman approach escorted by two hundred attendants on horseback, and turning to her courtier she asked with some surprise who this might be. But on being informed that it was Sir Henry Sidney, her Lord Deputy of Ireland and President of Wales, she answered, quote, and he may well do it, for he has two of the best offices in my kingdom. End quote. The following letter, addressed to Sir Henry as Lord President of Wales, discloses an additional trait of his character, which cannot fail to recommend him still more to the esteem of a humane and enlightened age. His reluctance, namely, to lend his concurrence to the measures of religious persecution which the Queen and her bishops now urged upon all persons in authority as their incumbent duty. Sir Francis Walsingham to Sir H. Sidney, Lord President of Wales. Quote, My very good Lord, My lords of late calling here to remembrance the commission that was more than a year ago given out to your lordship and certain others for the reformation of the recusants and obstinate persons in religion, within Wales and the marches thereof, marvelled very much that in all this time they have heard of nothing done by you and the rest. And truly, my lord, the necessity of this time requiring so greatly to have these kind of men diligently and sharply proceeded against, there will be here a very hard construction be made, I fear me, of you, to retain with you the said commission so long, doing no good therein. Of late now I received your lordship's letter touching such persons as you think meet to have the custody and oversight of Montgomery Castle, by which it appeareth you have begun in your present journeys in Wales to do somewhat in causes of religion. But having a special commission for that purpose, in which are named special and very apt persons to join with you in those matters, it will be thought strange to my lords to hear of your proceeding in those causes without their assistance. And therefore, to the end their lordships should conceive no otherwise than well of your dealing without them, I have forborne to acquaint them with our late letter, wishing your lordship, for the better handling and success of those matters in religion, you called unto you the Bishop of Worcester, Mr. Phillips, and certain others specially named in the commission. They will, I am sure, be glad to wait on you in so good a service, and your proceeding together with them in these matters will be better allowed of here, etc. P.S. Your Lordship had need to walk warily, for your doings are narrowly observed, and Her Majesty is apt to give ear to any that shall ill you. Great hold is taken by your enemies for neglecting the execution of this commission. Oatlands, August 9th, 1580. End quote. Leicester, soon after the death of his nephew, placed his army in winter quarters, having effected no one object of importance. The states remonstrated with him in strong terms on the various and grievous abuses of his administration. He answered them in the tone of graciousness and conciliation which it suited his purpose to assume, and publicly surrendering up to them the whole apparent authority of the provinces, whilst by a secret act of restriction he in fact retained for himself full command over all the governors of towns and provinces, he set sail for England. Elizabeth received her favourite with her usual complacency, either because his abject submissions had in reality succeeded in banishing from her mind all resentment of his conduct in Holland, or because she required the support of his long-tried counsels under the awful responsibilities of that impending conflict with the whole collected force of the Spanish monarchy for which she felt herself summoned to prepare. The King of Denmark, astonished to behold a princess of Elizabeth's experienced caution, involving herself with seeming indifference in peril so great and so apparent, exclaimed that she had now taken the diadem from her brow to place it on the doubtful cast of war, and trembling for the fate of his friend and ally, he dispatched an ambassador in haste to offer her his mediation for the adjustment of all differences arising out of the revolt of the Netherlands. But Elizabeth firmly, though with thanks, declined all overtures towards a reconciliation with a sovereign whom she now recognized as her implacable and determined foe. She was far, however, from despising the danger which she braved and with a prudence and diligence equal to her fortitude, she had begun to assemble and put in action all her means, internal and external, of defence and annoyance. She linked herself still more closely, by benefits and promises, with the Prince of Condé, chief of the Huguenots, now in arms against the League, or Catholic Association, formed in France under the auspices of the King of Spain. With the King of Scots, also, she entered into an intimate alliance, 
and she had previously secured the friendship of all the Protestant princes of Germany and the northern powers of Europe. She now openly avowed the enterprises of Drake, which she had hitherto only encouraged underhand, or on certain pretexts of retaliation, and she sent him with a fleet of twenty-one ships, carrying above eleven thousand soldiers, to make war upon the Spanish settlements in the West Indies. But if all these measures seemed likely to afford her kingdom sufficient means of protection against the attacks of a foreign enemy, it was difficult for her to regard her own person as equally well secured against the dark conspiracies of her Catholic subjects, instigated as they were by the sanguinary maxims of the Romish See, fostered by the atrocious activity of the emissaries of Philip, and sanctioned by the authority of the Queen of Scots, to whom homage was rendered by her party as rightful sovereign of the British Isles. During the festival of Easter, 1586, some English priests of the seminary at Reims had encouraged a fanatical soldier named Savage to vow the death of the queen. About the same time, Ballard, also a priest of this seminary, was concerting in France, with Mendoza and the fugitive Lord Paget, the means of procuring an invasion of the country during the absence of its best troops in Flanders. Repairing to England, Ballard communicated both these schemes to Anthony Babington, a gentleman who had been gained over on a visit to France by the Bishop of Glasgow, Mary's ambassador there, and whose vehement attachment to her cause had rendered him capable of any enterprise, however criminal or desperate, for her deliverance. Babington entered into both plots with eagerness, but he suggested that so essential a part of the action as the assassination of the Queen ought not to be entrusted to one adventurer, and he lost no time in associating five others in the vow of Savage, himself undertaking the part of setting free the captive Mary. With her he had previously been in correspondence, having frequently taken the charge of transmitting to her by secret channels her letters from France, and he immediately imparted to her this new design for her restoration to liberty and advancement to the English throne. There is full evidence that Mary approved it in all its parts, that in several successive letters she gave Babington counsels or directions relative to its execution, and that she promised to the perpetrators of the murder of Elizabeth every reward which it should hereafter be in her power to bestow. All this time the vigilant eye of Walsingham was secretly fixed on the secure conspirators. He held a thread which vibrated to their every motion, and he was patiently awaiting the moment of their complete entanglement to spring forth and seize his victims. To the Queen, and to her only, he communicated the daily intelligence which he received from a spy who had introduced himself into all their secrets, and Elizabeth had the firmness to hasten nothing, though a picture was actually shown her in which the six assassins had absurdly caused themselves to be represented with a motto underneath intimating their common design. These dreadful visages remained, however, so perfectly impressed on her memory that she immediately recognized one of the conspirators who had approached very near her person as she was one day walking in her garden. She had the intrepidity to fix him with a look which daunted him, and afterwards, turning to her captain of the guards, she remarked that she was well guarded, not having a single armed man at the time about her. At length Walsingham judged it time to interpose and rescue his sovereign from her perilous situation. Ballard was first seized, and soon after Babington and his associates. All, overcome by terror or allured by vain hopes, severally and voluntarily confessed their guilt and accused their accomplices. The nation was justly exasperated against the partakers in a plot which comprised foreign invasion, domestic insurrection, the assassination of a beloved sovereign, the elevation to the throne of her feared and hated rival, and the restoration of popery. The traitors suffered, notwithstanding the interest which the extreme youth and good moral characters of most or all of them were formed to inspire, amid the execrations of the Protestant spectators. But what was to be the fate of that quote -unquote, pretender to the crown, on whose behalf and with whose privity this foul conspiracy had been entered into, and who was by the late statute, passed with a view to this very case, liable to condign punishment? This was now the important question which awaited the decision of Elizabeth and divided the judgments of her most confidential counsellors. Some advised that the royal captive should be spared the ignominy of any public proceeding, but that her attendants should be removed and her custody rendered so severe as to preclude all possibility of her renewing her pestilent intrigues. Leicester, in conformity with the baseness and atrocity of his character, is related to have suggested the employment of treachery against the life of a prisoner whom it appeared equally dangerous to spare or to punish and to have sent a divine to convince Walsingham of the lawfulness of taking her off by poison. But that minister rejected the proposal with abhorrence, and concurred with the majority of the council in urging the queen to bring her without fear or scruple to an open trial. In favour of this measure Elizabeth at length decided, and steps were taken accordingly. 
by means of well-concerted precautions mary had been kept in total ignorance of the apprehension of the conspirators till their confessions had been made and their fates decided a gentleman was then sent to her from the court to announce that all was discovered it was just as she had mounted her horse to take her usual exercise with her keepers that this alarming message was delivered to her and for obvious reasons she was compelled to proceed on her excursion instead of returning as she desired to her chamber meantime all her papers were seized sealed up and conveyed to the queen amongst them were letters from a large proportion of the nobility and other leading characters of the english court filled with expressions of attachment to the person of the queen of scots and sympathy in her misfortunes not unmixed in all probability with severe reflections on the conduct of her rival and oppressor all these elizabeth perused and no doubt stored up in her memory but her good sense and prudence supplied on this occasion the place of magnanimity and well knowing that the conscious fears of the writers would be ample security for their future conduct she buried in lasting silence and apparent oblivion all the discoveries which had reached her through this channel the principal domestics of mary were now apprehended and committed to different keepers and now and curl her two secretaries were sent prisoners to london she herself was immediately removed from tutbury and conveyed with a great attendance of the neighbouring gentry and with pauses at several noblemen's houses by the way to the strong castle of fotheringay in northamptonshire this part of the business was safely and prudently conducted by sir amias paulet and he received for his encouragement and reward the following characteristic letter subscribed by the hand of her majesty and surely of her own inditing Quote, to my faithful amias amias my most careful servant God reward thee treblefold in the double for thy most troublesome charge so well discharged. If you knew, my Amias, how kindly, besides dutifully, my grateful heart accepteth your double labours and faithful actions, your wise orders and safe conduct performed in so dangerous and crafty a charge, it would ease your troubles and rejoice your heart. And which I charge you to carry this most just thought, that I cannot balance in any weight of my judgment the value I prize you at, and suppose no treasure to countervail such a faith, and condemn myself in that fault which I have committed, if I reward not such deserts. Yea, let me lack when I have most need, if I acknowledge not such a merit with a reward, non omnibus datum. But let your wicked mistress know how with hearty sorrow her vile deserts compel those orders, and bid her from me ask God forgiveness for her treacherous dealing toward the savour of her life many years, to the intolerable peril of her own and yet not content with so many forgivenesses, must fall again so horribly, far passing a woman, much more a princess. Instead of accusing thereof, not one can serve, it being so plainly confessed by the authors of my guiltless death. Let repentance take place, and let not the fiend possess so as her best part be lost, which I pray, with hands lifted up to him that may both save and spill, with my loving adieu and prayer for thy long life, your assured and loving sovereign in heart, by good desert induced, Elizabeth R. End quote. Soon after the arrival of Mary at Fotheringay, Elizabeth, according to the provisions of the late Act, issued out a commission to forty noblemen and privy councillors, empowering them to try and pass sentence upon Mary, daughter and heir of King James V, and late Queen of Scots. For it was thus that she was designated, with the view of intimating to her that she was no longer to be regarded as possessing the rights of a sovereign princess. Thirty-six of the commissioners repaired immediately to Fotheringay, where they arrived on October ninth, 1586, and cited Mary to appear before them. This summons she refused to obey, on the double ground that as an absolute princess she was free from all human jurisdiction, since kings only could be her peers, and that having been detained in England as a prisoner, she had not enjoyed the protection of the laws, and consequently ought not in equity to be regarded as amenable to their sentence weighty as these objections may appear the commissioners refused to admit them and declared that they would proceed to judge her by default this menace she at first disregarded but soon after overcome by the artful representations of hatton on the inferences which must inevitably be drawn from her refusal to justify herself for the satisfaction of a princess who had declared that she desired nothing so much as the establishment of her innocence she changed her mind and consented to plead none of her papers were restored no counsel was assigned her and her request that her two secretaries, whose evidence was principally relied on by the prosecutors, might be confronted with her, was denied. But all these were hardships customarily inflicted on prisoners accused of high treason, and it does not appear that, with respect to its forms and modes of proceedings, Mary had cause to complain that her trial was other than a regular and legal one. End of section 32 
Section 33 of Memoirs of the Court of Queen Elizabeth. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Memoirs of the Court of Queen Elizabeth, Volumes 1 and 2, by Lucy Aiken. Chapter 20, 1582 to 1587, Part 4. On her first appearance, she renewed her protestation against the competence of the tribunal. Bromley, Lord Chancellor, answered her, showing the jurisdiction of the English law over all persons within the country, and the commissioners ordered both the objection and the reply to be registered, as if to save the point of law, but it does not appear that it was ever referred for decision to any other authority. Intercepted letters, authenticated by the testimony of her secretaries, formed the chief evidence against Mary. From these the Crown lawyers showed, and she did not attempt to deny, that she had suffered her correspondence to address her as Queen of England, that she had endeavoured by means of English fugitives to incite the Spaniards to invade the country, and that she had been negotiating at Rome the terms of a transfer of all her claims, present and future, to the King of Spain, disinheriting by this unnatural act her own schismatic son. The further charge of having concurred in the late plot for the assassination of Elizabeth she strongly denied and attempted to disprove, but it stood on equally good evidence with all the rest, and in spite of some suggestions of which her modern partisans have endeavoured to give her the benefit, there appears no solid foundation on which an impartial inquirer can rest any doubt of the fact. The deportment of Mary on this trying emergency exhibited somewhat of the dignity, but more of the spirit and adroitness for which she has been famed. She justified her negotiations, or intrigues, with foreign princes, on the ground of her inalienable right to employ all the means within her power for the recovery of that liberty of which she had been cruelly and unjustly deprived. With great effrontery she persisted in denying that she had ever entertained with Babington any correspondence whatever, and she urged that his pretending to receive, or having in fact received, letters written in her cipher, was no conclusive proof against her, since it was the same which she used in her French correspondence, and might have fallen into other hands. But finding herself hard-pressed by evidence on this part of the subject, she afterwards hazarded a rash attempt to fix on Walsingham the imputation of having suborned witnesses and forged letters for her destruction. The aged minister, greatly moved by this attack upon his character, immediately rose and asserted his innocence in a manner so solemn, and with such circumstantial corroboration, as compelled her to retract the accusation with an apology. On some mention of the Earl of Arundel and Lord William Howard his brother, which occurred in the intercepted letters, she sighed, and exclaimed with a feeling which did her honour, quote, Alas, what has not the noble house of Howard suffered for my sake? End quote. On the whole, her presence of mind was remarkable, though the quick sensibilities of her nature could not be withheld from breaking out at times, either in vehement sallies of anger or long fits of weeping, as the sense of past and present injuries, or of her forlorn and afflicted state and the perils and sufferings which still menaced her, rose by turns upon her agitated and affrighted mind. The commissioners, after a full hearing of the cause, quitted Fotheringay, and meeting again in the Star Chamber, summoned before them the two secretaries, who voluntarily confirmed on oath the whole of their former depositions. After this they proceeded to a unanimous sentence of death against Mary, which was immediately transmitted to the Queen for her approbation. On the same day a declaration was published on the part of the commissioners and judges, importing that the sentence did in no manner derogate from the titles and honours of the King of Scots. Most of the subsequent steps taken by Elizabeth in this unhappy business are marked with the features of that intense selfishness which, scrupling nothing for the attainment of its own mean objects, seldom fails by exaggerated efforts and overstrained manoeuvres to expose itself to detection and merited contempt. Never had she enjoyed a higher degree of popularity than at this juncture. The late discoveries had opened to view a series of popish machinations which had fully justified, in the eyes of an alarmed and irritated people, even those previous measures of severity on the part of her government, which had most contributed to provoke these attempts. The Queen was more than ever the heroine of the Protestant party, and the image of those imminent and hourly perils to which her zeal in the good cause had exposed her, inflamed to enthusiasm the sentiment of loyalty. On occasion of the detection of Babington's plot, the whole people gave themselves up to rejoicings. Sixty bonfires, says the chronicler, were kindled between Ludgate and Charing Cross, and tables were set out in the open streets at which happy neighbours feasted together. The condemnation of the Queen of Scots produced similar demonstrations. After her sentence had been ratified by both Houses of Parliament, it was thought expedient, probably by way of feeling the pulse of the people, that solemn proclamation of it should be made in London by the Lord Mayor and City officers, 
and by the magistrates of the county in Westminster. The multitude, untouched by the long misfortunes of an unhappy princess born of the blood royal of England and heiress to its throne, insensible too of everything arbitrary, unprecedented, or unjust, in the treatment to which she had been subjected, received the notification of her doom with expressions of triumph and exultation truly shocking. Bonfires were lighted, church-bells were rung, and every street and lane throughout the city resounded with psalms of thanksgiving. It is manifest, therefore, that no deference for the opinions or feelings of her subjects compelled Elizabeth to hesitate or to dissemble in this matter. Had she permitted the execution of the sentence simply and without delay, all orders of men attached to the Protestant establishment would have approved it as an act fully justified by state expediency and the law of self-defence and though misgivings might have arisen in the minds of some on cooler reflection, when alarm had subsided and the bitterness of satiated revenge had begun to make itself felt, these quote-unquote compunctious visitings could have led to no consequences capable of alarming her. It must have been felt as highly inequitable to reproach the Queen, when all was past and irrevocable, for the consent which she had afforded to a deed sanctioned by a law, ratified by the legislature and applauded by the people, and from which both church and state had reaped the fruits of security and peace. Foreign princes also would have respected the vigour of this proceeding. They would not have been displeased to see themselves spared by a decisive act the pain of making disregarded representations on such a subject, and a secret consciousness that few of their number would have scrupled under all the circumstances to take like vengeance on a deadly foe and rival might further have contributed to reconcile them to the fact. Even as it was, Pope Sixtus V himself could scarcely restrain his expressions of admiration at the completion of so strong a measure as the final execution of the sentence. His Holiness had indeed a strange passion for capital punishments, and he is said to have envied the Queen of England the glorious satisfaction of cutting off a royal head, a sentiment not much more extraordinary from such a personage than the ardent desire which he is reported to have expressed, that it were possible for him to have a son by this heretic princess, because the offspring of such parents could not fail, he said, to make himself king of the world. But it was the weakness of Elizabeth to imagine that an extraordinary parade of reluctance, and the interposition of some affected delays, would change in public opinion the whole character of the deed which she contemplated, and preserve to her the reputation of feminine mildness and sensibility, without the sacrifice of that great revenge on which she was secretly bent. The world, however, when it has no interest in deceiving itself, is too wise to accept of words instead of deeds, or in opposition to them and the sole result of her artifices was to aggravate in the eyes of all mankind the criminality of the act, by giving it rather the air of a treacherous and cold-blooded murder than of solemn execution done upon a formidable culprit by the sentence of offended laws. The Parliament which Elizabeth had summoned to partake the odium of Mary's death met four days after the judges had pronounced her doom, and was opened by commission. A unanimous ratification of the sentence by both houses was immediately carried, and followed by an earnest address to Her Majesty for its publication and execution, to which she returned a long and laboured answer. She began with the expression of her fervent gratitude to Providence for the affections of her people, adding protestations of her love towards them, and of her perfect willingness to have suffered her own life still to remain exposed as a mark to the aim of enemies and traitors, had she not perceived how intimately the safety and well-being of the nation was connected with her own. With regard to the Queen of Scots, she said so severe had been the grief which she had sustained from her recent conduct, that the fear of renewing this sentiment had been the cause, and the sole cause, of her withholding her personal appearance at the opening of that assembly, where she knew that the subject must of necessity become matter of discussion, and not, as had been suggested, the apprehension of any violence to be attempted against her person. Yet she might mention that she had actually seen a bond by which the subscribers bound themselves to procure her death within a month. So far was she from indulging any ill-will against one of the same sex, the same rank, the same race as herself, in fact her nearest kinswoman, that after having received full information of certain of her machinations, she had secretly written with her own hand to the Queen of Scots, promising that, on a simple confession of her guilt in a private letter to herself, all should be buried in oblivion. She doubted not that the ancient laws of the land would have been sufficient to reach the guilt of her who had been the great artificer of the recent treasons and she had consented to the passing of the late statute not for the purpose of ensnaring her, but rather to give her warning of the danger in which she stood. Her lawyers, from their strict attachment to ancient forms, would have brought this princess to trial within the county of Stafford, had compelled her to hold up her hand at the bar, and have caused twelve jurymen to pass judgment upon her. 
but to her it had appeared more suitable to the dignity of the prisoner and the importance of the cause to refer the examination to the judges, nobles, and counsellors of the realm, happy if even thus she could escape that ready censure to which the conspicuous station of sovereigns on all occasions exposed them. The statute, by requiring her to pronounce judgment upon her kinswoman, had involved her in anxiety and difficulties. Amid all her perils, however, she must remember with gratitude and affection the voluntary association into which her subjects had entered for her defence. It was never her practice to decide hastily on any matter. In a case so rare and important, some interval of deliberation must be allowed her, and she would pray heaven to enlighten her mind, and guide it to the decision most beneficial to the church, to the state, and to the people. Twelve days after the delivery of this speech, Her Majesty sent a message to both houses, entreating that her Parliament would carefully reconsider the matter, and endeavour to hit upon some device by which the life of the Queen of Scots might be rendered consistent with her own safety and that of the country. Her faithful Parliament, however, soon after acquainted her that with their utmost diligence they had found it impracticable to form any satisfactory plan of the kind she desired, and the speakers of the two houses ended a long representation of the mischiefs to be expected from any arrangement by which Mary would be suffered to continue in life, with a most earnest and humble petition that Her Majesty would not longer deny to the united wishes and entreaties of all England what it would be iniquitous to refuse to the meanest individual, the execution of justice. Elizabeth, after pronouncing a second long harangue designed to display her own clemency, to upbraid the malice of her libellers, and to refute the suspicion which her conscience no doubt helped her to anticipate, that all this irresolution was but feigned, and that the decisions of the two houses were influenced by a secret acquaintance with her wishes, again dismissed their petitions without any positive answer. Soon after, however, she permitted herself to authorize the proclamation of the sentence, and sent Lord Buckhurst and Beale, clerk of the council, to announce it to Mary herself. During the whole of this time the kings of France and of Scotland were interceding by their ambassadors for the pardon of the illustrious prisoner. How the representations of Henry the Third were received we do not find minutely recorded. But Elizabeth knew that they might be safely disregarded, that the monarch was himself too much a sufferer by the arrogance and ambition of the House of Guise, to be very strenuous in his friendship towards any one so nearly connected with it. And it is even said that, while a sense of decorum extorted from him in public some energetic expressions of the interest taken by him in the fate of a sister-in-law and Queen Dowager of France, a sentiment of regard for Elizabeth, his friend and ally, prompted him to counsel her, through a secret agent, to execute the sentence with the least possible delay. Of the treatment experienced by the master of Grey, the envoy of James, we gain some particulars from an original memorial drawn up by himself. He appears to have reached Ware on December 24th, whence he sent to desire Keith and Douglas, the resident Scotch ambassadors, to announce to the Queen his approach, and she voluntarily promised that the life of Mary should be spared till his proposals were heard. His reception in London was somewhat ungracious. No one was sent to welcome or convoy him and it was ten days before he and Sir Robert Melville, his coadjutor, were admitted to an audience. Elizabeth's first address to them was, quote, A thing long looked for should be welcomed when it comes. I would now see your master's officers. End quote. Gray desired first to be assured that the cause for which those offers were made was, quote, unquote, still extant, that is, that the life of Mary was still safe, and should be so till their mission had been heard. She answered, quote, I think it be extant yet, but I will not promise for an hour. End quote. They then brought forward certain proposals, not here recited, which she rejected with contempt, and calling in Leicester, the Lord Admiral, and Hatton, quote unquote, very despitefully repeated them in hearing of them all. Grey then propounded his last offer, that the Queen of Scots should resign all her claims upon the English succession to her son, by which means the hopes of the Papists would, as he said, be cut off. The terms in which this overture was made Elizabeth affected not to understand. Leicester explained their meaning to be that the King of Scots should be put in his mother's place. Quote, Is it so? the Queen answered. Then I put myself in a worse case than before. By God's passion that were to cut my own throat, and for a duchy or an earldom to yourself, you or such as you, would cause some of your desperate knaves to kill me. No, by God, he shall never be in that place. End quote. Gray answered, quote, he craves nothing of your majesty but only of his mother. Quote, that, said Leicester, were to make him party, or rival or adversary, to the queen my mistress. Quote, he will be far more party, replied Grey, if he be in her place through her death. End quote. Her majesty exclaimed that she should not have a worse in his mother's place, and added, quote, tell your king what good I have done for him in holding the crown on his head since he was born, 
and that I mind, or intend, to keep the league that now stands between us, and if he break it, it shall be a double fault. End quote. With this speech she would have left them, but they persisted in arguing the matter further, though in vain. Gray then requested that Mary's life might be spared for fifteen days. The Queen refused. Sir Robert Melville begged for only eight days. She said not for an hour, and so quitted them. After this, the Scotch ambassadors assumed a tone of menace, but the perfidious Gray secretly fortified Elizabeth's resolution with the proverb, quote, The dead cannot bite, end quote and undertook soon to pacify, in any event, the anger of his master, whose minion he at this time was. No sooner had Elizabeth silenced with this show of inflexibility all the pleadings or menaces by which others had attempted to divert her from her fatal aim, than she began, as in the affair of the French marriage, to feel her own resolution waver. It appears unquestionable that to affected delays a real hesitation succeeded. When her pride was no longer irritated by opposition, she had leisure to survey the meditated deed in every light, and as it rose upon her view in all its native deformity, anxious fears for her own fame and credit, yet untainted by any crime, and perhaps genuine scruples of conscience, forcibly assailed her resolution. But her ministers, deeply sensible that both she and they had already gone too far to recede with reputation or with safety, encountered her growing reluctance with a proportional increase in the vehemence of their clamours for what they called, and perhaps thought, justice all the hazards to which her excess of clemency might be imagined to expose her, were conjured up in the most alarming forms to repel her scruples. A plot for her assassination was disclosed, to which the French ambassador was ascertained to have been privy. Rumours were raised of invasions and insurrections, and it may be suspected that the Queen, really alarmed in the first instance by the representations of her council, voluntarily contributed afterwards to keep up these delusions for the sake of terrifying the minds of men into an approval of the deed of blood. At length, on February 1st, 1587, Her Majesty ordered Secretary Davison to bring her the warrant, which had remained ready drawn in his hands for some weeks, and having signed it, she told him to get it sealed with the great seal, and in his way to call on Walsingham and tell him what she had done, quote, though, she added smiling, I fear he will die of grief when he hears of it, end quote, this minister being then sick. Davison obeyed her directions, and the warrant was sealed. The next day he received a message from her, purporting that he should forbear to carry the warrant to the Lord Keeper till further orders. Surprised and perplexed, he immediately waited upon her to receive her further directions, when she chid him for the haste he had used in this matter, and talked in a fluctuating and undetermined matter respecting it, which greatly alarmed him. On leaving the Queen, he immediately communicated the circumstances to Burley and Hatton, and thinking it safest for himself to rid his hands of the warrant, he delivered it up to Burley, by whom it had been drawn, and from whom he had at first received it. A council was now called, consisting of such of the ministers as either the Queen herself or Davison had made acquainted with the signing of the warrant, and it was proposed that, without any further communication with Her Majesty, it should be sent down for immediate execution to the four earls to whom it was directed. Davison appears to have expressed some fears that he should be made to bear the blame of this step, but all his fellow councillors then present joined to assure him that they would share the responsibility. It was also said that Her Majesty had desired of several that she might not be troubled respecting any of the particulars of the last dismal scene. Consequently, it was impossible that she could complain of their proceeding without her privity. By these arguments Davison was seduced to give his concurrence, and Beale, a person noted for the vehemence of his attachment to the Protestant cause and to the title of the Countess of Hartford, was dispatched with the instrument in obedience to which Mary underwent the fatal stroke on February 8th. The news of this event was received by Elizabeth with the most extraordinary demonstrations of astonishment, grief, and anger. Her countenance changed, her voice faltered, and she remained for some moments fixed and motionless. A violent burst of tears and lamentations succeeded, with which she mingled expressions of rage against her whole council. They had committed, she said, a crime never to be forgiven. They had put to death without her knowledge her dear kinswoman and sister, against whom they well knew that it was her fixed resolution never to proceed to this fatal extremity. She put on deep mourning, kept herself retired among her ladies, abandoned to sighs and tears, and drove from her presence with the most furious reproaches such of her ministers as ventured to approach her. She caused several of the councillors to be examined as to the share which they had taken in this transaction. Burley was of the number, and against him she expressed herself with such peculiar bitterness that he gave himself up for lost, and begged permission to retire with the loss of all his employments. This resignation was not accepted, 
and after a considerable interval during which this great minister deprecated the wrath of his sovereign in letters of penitence and submission worthy only of an oriental slave she condescended to be reconciled to a man whose services she felt to be indispensable but the manes of mary or the indignation of her son could not be appeased it seems without a sacrifice and a fit victim was at hand from some words dropped by lord burleigh on his examination it had appeared that it was the declaration of davison respecting the sentiments of the queen as expressed to himself which had finally decided the council to send down the warrant and on this ground proceedings were instituted against the unfortunate secretary he was stripped of his office sent to the tower in spite of the warm and honest remonstrances of burleigh and after several examinations subjected to a process in the star chamber for a twofold contempt first in revealing her majesty's counsels to others of her ministers secondly in giving up to them an instrument which she had committed to him in special trust and secrecy to be kept in case of any sudden emergency which might require its use davison demanded that his own examination which with that of burley formed the whole evidence against him should be read entire instead of being picked and garbled by the crown lawyers but this piece of justice the queen's counsel refused him on the ground that they contained matter unfit to be divulged he was found guilty and sentenced to a fine of ten thousand marks and imprisonment during the queen's pleasure by judges who at the same time expressed a high opinion both of his abilities and his integrity and who certainly regarded his office as nothing more than an error of judgment or want of due caution elizabeth ordered a copy of his sentence to be immediately transmitted to the king of scots as triumphant evidence of that perfect innocence in the tragical accident of his mother's death of which she had already made solemn protestation james complied so far with obvious motives of policy as to accept her excuses without much inquiry but impartial posterity will not be disposed to dismiss so readily an important and curious investigation which it possesses abundant means of pursuing the record of burleigh's examination is still extant and so likewise is davison's apology a piece which was composed by himself at the time and addressed to walsingham who could best judge of its accuracy and which after being communicated to camden who has inserted an extract from it in his annals has at length been found entire among the original papers of sir amias paulet from this authentic source we derive the following very extraordinary particulars it was by the lord admiral that the queen first sent a message to davison requiring him to bring the warrant for her signature after subscribing it she asked him if he were not heartily sorry it were done to which he replied by a moderate and cautious approval of the act she bade him tell the chancellor when he carried the warrant to be sealed that he must quote, use it as secretly as might be end quote. she then signed other papers which he had brought dispatching them all quote, with the best disposition and willingness that could be end quote. afterwards she recurred to the subject mentioned that she had delayed the act so long that the world might see quote, that she had not been violently or maliciously drawn into it end quote, but that she had all along perceived the necessity of it to her own security she then said that she would have done it as secretly as might be and not in the open court or green of the castle but in the hall just as davison was gathering up his papers to depart quote, she fell into some complaint of sir amias paulet and others that might have eased her of this burden end quote, and she desired that he would yet quote, deal with secretary walsingham to write jointly to sir amias and sir drew drury to sound them in this matter aiming still at this that it might be so done as the blame might be removed from herself end quote this nefarious commission davison strangely consented to execute though he declares that he had always before refused to meddle therein quote, upon sundry of her majesty's motions end quote, as a thing which he utterly disapproved and though he was fully persuaded that the wisdom and integrity of sir amias would render the application fruitless the queen repeated her injunctions of secrecy in the matter and he departed he went to walsingham told him that the warrant was signed for executing the sentence against the queen of scots agreed with him at the same time about the letter to be written to sir amias for her private assassination then got the warrant sealed then dispatched the letter the next morning the queen sent him word to forbear going to the chancellor till she had spoken with him again he went directly to acquaint her that he had already seen him she asked quote, what needed such haste End quote. he pleaded her commands and the danger of delay the queen particularized some other form in which she thought it would be safer and better for her to have the thing done davison answered that the just and honourable way would he thought be the safest and the best if she meant to have it done at all the queen made no reply but went to dinner it appears from another statement of davison's case also drawn up by himself that it was on this very day without waiting either for paulet's answer or for more explicit orders from her majesty that he had the incredible rashness to deliver up the warrant to burleigh and to concur in the subsequent proceedings of the council 
though aware that the members were utterly ignorant of the queen's application to paulet a day or two after her majesty called him to her in the privy chamber and told him smiling that she had been troubled with him in a dream which she had had the night before that the queen of scots was put to death and which so disturbed her that she thought she could have run him through with a sword he answered at first jestingly but on recollection asked her with great earnestness whether she did not intend that the matter should go forward she answered vehemently and with an oath that she did but again harped upon the old string that this mode would cast all the blame upon herself and a better might be contrived the same afternoon she inquired if he had received an answer from sir amias which at the time he had not but he brought it to her the next morning it contained an absolute refusal to be concerned in any action inconsistent with justice and honour at this the queen was much offended she complained of what she called the quote unquote, dainty perjury of him and others who contrary to their oath of association cast the burden upon herself soon after she again blamed quote, the niceness of these precise fellows end quote, but said she would have the thing done without them and mentioned one wingfield who would undertake it davison remonstrated against this design and also represented the dangerous dilemma in which paulet and drury would have been placed by complying with her wishes since if she avowed their act she took it upon herself quote, with her infinite dishonour if she disavowed it they were ruined it is absolutely inconceivable how a man who understood so well the perils which these persons had skilfully avoided should have remained so blind to those which menaced himself yet davison by his own account still suffered the queen to go on devising new schemes for the taking off of mary without either acquainting her that the privy council had already sent off beale with the warrant or interfering with them to procure if possible the recall of this messenger of death even on his next interview with her which he believes to have been on tuesday the very day before the execution of the sentence when her majesty after speaking of the daily peril in which she lived swore a great oath that it was a shame for them all that the thing was not yet done and spoke to him to write a letter to paulet for the dispatch of the business he contented himself with observing generally that the warrant was he thought sufficient and though the queen still inclined to think the letter requisite he left her without even dropping a hint that it was scarcely within the limits of possibility that it should arrive before the sentence had been put in execution of this unaccountable imprudence the utmost advantage was taken against him by his cruel and crafty mistress whose chief concern it had all along been to discover by what artifice she might throw the greatest possible portion of the blame from herself upon others davison underwent a long imprisonment the fine though it reduced him to beggary was rigorously exacted some scanty supplies for the relief of his immediate necessities while in prison were all that her majesty would vouchsafe him and neither the zealous attestations of burleigh in the beginning to his merit and abilities and the importance of his public services nor the subsequent earnest pleadings of her own beloved essex for his restoration could ever prevail with elizabeth to lay aside the appearances of perpetual resentment which she thought good to preserve against him she would neither reinstate him in office nor ever more admit him to her presence unable perhaps to bear the pain of beholding a countenance which carried with it an everlasting reproach to her conscience from the formidable responsibilities of this unprecedented action the wary walsingham had withdrawn himself by favour of an opportune fit of sickness which disabled him from taking part in anything but the application to sir amias paulet by which he could incur as he well knew no hazard a still more crafty politician leicester after throwing out in the privy council hints of her majesty's wishes which served to accelerate the decisive steps there taken had artfully contrived to escape from all further participation in their proceedings both ministers in secret letters to scotland washed their hands of the blood of mary but leicester not content with these defensive measures sought to improve the opportunity to the destruction of a rival whom he had never ceased to hate and envy to his insidious arts the temporary disgrace of burleigh is probably to be imputed and it seems to have been from the apprehension of his malignant misconstructions that the lord treasurer refused to put on paper the particulars of his defence and never ceased to implore admission to plead his cause before his sovereign in person his perseverance at length prevailed the queen saw him heard his justification and restored him to her wonted grace after which the tacit compromise between the minister and the favourite was restored that compromise by which during eight and twenty years each had vindicated to himself an equality of political power personal influence and royal favour with the secret enemy whom he vainly wished or hoped or plotted to displace to relate again those melancholy details of mary's closing scene on which the historians of england and of scotland as well as the numerous biographers of this ill-fated princess have exhausted all the arts of eloquence would be equally needless and presumptuous it is however important to remark that she died rather with the triumphant air of a martyr to her religion the character which she falsely assumed 
than with the meekness of a victim or the penitence of a culprit. She bade Melville tell her son that she had done nothing injurious to his rights or honour, though she was actually in treaty to disinherit him, and had also consented to a nefarious plot for carrying him off prisoner to Rome, and she denied with obstinacy to the last the charge of conspiring the death of Elizabeth, though by her will, written the day before her death, she rewarded as faithful servants the two secretaries who had borne this testimony against her. A spirit of self-justification so haughty and so unprincipled, a perseverance in deliberate falsehood so resolute and so shameless, ought under no circumstances and in no personage, not even in a captive beauty and an injured queen, to be confounded, by any writer studious of the moral tendencies of history and capable of sound discrimination, with genuine religion, true fortitude, or the dignity which renders misfortune respectable. Let due censure be passed on the infringement of morality committed by Elizabeth in detaining as a captive that rival kinswoman and pretender to her crown, whom the dread of still more formidable dangers had compelled to seek refuge in her dominions. Let it be admitted that the exercise of criminal jurisdiction over a person thus lawlessly detained in a foreign country was another sacrifice of the just to the expedient, which none but a profligate politician will venture to defend and let the efforts of Mary to procure her own liberty, though with the destruction of her enemy and at the cost of a civil war to England, be held, if religion will permit, justifiable or venial. But let not our resentment of the wrongs, or compassion for the long misfortunes, of this unhappy woman betray us into a blind concurrence in eulogiums lavished, by prejudice or weakness, on a character blemished by many foibles, stained by some enormous crimes, and never under the guidance of the genuine principles of moral rectitude. End of section 33《Section 34 of Memoirs of the Court of Queen Elizabeth. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Memoirs of the Court of Queen Elizabeth, Volumes 1 and 2, by Lucy Aiken. Chapter 21, 1587 and 1588, Part 1. It is well deserving of remark that the strongest and most extraordinary act of the whole administration of Elizabeth, that which brought the blood of a sister-queen upon her head, and indelible reproach upon her memory, appears to have been productive of scarcely any assignable political effect. It changed her relations with no foreign power, it altered very little the state of parties at home, it recommended no new adviser to her favour, it occasioned the displacement of Davison alone. She may appear, it is true, to have obtained by this stroke an immunity from that long series of dark conspiracies by which, during so many years, she had been disquieted and endangered. To deliver the Queen of Scots was an object for which many men had been willing to risk their lives, but none were found desperate or chivalrous enough to run the same hazard in order to avenge her. But the recent detection of Babington and his associates, and the rigorous justice executed upon them, was likely, even without the death of Mary, to have deterred from the speedy repetition of similar practices, and a crisis was now approaching fitted to suspend the machinations of faction, to check the operation even of religious bigotry, and to unite all hearts in the love, all hands in the protection, of their native soil. Philip of Spain, though he purposely avoided as yet a declaration of war, was known to be intently occupied upon the means of taking signal vengeance on the Queen of England for all the acts of hostility on her part, which he thought himself entitled to complain. Already in the summer of 1587 the ports of Spain and Portugal had begun to be thronged with vessels of various sorts and every size, destined to compose that terrible armada from which nothing less than the complete subjugation of England was anticipated. Already had the Pope showered down his benedictions on the holy enterprise, and by a bull declaring the throne of the schismatic princess forfeited to the first occupant, made way for the pretensions of Philip, who claimed it as the true heir of the house of Lancaster. But Elizabeth was not of a temper so timid or so supine as to suffer these preparations to advance without interruption. She ordered Drake to sail immediately for the coast of Spain, and put in practice against her enemy every possible mode of injury and annoyance. To the four great ships which she allotted to him for this service, the English merchants, instigated by the hopes of plunder, cheerfully added twenty-six more of different sizes, and with this force the daring leader steered for the port of Cadiz, where a richly laden fleet lay ready to sail for Lisbon the final rendezvous for the whole armada. By the impetuosity of his attack he compelled six galleys which defended the mouth of the harbour to seek shelter under its batteries, and having thus forced an entrance, he took, burned, and destroyed about one hundred storeships and two galleons of superior size. This done, he returned to Cape St. Vincent, 
then took three castles, and destroying as he proceeded everything that came in his way, even to the fishing-boats and nets, he endeavoured to provoke the Spanish admiral to come out and give him battle off the mouth of the Tagus. But the Marquis of Santa Croce deemed it prudent to suffer him to pillage the coast without molestation. Having fully effected this object, he made sail for the Azores, where the capture of a bulky carrack returning from India amply indemnified the merchants for all the expenses of the expedition, and enriched the admiral and his crews. Drake returned to England in a kind of triumph, boasting that he had, quote, singed the whiskers, end quote, of the King of Spain. Nor was his vaunt unfounded. The destruction of the store-ships, and the havoc committed by him on the magazines of every kind, was a mischief so great, and for the present so irreparable, that it crippled the whole design, and compelled Philip to defer, for no less than a year, the sailing of his invincible armada. The respite thus procured was diligently improved by Elizabeth, for the completion of her plans of defence against the hour of trial, which she still anticipated. The interval seems to afford a fit occasion for the relation of some incidents of a more private nature, but interesting as illustrative of the manners and practices of the age. It has been already mentioned that the secret marriage of the Earl of Hertford with Lady Catherine Grey, notwithstanding the sentence of nullity which the Queen had caused to be so precipitately pronounced, and the punishment which she had tyrannically inflicted on the parties, had at length been duly established by a legal decision in which Her Majesty was compelled to acquiesce. The eldest son of the Earl assumed in consequence his father's second title of Lord Beauchamp, and became undoubted heir to all the claims of the Suffolk line. About the year 1585 this young nobleman married, unknown to his father, a daughter of Sir Richard Rogers, of Bryanston, a gentleman of ancient family, whose son had already been permitted to intermarry with a daughter of the house of Seymour. It might have been hoped that the Earl of Hertford, from his own long and unmerited sufferings on a similar account, would have learned such a lesson of indulgence towards the affections of his children, that a match of greater disparity might have received from him a ready forgiveness. But he inherited, it seems, too much of the unfeeling haughtiness of his high-born mother, and in the fury of his resentment on discovery of this connection of his sons, he made no scruple of separating by force the young couple, in direct defiance of the sacred tie which bound them to each other. Lord Beauchamp bore in the beginning this arbitrary treatment with a dutiful submission, by which he flattered himself that the heart of his father must sooner or later be touched, but at length, finding all entreaties vain, and seeing reason to believe that a settled plan was entertained by the Earl of estranging him for ever from his wife, he broke on a sudden from the solitary mansion which had been assigned him as his place of abode, or of banishment, and was hastening to London to throw himself at the feet of Her Majesty and beseech her interposition, when a servant of his father's overtook and forcibly detained him. Well aware that his nearness to the crown must have rendered peculiarly offensive to the queen what she would regard as his presumption in marrying without her knowledge and consent, he at first suspected her majesty as the author of this attack on his liberty. But being soon informed of her declaration, quote, that he was no prisoner of hers, and the man had acted without warrant, end quote, he addressed to Lord Burley an earnest petition for redress. In this remarkable piece, after a statement of his case, he begs to submit himself by the Lord Treasurer's means to the Queen and Council, hoping that they will grant him the benefit of the laws of the realm, that it would please his Lordship to send for him by his warrant, and that he might not be injured by his father's men, though hardly dealt with by himself. Such were the lengths to which, in this age, a parent could venture to proceed against his child, and such the measures which it was then necessary to take in order to obtain the protection of the laws. It is not stated whether Lord Beauchamp was at this time a minor, but if so he probably made application to Burley as master of the wards. Apparently his representations were not without effect, for he procured in the end both a reunion with his wife and a reconciliation with his father. The grandmother of this young nobleman, Anne, Duchess Dowager of Somerset, died at a great age in 1587, maternally descended from the Plantagenets, and elevated by marriage to the highest rank of English nobility, she perhaps gloried in the character of being the proudest woman of her day. It has often been repeated that her repugnance to yield precedence to Queen Catherine Parr, when remarried to the younger brother of her husband, was the first occasion of that division in the house of Seymour, by which Northumberland succeeded in working its overthrow. In the misfortune to which she had thus contributed, the Duchess largely shared. When the protector was committed to the tower, she also was carried thither amid the insults of the people, to whom her arrogance had rendered her odious and rigorous examinations and an imprisonment of considerable duration here awaited her. She saw her husband stripped of power and reputation, convicted of felony, and led by his enemies to an ignominious death, and what to a woman of her temper was perhaps a still severer trial, 
she beheld her son, that son for whose aggrandizement she had without remorse urged her weak husband to strip of his birthright his own eldest born, dispossessed in his turn of title and estates, and reduced by an act of forfeiture to the humble level of a private gentleman. Her remarriage to an obscure person of the name of Newdigate may prove either that ambition was not the only inordinate affection to which the disposition of the Duchess was subject, or that she was now reduced to seek safety in insignificance. During the reign of Mary, no favour beyond an unmolested obscurity was to be expected by the Protestant house of Seymour. But it was one of the earliest acts of Elizabeth generously to restore to Edward Seymour the whole of the protector's confiscated estates not previously granted to his elder half-brother, and with them the title of Earl of Hertford, the highest which his father had received from Henry the Eighth, and that with which he ought to have rested content. Still no door was opened for the return of the Duchess of Somerset to power or favour. Elizabeth never ceasing to behold in this haughty woman both the deadly enemy of Admiral Seymour, that Seymour who was the first to touch her youthful heart, and whose pretensions to her hand had precipitated his ruin, and that rigid censor of her early levities, who, dressed in a quote-unquote brief authority, had once dared to assume over her a kind of superiority, which she had treated at the time with disdain, and apparently continued to recollect with bitterness. It appears from a letter in which the Duchess earnestly implores the intercession of Cecil in behalf of her son, when under confinement on account of his marriage, that she was at the time of writing it excluded from the royal presence, and it was nine whole years before all the interest she could make, all the solicitations which she compelled herself to use towards persons whom she could once have commanded at her pleasure, proved effectual in procuring his release. The vast wealth which she had amassed must still, however, have maintained her ascendancy over her own family and numerous dependents though with its final disposal her majesty evinced a strong disposition to intermeddle. Learning that she had appointed her eldest son sole executor, to the prejudice of his brother Sir Henry Seymour, whom she did not love, the queen sent a gentleman to expostulate with her, and urge her strongly to change this disposition. The aged duchess, after long refusal, agreed at length to comply with the royal wish, but this promise she omitted to fulfil, and some obstruction was in consequence given to the execution of her last will we possess a large inventory of her jewels and valuables, among which are enumerated, quote, two pieces of unicorn's horn, end quote, an article highly valued in that day from its supposed efficacy as an antidote or a test for poisons. The extreme smallness of her bequests for charitable purposes was justly remarked as a strong indication of a harsh and unfeeling disposition in an age when similar benefactions formed almost the sole resource of the sick and needy. In this year Lord Chancellor Bromley died, and it should appear that there was at the time no other lawyer of eminence who had the good fortune to stand high in the favour of the queen and her counsellors, for we are told that she had it in contemplation to appoint as his successor the Earl of Rutland, a nobleman in the thirtieth year of his age, distinguished indeed among the courtiers for his proficiency in elegant literature and his knowledge of the laws of his country, but known to the public only in the capacity of a colonel of foot in the bloodless campaign of the Earl of Sussex against the northern rebels how far this young man might have been qualified to do honour to so extraordinary a choice, remains a matter of conjecture, his lordship being carried off by a sudden illness within a week of Bromley himself, after which Her Majesty thought proper to invest with this high office Sir Christopher Hatton, her vice-chamberlain. This was a nomination scarcely less mortifying to lawyers than that of the Earl of Rutland. Hatton's abode at one of the inns of court had been so short as scarcely to entitle him to a professional character, and since his fine dancing had recommended him to the favour of her majesty, he had entirely abandoned his legal pursuits for the life and the hopes of a courtier. It is asserted that his enemies promoted his appointment with more zeal than his friends, in the confident expectation of seeing him disgrace himself. What may be regarded as more certain is, that he was so disquieted by intimations of the Queen's repenting of her choice, that he tendered to her his resignation before he entered on the duties of his office, and that in the beginning of his career the sergeants refused to plead before him but he soon found means both to vanquish their repugnance and to establish in the public mind an opinion of his integrity and sufficiency which served to redeem his sovereign from the censure or ridicule to which this extraordinary choice seemed likely to expose her he had the wisdom to avail himself in all cases of peculiar difficulty of the advice of two learned sergeants in other matters he might reasonably regard his own prudence and good sense as competent guides in fact, it was only since the Reformation that this great office had begun to be filled by common-law lawyers. Before this period it was usually exercised by some ecclesiastic who was also a civilian, and instances were not rare of the seals having been held in commission by noblemen during considerable intervals, facts which, in justice to Hatton and to Elizabeth, 
ought on this occasion to be kept in mind. The pride of Leicester had been deeply wounded by the circumstances of that forced return from Holland which, notwithstanding all his artful endeavours to colour it to the world, was perfectly understood at court as a disgraceful recall. The Queen, in the first emotions of indignation and disappointment called forth by his ill success, had in public made use of expressions respecting his conduct, of which he well knew that the effect could only be obviated by some mark of favour equally public, and he spared no labour for the accomplishment of this object. By an extraordinary exertion of that influence over Her Majesty's affections, which enabled him to hold her judgment in lasting captivity, he was at length successful, and the honourable and lucrative place of Chief Justice and heir of all the forests south of Trent was bestowed upon him early in 1587. So far was well, but he disdained to rest satisfied with less than the restitution of that supreme command over the Dutch provinces, which had flattered his vanity with a title never borne by Englishmen before, that of excellence. His usual arts prevailed in this instance likewise. By means of the authority which he had surreptitiously reserved to himself, he held the governors of towns and forts in Holland in complete dependence, whilst his solemn ostentation of religion had secured the zealous attachment of the Protestant clergy, an order which then exerted an important influence over public opinion. It had thus been in his power to raise a strong faction in the country, through the instrumentality of which he raised such impediments to the measures of administration, that the States-General saw themselves at length compelled, as the smaller of two evils, to solicit the Queen for his return. It was a considerable time before she could be brought to sanction a step of which her sagest counsellors, secretly hostile to Leicester, laboured to demonstrate the entire inexpediency. The affairs of Holland suffered at once by the dissensions which the malice of Leicester had sown, and by the long irresolution of Elizabeth, and she at length sent over Lord Buckhurst to make inquiry into some measures of the states which had given her umbrage, and to report upon the whole matter. The sagacious and upright statesman was soon satisfied where the blame ought to rest, and he suggested a plan for the government of the country which excluded the idea of Leicester's return. But the intrigues of the favourite finally prevailed, and he was authorised in June 1587 to resume a station of which he had proved himself equally incapable and unworthy, having previously been further gratified by Her Majesty with the office of Lord High Steward, and with permission to resign that of Master of the Horse to his stepson, the Earl of Essex. But fortune disdained to smile upon his arms, and his failure in an attempt to raise the siege of Slash produced such an exasperation of his former quarrel with the States, that in the month of November the Queen found herself compelled to supersede him, appointing the brave Lord Willoughby Captain-General in his place. On his return to England, Leicester found Lord Buckhurst preparing against him a charge of malversation in Holland, and he received a summons to justify himself before the Privy Council. But he better consulted his safety by flying for protection to the footstool of the throne. The Queen, touched by his expressions of humility and sorrow, and his earnest entreaties, quote, that she would not receive with disgrace on his return him whom she had sent forth with honour, nor bring down alive to the grave one whom her former goodness had raised from the dust, end quote, consented once again to receive him into wanted favour. Nor was this all, for on the day when he was expected to give in his answer before the council, he appeared in his place, and by a triumphant appeal to Her Majesty, whose secret orders limited, as he asserted, his public commission, baffled at once the hopes of his enemies and the claims of public justice. What was still more gross, he was suffered to succeed in procuring a censure to be passed upon Lord Buckhurst, who continued in disgrace for the nine remaining months of Leicester's life during which a royal command restrained him within his house. Elizabeth must in this instance have known her own injustice even while she was committing it, but by the loyal and chivalrous nobility who knelt before the footstool of the maiden queen, quote, her buffets and rewards were taken with equal thanks, end quote, and Abbot, the chaplain of Lord Buckhurst, has recorded of his patron that, quote, so obsequious was he to this command, that in all the time he never would endure, openly or secretly, by day or night, to see either wife or child, end quote he had his reward, for no sooner was the queen restored to liberty by the death of her imperious favourite than she released her kinsman, honoured him with the garter, procured, two years after, his election to the chancellorship of the University of Oxford, and finally appointed him Burley's successor in the honourable and lucrative post of Lord Treasurer. During the unavoidable delay which the expedition of Drake had brought to the designs of Philip II, the Prince of Parma had by his master's directions been endeavouring to amuse the vigilance of Elizabeth with overtures of negotiation. The Queen, at the request of the Prince, sent plenipotentiaries to treat with him in Flanders, and though the Hollanders absolutely refused to enter into the treaty, they proceeded with apparent earnestness in the task of settling preliminaries. 
Some writers maintain that there was from the beginning as little sincerity on one side as on the other, to gain time for the preparations of attack or defence being the sole object of both parties in these manoeuvres. Yet the cautious and pacific character of the policy of Elizabeth, and the secret dread which she had ever entertained of a serious contest with the power of Spain, seemed to render it more probable that the wish and hope of an accommodation was at first on her side real, and that the fears of the states that their interests might become the sacrifice must have been by no means destitute of foundation. Leicester is said to have had the merit of first opening the eyes of his sovereign to the fraudulent conduct of the Prince of Parma, who in fact was furnished with no powers to treat, and to have earned for himself by this discovery the restoration of her favour. In March 1588 these conferences broke off abruptly. It was impossible for either party longer to deceive, or to act the being deceived, for all Europe now rang with the mighty preparations of King Philip for the conquest of England, preparations which occupied the whole of his vast, though disjointed, empire, from the Flemish provinces which still owned his yoke, to the distant ports of Sicily and Naples. The spirit of the English people rose with the emergency, all ranks and orders vied with each other in an eager devotedness to the sacred cause of national independence. The rich poured forth their treasures with unsparing hand. The chivalrous and young rushed on board ships of their own equipment, a band of generous volunteers. The poor demanded arms to exterminate every invader who should set foot on English ground, while the clergy animated their audience against the Pope and the Spaniard, and invoked a blessing on the holy warfare of their fellow-citizens. Elizabeth, casting aside all her weaknesses, showed herself worthy to be the queen and heroine of such a people. Her prudence, her vigilance, her presence of mind, which failed not for a moment, inspired unbounded confidence, while her cheerful countenance and spirited demeanour breathed hope and courage and alacrity into the coldest bosoms. Never did a sovereign enter upon a great and awful contest with a more strenuous resolution to fulfil all duties, to confront all perils. Never did a people repay with such ardour of gratitude, such enthusiasm of attachment, the noblest virtues of a prince. The best troops of the country were at this time absent in Flanders, and there was no standing army except the Queen's Guard and the garrisons kept in a few forts on the coast or the Scottish border. The Royal Navy was extremely small, and the revenues of the Crown totally inadequate to the effort of raising it to anything approaching a parity with the fleets of Spain. The Queen possessed not a single ally on the continent capable of affording her aid. She doubted the fidelity of the King of Scots to her interests and a formidable mass of disaffection was believed to subsist among her own subjects of the Catholic communion. It was on the spontaneous efforts of individuals that the whole safety of the country at this momentous crisis was left dependent. If these failed, England was lost. But in such a cause, at such a juncture, they could not fail, and the first appeal made by government to the patriotism of the people was answered with that spirit in which a nation is invincible. A message was sent by the Privy Council to inquire of the Corporation of London what the city would be willing to undertake for the public service. The Corporation requested to be informed what the Council might judge requisite in such a case. Fifteen ships and five thousand men was the answer. Two days after, the city, quote, humbly entreated the Council, in sign of their perfect love and loyalty, to prince and country, to accept ten thousand men and thirty ships amply furnished. Quote, and, adds the chronicler, even as London, London-like, gave precedent, the whole kingdom kept true rank and equipage." End quote. At this time the able-bodied men in the capital between the ages of eighteen and sixty amounted to no more than seventeen thousand eighty-three. Without entering into further detail respecting the particular contributions of different towns or districts to the common defence, it is sufficient to remark that every sinew was strained, and that little was left to the charge of government but the task of arranging and applying the abundant succours furnished by the zeal of the country. One trait of the times, however, it is essential to commemorate. Terror is perhaps the most merciless of all sentiments, and that which is least restrained either by shame or a sense of justice, and under this debasing influence some of the Queen's advisers did not hesitate to suggest that in a crisis so desperate she ought to consult her own safety and that of the country by seeking pretexts to take away the lives of some of the leading Catholics. They cited in support of this atrocious proposal the example of Henry the Eighth, her father, who before his departure for the French wars, had without scruple brought to the block his own cousin, the Marquis of Exeter, and several others, whose chief crime was their attachment to the ancient faith, and their enjoying a degree of popularity which might enable them to raise commotions in his absence. Elizabeth rejected with horror these suggestions of cowardice and cruelty, at the same time that she omitted no measures of precaution which she regarded as justifiable. The existing laws against priests and seminary men were enforced with vigilance and severity, 
all popish recusants were placed under close inspection and a considerable number of those accounted most formidable were placed under safe custody in wisbeach castle to these gentlemen however the queen caused it to be intimated that the step which she had taken was principally designed for their protection since it was greatly to be apprehended that in the event of landing of the spaniards the roman catholics might become the victims of some ebullition of popular fury which it would not then be in the power of government to repress this lenient proceeding on the part of her majesty was productive of the best effects the catholics who remained at liberty became earnest to prove themselves possessed of that spirit of patriotism and loyalty for which she had given them credit some entered the ranks as volunteers others armed and encouraged their tenantry and dependents for the defence of their country several even fitted out vessels at their own expense and entrusted the command of them to protestant officers on whom the government could entirely rely after the defeat of the armada the prisoners at wisbeach castle having signed the submission required by law of such as had offended in hearing mass and absenting themselves from church petitioned the privy council for their liberty but a bond for good behaviour being further demanded of them with the condition of being obedient to such orders as six members of the privy council should write down respecting them they refused to comply with such terms of enlargement and remained in custody as the submission which they had tendered voluntarily was in terms apparently no less strong than the bond which they refused it was conjectured that the former piece had been drawn up by their ghostly fathers with some private equivocation or mental reservation a suspicion which received strong confirmation from the characters and subsequent conduct of some of these persons the most noted fanatics certainly of their party and amongst whom we read the names of talbot catsby and tresham afterwards principal conspirators in the detestable gunpowder plot the ships equipped by the nobility and gentry to combat the armada amounted in the whole to forty-three and it was on board these vessels that young men of the noblest blood and highest hopes now made their first essay in arms in this number may be distinguished george clifford third earl of cumberland one of the most remarkable if not the greatest characters of the reign of elizabeth the illustrious race of clifford takes origin from william duke of normandy in a later age its blood was mingled with that of the plantagenets by the intermarriage of the seventh lord de clifford and a daughter of the celebrated hotspur by elizabeth his wife whose father was edward mortimer earl of march notwithstanding this alliance with the house of york two successive lords de clifford were slain in the civil wars fighting strenuously on the lancastrian side it was to the younger of these whose sanguinary spirit gained him the surname of the butcher that the barbarous murder of the young earl of rutland was popularly imputed and a well-founded dread of the vengeance of the orchists caused his widow to conceal his son and heir under the lowly disguise of a shepherd-boy in which condition he grew up among the fells of westmoreland totally illiterate and probably unsuspicious of his origin at the end of five-and-twenty years the restoration of the line of lancaster in the person of henry the seventh restored to lord de clifford the name rank and large possessions of his ancestors but the peasant noble preferred through life that rustic obscurity in which his character had been formed and his habits fixed to the splendours of a court or the turmoils of ambition he kept aloof from the capital and it was only on the field of flodden to which he led in person his hardy tenantry that this de clifford exhibited some sparks of the warlike fire inherent in his race his successor by qualities very different from the homely virtues which had obtained for his father among his tenantry and neighbours the surname of the good recommended himself to the special favour of henry the eighth who created him earl of cumberland and matched his heir to his own niece lady eleanor brandon the sole fruit of this illustrious alliance which involved the earl in an almost ruinous course of expense was a daughter who afterwards became the mother of ferdinando earl of derby a nobleman whose mysterious and untimely fate remains to be hereafter related by a second and better assorted marriage the earl of cumberland became the father of george his successor our present subject who proved the most remarkable of this distinguished family the death of his father during his childhood had brought him under wardship to the queen and by her command he was sent to pursue his studies at peterhouse cambridge under whitgift afterwards primate here he applied himself with ardour to the mathematics and it was apparently the bent of his genius towards these studies which first caused him to turn his attention to nautical matters an enterprising spirit and a turn for all the fashionable profusions of the day which speedily plunged him in pecuniary embarrassments added incitements to his activity in these pursuits and in fifteen eighty six he fitted out three ships and a pinnace to cruise against the spaniards and plunder their settlements it appears extraordinary that he did not assume in person the command of his little squadron but combats and triumphs perhaps still more glorious in his estimation awaited him on the smoother element of the court End of section thirty four
Section 35 of Memoirs of the Court of Queen Elizabeth. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Memoirs of the Court of Queen Elizabeth, Volumes 1 and 2, by Lucy Aiken. Chapter 21, 1587 and 1588, Part 2. In the games of chivalry, he bore off the prize of courage and dexterity from all his peers. The romantic band of night-tilters boasted of him as one of its brightest ornaments, and her majesty deigned to encourage his devotedness to her glory by an envied pledge of favour as he stood or kneeled before her she dropped her glove perhaps not undesignedly and on his picking it up graciously desired him to keep it he caused the trophy to be encircled with diamonds and ever after at all tilts and tourneys bore it conspicuously placed in front of his high-crowned hat but the emergencies of the year fifteen eighty eight summoned him to resign the fopperies of an antiquated knight errantry for serious warfare and the exercise of genuine valour. Taking upon him the command of a ship, he joined the fleet appointed to hang upon the motions of the Spanish Armada and harass it in its progress up the British Channel, and on several occasions, especially in the last action off Calais, he signalised himself by uncommon exertions. In reward of his services, Her Majesty granted him her royal commission to pursue a voyage to the South Sea, which he had already projected. She even lent him for the occasion one of her own ships, and thus encouraged he commenced that long series of naval enterprises which has given him an enduring name after two or three voyages he constantly declined her majesty's gracious offers of the loan of her ships because they were accompanied with the express condition that he should never lay any vessel of hers on board a spanish one lest both should be destroyed by fire such was the character of mingled penuriousness and timidity which pervaded the maritime policy of this great princess even after the defeat of the armada had demonstrated that ship for ship her navy might defy the world. At this period all attempts against the power and prosperity of Spain were naturally regarded with high favour and admiration, and it cannot be denied that in his long and hazardous expeditions the Earl of Cumberland evinced high courage, undaunted enterprise, and an extraordinary share of perseverance under repeated failures, disappointments, and hardships of every kind. It is also true that his vigorous attacks embarrassed extremely the intercourse of Spain with her colonies, and besides the direct injury which they inflicted, compelled this power to incur an immense additional expense for the protection of her treasure-ships and settlements. But the benefit to England was comparatively trifling, and to the Earl himself, notwithstanding occasional captures of great value, his voyages were far from producing any lasting advantage. They scarcely repaid on the whole the cost of equipment, while the influx of sudden wealth with which they sometimes gratified him only ministered food to that magnificent profusion in which he finally squandered both his acquisitions and his patrimony. None of the liberal and enlightened views which had prompted the efforts of the great navigators of this and the preceding age appear to have had any share in the enterprises of the Earl of Cumberland. Even the thirst of martial glory seems in him to have been subordinate to the love of gain, and that appetite for rapine to which his loose and extravagant habits had given the force of a passion. He had formed, early in life, an attachment to the beautiful daughter of that worthy character and rare exemplar of old English hospitality, Sir William Halls, ancestor to the Earls of Clare of that surname. But her father, from a singular pride of independence, refused to listen to his proposals, saying, quote, that he would not have to stand cap in hand to his son-in-law. His daughter should marry a good gentleman with whom he might have society and friendship, end quote. Disappointed thus of the object of his affections, he matched himself with the daughter of the Earl of Bedford, a woman of merit, as it appears, but whom their mutual indifference precluded from exerting over him any salutary influence. As a husband, he proved both unfaithful and cruel, and separating himself after a few years from his countess, on pretense of incompatibility of tempers, he suffered her to pine not only in desertion, but in poverty. We shall hereafter have occasion to view this celebrated earl in the idly solemn personage of Queen's Champion. Meantime he must be dismissed with no more of applause than may be challenged by a character signally deficient in the guiding and restraining virtues, and endowed with such a share only of the more active ones as served to render it conspicuous and glittering, rather than truly and permanently illustrious. Henry, Earl of Northumberland, likewise joined the fleet, on board a vessel hired by himself. Immediately after the fatal catastrophe of his father in 1585, this young nobleman, anxious apparently to efface the stigma of popery and disaffection stamped by the rash attempts of his uncle and father on the gallant name of Percy, had seized the opportunity of embarking with Leicester for the wars of the Low Countries. He now sought distinction on another element, and in a cause still nearer to the hearts of Englishmen. 
the conversion to protestantism and loyalty of the head of such a house could not but be regarded by elizabeth with feelings of peculiar complacency and in fifteen ninety three she was pleased to confer upon the earl the insignia of the garter he was present in sixteen o one at the siege of ostend where he considered himself as so much aggrieved by the conduct of sir francis vere that on the return of this officer to england he sent him a challenge during the decline of the queen's health northumberland was distinguished by the warmth with which he embraced the interests of the king of scots and he was the first privy councillor named by james on his accession to the english throne but the fate of his family seemed still to pursue him on some unsupported charges connected with the gunpowder plot he was stripped of all his offices heavily fined and sentenced to perpetual imprisonment the tardy mercy of the king procured however his release at the end of fifteen years and he spent the remnant of his life in tranquil and honourable retirement this unfortunate nobleman was a man of parts the abundant leisure for intellectual pursuits afforded by his long captivity was chiefly employed by him in the study of the mathematics including perhaps the occult sciences and as he was permitted to enjoy freely the conversation of such men of learning as he wished to assemble around him he became one of their most bountiful patrons thomas cecil eldest son of the lord treasurer formerly a volunteer in the expedition to scotland undertaken in favour of the regent murray and more recently appointed governor of the brill in consideration of his services in the war of flanders also embarked to repel the invaders as did robert his half-brother the afterwards celebrated secretary of state created earl of salisbury by james i robert cecil was deformed in his person of a feeble and sickly constitution and entirely devoted to the study of politics and nothing it is to be presumed but his steady determination of omitting no means of attracting to himself that royal favour which he contemplated as the instrument by which to work out his future fortunes could have engaged him in a service so repugnant to his habits and pursuits and for which the hand of nature herself had so evidently disabled him the earl of oxford in expiation perhaps of some of those violences of temper and irregularities of conduct by which he was perpetually offending the queen and obstructing his own advancement in the state equipped on this occasion a vessel which he commanded sir charles blount notwithstanding the narrowness of his present fortunes judged it incumbent on him to give a similar proof of attachment to his queen and country and the circumstance affords an occasion of introducing to the notice of the reader one of the brightest ornaments of the court of elizabeth this distinguished gentleman now in the twenty-fifth year of his age was the second son of james sixth lord mountjoy of the ancient norman name of le blonde corruptly written blount the family history might serve as a commentary on the reigning follies of the english court during two or three generations his grandfather a splendid courtier consumed his resources on the ostentatious equipage with which he attended to the french wars his master henry the eighth with whom he had the misfortune to be a favourite his father squandered a diminished patrimony still more absurdly in his search after the philosopher's stone and the ruin of the family was so consummated by the ill-timed prodigalities of his elder brother that when his death without children in fifteen ninety four transmitted the title of lord mountjoy to sir charles a thousand marks was the whole amount of the inheritance by which this honour was to be maintained it is needless to add that the younger brother's portion with which he set out in life was next to nothing having thus his own way to make he immediately after completing his education at oxford entered himself of the inner temple as meaning to pursue the profession of the law but fortune had ordained his destiny otherwise and being led by his curiosity to visit the court he there found quote, a pretty strange kind of admission end quote, which cannot be related with more vivacity than in the original words of naunton quote, he was then much about twenty years of age of a brown hair a sweet face a most neat composure and tall in his person the queen was then at whitehall and at dinner whither he came to see the fashion of the court the queen had soon found him out and with a kind of an affected frown asked the lady carver who he was she answered she knew him not insomuch that inquiry was made from one to another who he might be till at length it was told the queen that he was brother to the lord william mountjoy this inquisition with the eye of majesty fixed upon him as she was wont to do to daunt men she knew not stirred the blood of this young gentleman insomuch as his colour went and came which the queen observing called him unto her and gave him her hand to kiss encouraging him with gracious words and new looks and so diverting her speech to the lords and ladies she said that she no sooner observed him but that she knew there was in him some noble blood with some other expressions of pity towards his house and then again demanding his name she said fail you not come to the court and i will bethink myself how to do you good and this was his inlet and the beginning of his grace it does not appear what boon the queen immediately bestowed upon her new courtier but he deserted the profession of the law 
sat in the parliaments of 1585 and 1586 as a representative of two different Cornish boroughs, received in the latter year the honour of knighthood, and soon after his present expedition appeared considerable enough at court to provoke the hostility of the Earl of Essex himself. Raleigh, now high in favour, and invested with the offices of captain of the Queen's Guard and her lieutenant for Cornwall, had been actively engaged since the last year in training to arms the militia of that county. He had also been employed, as a member of the Council of War, in concerting the general plan of national defence, but his ardent and adventurous valour prompted him to aid his country in her hour of trial on both elements, and with hand as well as head. Throwing himself, therefore, into a vessel of his own which waited his orders, he hastened to share in the discomfiture of her insulting foe. But it would be endless to enumerate all who spontaneously came forward to partake the perils and the glory of this ever-memorable contest, and the naval commanders of principal eminence have higher claims to our notice. The dignity of Lord High Admiral, customarily conferred on mere men of rank, in whom not the slightest tincture of professional knowledge was required or expected, at this critical juncture belonged to Charles, second Lord Howard of Effingham, of whom we have formerly spoken, and who appears never in the whole course of his life to have been at sea but once before, and that only on an occasion of ceremony. He was every way an untried man, and as yet distinguished for nothing except the accomplishments of a courtier. But he exhibited on trial courage, resolution, and conduct, an affability of manner which endeared him to the sailors, and a prudent sense of his own inexperience which rendered him perfectly docile to the counsels of those excellent sea-officers by whom he had the good fortune to find himself surrounded. He encouraged his crew, and manifested his alacrity in the service, by putting his own hand to the rope which was to tow his ship out of harbour, and he afterwards gave proof of his good sense and his patriotism, by his opposition to the orders which Her Majesty's excess of economy led her to issue on the first dispersion of the Armada by a storm, for laying up four of her largest ships earnestly requesting that he might be permitted to retain them at his own expense, rather than the safety of the country should be risked by their dismissal. John Hawkins, one of the ablest and most experienced seamen of the age, was chiefly relied upon for the conduct of the main fleet, in which he acted as vice-admiral. For his good service he was knighted by the Lord Admiral on board his own ship immediately after the action, when the like honour was bestowed on that eminent navigator Frobisher, who led into action the triumph, one of the three first rates which were then all that the English navy could boast. To the hero Drake, as rear admiral, a separate squadron was entrusted, and it was by this division that the principal execution was done upon the discomfited armada as it fled in confusion before the valour of the English and the fury of their tempestuous seas. An enormous galleon surrendered without firing a shot to the much smaller vessel of Drake, purely from the terror of his name. Whilst the Lord Admiral, with the principal fleet stationed off Plymouth, prepared to engage the armada in its passage up the channel, Sir Henry Seymour, youngest son of the Protector, was stationed with a smaller force, partly English, partly Flemish, off Dunkirk, for the purpose of intercepting the Duke of Parma, who was lying with his veteran forces on the coast, ready to embark and cooperate in the conquest of England. In the midst of these naval preparations, which happily sufficed in the event to frustrate entirely the designs of the enemy, equal activity was exerted to place the land forces in a condition to dispute the soil against the finest troops and most consummate general of Europe. An army of reserve consisting of about thirty-six thousand men was drawn together for the defence of the Queen's person, and appointed to march towards any quarter in which the most pressing danger should manifest itself. A smaller, but probably better appointed, force of twenty-three thousand was stationed in a camp near Tilbury to protect the capital, against which it was not doubted that the most formidable efforts of the enemy on making good his landing would be immediately directed. Owing to the long peace which the country had enjoyed, England possessed at this juncture no general of reputation, though doubtless a sufficiency of men of resolution and capacity whom a short experience of actual service would have matured into able officers. Under circumstances which afforded to the government so small a choice of men, the respective appointments of Arthur Lord Grey, distinguished by the vigour which he had exerted in suppressing the last Irish rebellion, to the post of President of the Council of War, of Lord Hunsdon, a brave soldier long practised in the desultory warfare of the northern border, as well as in several regular campaigns against Scotland, to the command of the Army of Reserve, and of the Earl of Essex, a gallant youth who had fleshed his maiden sword and gained his spurs in the affair of Zutphen, to the post of General of the Horse in the main army seemed to have merited the sanction of public approbation. But the most strenuous defender of the measures of Her Majesty must have been staggered by her nomination of Leicester, the hated, the disgraced, the incapable Leicester, to the station of highest honour, 
danger and importance, that of commander-in-chief of the army at Tilbury. Military experience, indeed, the favourite possessed in a higher degree than most of those to whom the defence of the country was now of necessity entrusted, but of skill and conduct he had proved himself destitute, even his personal courage was doubtful, and his recent failures in Holland must have inspired distrust in the bosom of every individual, whether officer or private, appointed to serve under him. Something must be allowed for the embarrassments of the time, the deficiency of military talent, the high rank of Leicester in the service, which forbade his employment in any inferior capacity. But with all these palliations, the nomination of such an antagonist to confront the Duke of Parma must eternally be regarded as the weakest act into which the prudence of Elizabeth was ever betrayed by a blind and unaccountable partiality. All these preparations for defence being finally arranged, Her Majesty resolved to visit in person the camp at Tilbury, for the purpose of encouraging her troops. It had been a part of the commendation of Elizabeth that in her public appearances, of whatsoever nature, no sovereign on record had acted the part so well, or with such universal applause. But on this memorable and momentous occasion, when, like a second Boadicea, armed for defence against the invader of her country, she appeared at once the warrior and the queen, the sacred feelings of the moment, superior to all the artifices of regal dignity and the tricks of regal condescension, inspired her with that impressive earnestness of look, of words, of gesture, which alone is truly dignified and truly eloquent. Mounted on a noble charger, with a general's truncheon in her hand, a corslet of polished steel laced on over her magnificent apparel, and a page in attendance bearing her white-plumed helmet, she rode bareheaded from rank to rank with a courageous deportment and smiling countenance, and amid the affectionate plaudits and shouts of military ardour which burst from the animated and admiring soldiery, she addressed them in the following short and spirited harangue. Quote, my loving people, we have been persuaded by some that are careful of our safety to take heed how we commit ourselves to armed multitudes for fear of treachery. But assure you, I do not desire to live to distrust my faithful and loving people. Let tyrants fear. I have always so behaved myself that, under God, I have placed my chiefest strength and safeguard in the loyal hearts and good will of my subjects. And therefore I am come amongst you at this time, not as for my recreation or sport, but being resolved in the midst and heat of the battle, to live or die amongst you all, to lay down for my God, and for my kingdom, and for my people, my honour and my blood, even in the dust. I know I have but the body of a weak and feeble woman, but I have the heart of a king, and of a king of England, too. And think foul scorn that Parma or Spain, or any prince of Europe, should dare to invade the borders of my realms, to which rather than any dishonour should grow by me, I myself will take up arms, I myself will be your general, judge, and rewarder of every one of your virtues in the field. I know already by your forwardness that you have deserved rewards and crowns, and we do assure you, on the word of a prince, they shall be duly paid you. In the meantime, my lieutenant-general shall be in my stead, than whom never prince commanded a more noble and worthy subject, not doubting by your obedience to my general, by your concord in the camp, and your valour in the field, we shall shortly have a famous victory over those enemies of my God, of my kingdom, and of my people. End quote. The extraordinary reliance placed by the Queen in this emergency upon the councils of Leicester encouraged the insatiable favourite to grasp at honour and authority still more exorbitant, and he ventured to urge Her Majesty to invest him with the office of her lieutenant in England and Ireland, a dignity paramount to all other commands. She had the weakness to comply and it is said that the patent was actually drawn out when the defeat of the Armada, by taking away all pretext for the creation of such an officer, gave her leisure to attend to the earnest representations of Hatton and Burley on the impudence of conferring on any subject power so excessive, and capable even in some instances of controlling her own prerogative. On better consideration the project therefore was dropped. It is foreign from the business of this work to detail the particulars of that signal victory obtained by English seamanship and English valour against the boasted armament of Spain, prodigiously superior as it was in every circumstance of force, excepting the moral energies employed to wield it. While the history of the year 1588, in all its details, must ever form a favourite chapter in the splendid tale of England's naval glory, it will here suffice to mark the general results. Not a single Spaniard set foot on English ground but as a prisoner. One English vessel only, and that of smaller size, became the prize of the invaders. The Duke of Parma did not venture to embark a man. The King of Scots, standing firm to his alliance with his illustrious kinswoman, afforded not the slightest succour to the Spanish ships which the storms and the English drove in shattered plight upon his rugged coasts. 
while the lord deputy of ireland caused to be butchered without remorse the crews of all the vessels wrecked upon that island in their disastrous circumnavigation of great britain so that not more than half of this vaunted invincible armada returned in safety to the ports of spain never in the records of history was the event of war on one side more entirely satisfactory and glorious on the other more deeply humiliating and utterly disgraceful philip did indeed support the credit of his personal character by the dignified composure with which he heard the tidings of this great disaster but it was out of his power to throw the slightest veil over the dishonour of the spanish arms or repair the total and final failure of the great popish cause by the english nation this signal discomfiture of its most dreaded and detested foe was hailed as the victory of protestant principles no less than of national independence and the tidings of the national deliverance were welcomed by all the reformed churches of europe with an ardour of joy and thankfulness proportioned to the intenseness of anxiety with which they had watched the event of a conflict where their own dearest interests were staked along with the existence of their best ally and firmest protector repeated thanksgivings were observed in london in commemoration of this great event on the anniversary of the queen's birth a general festival was proclaimed and celebrated with quote, sermons singings of psalms bonfires etc end quote. and on the following sunday her majesty went in state to st paul's magnificently attended by her nobles and great officers and borne along on a sumptuous chariot formed like a throne with four pillars supporting a canopy and drawn by a pair of white horses the streets through which she passed were hung with blue cloth in honour doubtless of the navy and the colours taken from the enemy were borne in triumph her majesty rewarded the lord admiral with a considerable pension and settled annuities on the wounded seamen and on some of the more necessitous among the officers the rest she honoured with much personal notice and many gracious terms of commendation which they were expected to receive in lieu of more substantial remuneration for parsimony the darling virtue of elizabeth was not forgotten even in her gratitude to the brave defenders of her country two medals were struck on this great occasion one representing a fleet retiring under full sail with the motto venit vidi fugi the other fireship scattering a fleet the motto dux femina facti a compliment to the queen who is said to have herself suggested the employment of these engines of destruction by which the armada suffered severely the intense interest in public events excited in every class by the threatened invasion of spain gave rise to the introduction in this country of one of the most important inventions of social life that of newspapers previously to this period all articles of intelligence had been circulated in manuscript and all political remarks which the government had found itself interested in addressing to the people had issued from the press in the shape of pamphlets of which many had been composed during the administration of burleigh either by himself or immediately under his direction but the peculiar convenience at such a juncture of uniting these two objects in a periodical publication becoming obvious to the ministry there appeared some time in the month of april fifteen eighty eight the first number of the english mercury a paper resembling the present london gazette which must have come out almost daily since number fifty the earliest specimen of the work now extant is dated july twenty third of the same year this interesting relic is preserved in the british museum in the midst of the public rejoicings an event occurred which in whatever manner it might be felt by elizabeth herself certainly cast no damp on the spirits of the nation at large the death of leicester after frequent notices of this celebrated favourite contained in the foregoing pages a formal delineation of his character is unnecessary a few traits may however be added speaking of his letters in public papers naunton says quote, i never yet saw a style or phrase more seeming religious and fuller of the streams of devotion end quote, and notwithstanding the charge of hypocrisy on this head usually brought against leicester in the most unqualified terms many reasons might induce us to believe his religious faith sincere and his attachment for certain schemes of doctrine zealous on no other supposition does it appear possible to account for that steady patronage of the puritanical party so odious to his mistress which gave on some occasions such important advantages over him to his adversary hatton the only minister of elizabeth who appears to have aimed at the character of a high church of england man the circumstance also of his devoting during his lifetime a considerable sum of ready money which he could ill spare to the endowment of a hospital has much the air of an act of expiation prompted by religious fears as a statesman leicester appears to have displayed on some occasions considerable acuteness and penetration but in the higher kind of wisdom he was utterly deficient his moral insensibility sometimes caused him to offer to his sovereign the most pernicious counsels and had not the superior rectitude of burleigh's judgment interposed 
his influence might have inflicted still deeper wounds on the honour of the queen and the prosperity of the nation towards his own friends and adherents he is said to have been a religious observer of his promises a virtue very remarkable in such a man in the midst of that profusion which rendered him rapacious he was capable of acts of real generosity and both soldiers and scholars tasted largely of his bounty that he was guilty of many detestable acts of oppression and pursued with secret and unrelenting vengeance such as offended his arrogance by any failure in the servile homage which he made it his glory to exact are charges proved by undeniable facts but it has already been observed that the more atrocious of the crimes popularly imputed to him remain and must ever remain matters of suspicion rather than proof his conduct during the younger part of life was scandalously licentious later he became says camden uxorious to excess in the early days of his favour with the queen her profuse donations had gratified his cupidity and displayed the fondness of her attachment but at a later period the stream of her bounty ran low and following the natural bent of her disposition or complying with the necessity of her affairs she compelled him to mortgage to her his barony of denby for the expenses of his last expedition to holland immediately after his death she also caused his effects to be sold by auction for the satisfaction of certain demands of her treasury from these circumstances it may probably be inferred that the influence which leicester still retained over her was secured rather by the chain of habit than the tie of affection and after the first shock of final separation from him whom she had so long loved and trusted it was not improbable that she might contemplate the event with a feeling somewhat akin to that of deliverance from a yoke under which her haughty spirit had repined without the courage to resist leicester died beyond all doubt of a fever but so reluctant were the prejudices of that age to dismiss any eminent person by the ordinary roads of mortality that it was judged necessary to take examinations before the privy council respecting certain magical practices said to have been employed against his life the son of sir james croft controller of the household made no scruple to confess that he had consulted an adept of the name of smith to learn who were his father's enemies in the council that smith mentioned the earl of leicester and that a little while after flirting with his thumbs he exclaimed alluding to this nobleman's cognizance quote, the bear is bound to the stake end quote, and again that nothing could now save him but as it might after all have been difficult to show in what manner the flirting of a thumb in london could have exerted a fatal power over the life of the earl at kenilworth the adept seems to have escaped unpunished notwithstanding the accidental fulfilment of his denunciations End of section 35section thirty six of memoirs of the court of queen elizabeth this librivox recording is in the public domain memoirs of the court of queen elizabeth volumes one and two by lucy aiken chapter twenty two fifteen eighty eight to fifteen ninety one part one the death of leicester forms an important era in the history of the court of elizabeth and also in that of her private life and more intimate feelings the powerful faction of which the favourite had been the head acknowledged a new leader in the earl of essex whom his stepfather had brought forward at court as a counterpoise to the influence of raleigh and who now stood second to none in the good graces of her majesty but essex however gifted with noble and brilliant qualities totally deficient in leicester was on the other hand confessedly inferior to him in several other endowments still more essential to the leader of a court party though not void of art he was by no means master of the profound dissimulation the exquisite address and especially the wary coolness by which his predecessor well knew how to accomplish his ends in spite of all opposition his character was impetuous his natural disposition frank and experience had not yet taught him to distrust either himself or others with the friendships essex received as an inheritance the enmities also of leicester and no one at court could have entertained the least doubt whom he regarded as his principal opponent but it would have been deemed too high a pitch of presumption in so young a man and so recent a favourite as essex to place himself in immediate and open hostility to the long-established and far-extending influence of burleigh with this great minister therefore and his adherents he attempted at first a kind of compromise and the noted division of the court into the essex and the cecil parties does not appear to have taken place till some years after the period of which we are treating meantime the death of walsingham afforded the lord treasurer an occasion of introducing to the notice and confidence of her majesty and eventually to the important office of secretary of state his son robert whose transcendent talents for affairs joined to the utmost refinement of intrigue and duplicity immediately established him in the same independence on the good-will of the new favourite 
as the elder Cecil had ever asserted on that of the former one, and appears finally to have enabled him to prepare in secret that favourite's disastrous fall. With regard to Elizabeth herself, it has been a thousand times remarked that she was never able to forget the woman in the sovereign, and in spite of that preponderating love of sway which all her life forbade her to admit a partner of her bed and throne, her heart was to the last deeply sensible to the want, or her imagination to the charm, of loving and being beloved. The death, therefore, of the man who had been for thirty years the object of a tenderness which he had long repaid by every flattering profession, every homage of gallantry, and every manifestation of entire devotedness, left, notwithstanding any late disgusts which she might have entertained, a void in her existence which she felt it necessary to supply. It was this situation, doubtless, of her feelings which led to the gradual conversion into a softer sentiment, of that natural and innocent tenderness with which she had hitherto regarded the brilliant and engaging qualities of her youthful kinsman, the Earl of Essex, a change which terminated so fatally to both. The enormous disproportion of ages gave to the new inclination of the Queen a stamp of dotage inconsistent with the reputation for good sense and dignity of conduct which she had hitherto preserved, nor did she long receive from the indulgence of so untimely a sentiment any portion of the felicity which she coveted. The careless and even affronting behaviour in which Essex occasionally indulged himself combined with her own sagacity to admonish her that her fondness was unreturned, and that nothing but the substantial benefits by which it declared itself could have induced its object to meet it with even the semblance of gratitude. As this mortifying conviction came home to her bosom, she grew restless, irritable, and captious to excess. She watched all his motions with a self-tormenting jealousy. She fed her own disquiet by listening to the malicious informations of his enemies, and her heart at length becoming callous by repeated exasperations, she began to visit his delinquencies with an unrelenting sternness. This conduct, attempted too late and persisted in too long, hurried Essex to his ruin, and ended by inflicting upon herself the mortal agonies of an unavailing repentance. Lord Bacon relates, in his Apothems, that, quote, a great officer about court when my lord of Essex was first in trouble, and that he and those that dealt for him would talk much of my lord's friends and of his enemies, answered to one of them, I will tell you, I know but one friend and one enemy my lord hath, and that one friend is the queen, and that one enemy is himself, End quote but rather might both have been esteemed his enemies, for what except the imprudent fondness of the Queen, and the excess of favour which she at first lavished upon him, was the original cause of that intoxication of mind which finally became the instrument of his destruction. But from observations which anticipate perhaps too much the catastrophe of this melancholy history, it is time to return to a narrative of events. The Spanish armament incidentally became the occasion of involving the Earl of Arundel in a charge of a capital nature ever since the treachery of his agents, in the year 1585, had baffled his design of quitting for ever a country in which his religion and his political attachments had rendered him an alien, this unfortunate nobleman had remained close prisoner in the tower. Such treatment might well be supposed calculated to augment the vehemence of his bigotry and the rancour of his disaffection, and it became a current report that, on hearing news of the sailing of the Armada, he had caused a mass of the Holy Ghost and devotions of twenty-four hours' continuance to be celebrated for its success. This rumour being confirmed by one Bennet, a priest then under examination, and other circumstances of suspicion coming out, the Earl, on April the 14th, 1589, was brought to the bar of the House of Lords on a charge of high treason. Bennet, struck with compunction, addressed to him a letter acknowledging his testimony to have been false, and extorted from him solely by the fear of the rack. But it appears that this letter, still extant among the Burley papers, was intercepted by the government, and the prisoner, by this cruel and iniquitous artifice, was deprived of all means of invalidating the testimony of Bennet, who was brought into court as a witness against him. By a second violation of every principle of justice, the matters for which, as contempts, he had already undergone the sentence of the Star Chamber, were now introduced into his indictment for high treason, to which the following articles were added, that he had engaged to assist Cardinal Allen in the restoration of popery, that he had intimated the unfitness of the Queen to govern, that he had caused masses to be said for the success of the Armada, that he had attempted to withdraw himself beyond seas for the purpose of serving under the Duke of Parma, and that he had been privy to the bull of Pope Sixtus V, transferring the sovereignty of England from Her Majesty to the King of Spain. To all these articles, which he was not allowed to separate, the Earl pleaded not guilty, but afterwards, in his defence, confessed some of them, though with certain extenuations. 
he asserted that the prayers and masses which he had caused to be said were for the averting of a general massacre of the English Catholics, alleged to be designed, and not for the success of the Armada. The aid to the Catholic cause, which he had promised in his correspondence with Cardinal Allen, he declared to refer only to peaceful attempts at making converts, not to the encouragement of any plan of rebellion. He acknowledged a design of going to serve under the Prince of Parma, since he was denied the exercise of his religion at home. But he argued his innocence of any view of cooperating in plans of invasion, from the circumstance that his attempt to leave England had taken place during the year fixed by the Cardinal Allen and the Queen of Scots for the execution of a scheme of this nature. The Crown lawyers, in order to make out a case of constructive treason, urged the reconcilement of the prisoner with the Church of Rome, which they held to be of itself a traitorous act. His correspondence with declared traitors, and the high opinion entertained of him by the Queen of Scots and Cardinal Allen, as the chief support of Popery in England. They likewise exhibited an emblematical picture found in his house, representing in one part a hand shaking off a viper into the fire, with the motto, quote, If God is for us, who can be against us? End quote. And in another part a lion, the cognizance of the Howard family, deprived of his claws, under him the words, quote, Yet still a lion. End quote. On these charges, none of which, though proved by the most unexceptionable witnesses, could bring him within the true meaning of the old statute of Edward III, on which he was indicted, the peers were base enough to pronounce a unanimous verdict of guilty, which he received, as his father had done before him, with the words, quote, God's will be done, end quote. But here the Queen felt herself concerned in honour to interpose. It had ever been her maxim and her boast to punish none capitally for religious delinquencies unconnected with traitorous designs and sensible probably how imperfectly in this case the latter had been proved, she was pleased, in her abundant mercy, to commute the capital part of the sentence against her unhappy kinsman for perpetual imprisonment, attended with the forfeiture of the greater part of his estate. In 1595 this victim of the religious dissensions of a fierce and bigoted age ended in his thirty-ninth year an unfortunate life, shortened, as well as embittered, by the more than monkish austerities which he imagined it meritorious to inflict upon himself. From the period of the abortive attempt at insurrection under the earls of Northumberland and Westmoreland, the whole course of public events had tended to increase the difficulties and aggravate the sufferings in which the Catholics of England found themselves inextricably involved. Their situation was thus forcibly depicted by Philip Sidney, in a passage of his celebrated letter to Her Majesty against the French marriage, which at the present day will probably be read in a spirit very different from that in which it was written. Quote, the other faction, most rightly indeed to be called a faction, is the Papists, men whose spirits are full of anguish, some being infested by others whom they accounted damnable, some having their ambition stopped because they are not in the way of advancement, some in prison and disgrace, some whose best friends are banished practisers, many thinking you a usurper, many thinking also you had disannulled your right because of the Pope's excommunication, all burdened with the weight of their consciences, men of great numbers, of great riches, because the affairs of state have not lain on them, of united minds, as all men that deem themselves oppressed naturally are." A further commentary on the hardships of their condition may be extracted from an apology for the measures of the English government towards both Papists and Puritans, addressed by Walsingham to M. Critois, the French Secretary of State. Quote, Sir, whereas you desire to be advertised touching the proceedings here in ecclesiastical causes, because you seem to note in them some inconstancy and variation, as if we sometimes inclined to one side, sometimes to another, as if that clemency and lenity were not used of late that was used in the beginning, all of which you impute to your own superficial understanding of the affairs of this state, having notwithstanding Her Majesty's doing in singular reverence, as the real pledges which she hath given unto the world of her sincerity in religion, and her wisdom in government well meriteth, I am glad of this occasion to impart that little I know in that matter to you, both for your own satisfaction, and to the end you may make use thereof towards any that shall not be so modestly and so reasonably minded as you are. I find, therefore, your Majesty's proceedings to have been grounded upon two principles. One, the one that consciences are not to be forced, but to be won and reduced by the force of truth, with the aid of time, and use of all good means of instruction and persuasion. Two, the other, that the causes of conscience, wherein they exceed their bounds, and grow to be matter of faction, lose their nature, and that sovereign princes ought distinctly to punish the practice in contempt, though coloured under the pretence of conscience and religion. According to these principles, 
her majesty, at her coming to the crown, utterly disliking the tyranny of Rome, which had used by terror and rigour to settle commandments of men's faiths and consciences, though as a prince of great wisdom and magnanimity, she suffered but the exercise of one religion, yet her proceedings towards the papists was with great lenity, expecting the good effects which time might work in them. And therefore her majesty revived not the laws made in the twenty-eight and thirty-five of her father's reign, whereby the oath of supremacy might have been offered at the king's pleasure to any subject, though he kept his conscience never so modestly to himself, and the refusal to take the same oath without further circumstance was made treason. But contrariwise her majesty, not liking to make windows into men's hearts and secret thoughts, except the abundance of them did overflow into overt or express acts or affirmations, tempered her laws so as it restraineth every manifest disobedience, in impugning and impeaching advisedly and maliciously her majesty's supreme power, maintaining and extolling a foreign jurisdiction. And as for the oath, it was altered by her majesty into a more grateful form, the hardness of the name and appellation of supreme head was removed, and the penalty of the refusal thereof turned only into disablement to take any promotion, or to exercise any charge, and yet with liberty of being reinstated therein, if any man should accept thereof during his life. But when, after pious Quintus had excommunicated her majesty, and the bills of excommunication were published in London, whereby her majesty was in a sort proscribed, and that thereupon, as a principal motive or preparative, followed the rebellion in the north, yet because the ill-humours of the realm were by that rebellion partly purged, and that she feared at that time no foreign invasion, and much less the attempt of any within the realm not backed by some potent succour from without, she contented herself to make a law against that special case of bringing and publishing any bulls, or the like instruments, whereunto was added a prohibition, upon pain, not of treason, but of an inferior degree of punishment, against the bringing in of Agnus Dei, hallowed bread, and such other merchandise of Rome, as are well known not to be any essential part of the Romish religion, but only to be used in practice as love tokens, to enchant the people's affections from their allegiance to their natural sovereign. In all other points Her Majesty continued her former lenity, but when, about the twentieth year of her reign, she had discovered in the king of Spain an intention to invade her dominions, and that a principal part of the plot was to prepare a party within the realm that might adhere to the foreigner, and after that the seminaries began to blossom, and to send forth daily priests and professed men, who should by vow taken at shrift reconcile her subjects from their obedience, yea, and bind many of them to attempt against her majesty's sacred person, and that by the poison which they spread the humours of papists were altered, and that they were no more papists in conscience and of softness, but papists in faction. Then there were new laws made for the punishment of such as should submit themselves to such reconcilements or renunciations of obedience. And because it was a treason carried in the clouds, and in wonderful secrecy, and came seldom to light, and that there was no presupposition thereof so great as the recusants to come to divine service, because it was set down by their decrees, that to come to church before reconcilement was absolutely heretical and damnable. Therefore there were laws added containing punishment pecuniary against such recusants, not to enforce conscience, but to enfeeble and impoverish the means of those of whom it resteth indifferent and ambiguous, whether they were reconciled or no. And when, notwithstanding all this provision, this poison was dispersed so secretly, as that there were no means to stay it but by restraining the merchants that brought it in, then lastly there was added another law, whereby such seditious priests of new erection were exiled, and those that were at that time within the land shipped over, and so commanded to keep hence on pain of treason. This hath been the proceeding, though intermingled not only with sundry examples of Her Majesty's grace towards such as she knew to be papists in conscience, and not in faction and singularity, but also with an ordinary mitigation towards offenders in the highest degree committed by law, if they would but protest, that in case the realm should be invaded with a foreign army, by the Pope's authority, for the Catholic cause, as they term it, they would take part with Her Majesty, and not adhere to her enemies." End quote etc. The country sustained a heavy loss in 1589 by the death of Sir Walter Mildmay, Chancellor of the Exchequer, one of the most irreproachable public characters and best patriots of the age. He was old enough to have received his introduction to business in the time of Henry VIII, under whom he enjoyed a gainful office in the Court of Augmentations. During the reign of Edward he was Warden of the Mint. Under Mary he shrouded himself in that profound obscurity in which alone he could make safety accord with honour and conscience. Elizabeth, on the death of Sir Richard Sackville in 1568, advanced Mildmay to the important post of Chancellor of the Exchequer, which he held to the end of his life. 
but not so it should appear the favour of her majesty some of his back friends or secret enemies having whispered in her ear that he was a better patriot than subject and over-popular in parliament where he had gone so far as to complain that many subsidies were granted and few grievances redressed another strong ground of royal displeasure existed in the imputation of puritanism under which he laboured generously sacrificing to higher considerations the aggrandizement of his children mildmay devoted a large share of the wealth which he had gained in the public service to the erection and endowment of a college that of emmanuel at cambridge an action little agreeable it seems to her majesty for on his coming to court after the completion of this noble undertaking she said tartly to him quote, sir walter i hear you have erected a puritan foundation quote, no madam replied he far be it from me to countenance anything contrary to your established laws but i have set an acorn which when it comes to be an oak god alone knows what will be the fruit of it that this fruit however proved to be of the flavour so much distasted by her majesty there is good evidence quote, in the house of pure emmanuel i had my education where some surmise i dazzled my eyes with the light of revelation end quote, says quote, the distracted puritan end quote, in a song composed in King James' days by the witty Bishop Corbett. Mildmay was succeeded in his office by Sir John Fortescue, master of the wardrobe, a gentleman whose accomplishments in classical literature had induced the Queen to take him for her guide and assistant in the study of the Greek and Latin writers. In the discharge of his new functions he too was distinguished by moderation and integrity, so that in this important department of administration no oppression was exercised upon the subject during the whole of the reign a circumstance highly conducive both to the popularity of the queen and to the alacrity in granting supplies usually exhibited by her parliaments the late attempt at invasion so gloriously and happily frustrated had given a new impulse to the public mind the gallant youth of the country were seized with a universal rage for military enterprise and burned at once for vengeance and renown the riches and the weakness of the spanish empire both of them considerably exaggerated in popular opinion tempted the hopes and the cupidity of adventurers of a different class and by means of the united stimulus of gain and glory a numerous fleet was fitted out in the spring of fifteen eighty nine for an expedition to portugal which was equipped and manned almost entirely by the exertions of individuals the queen contributing only sixty six thousand pounds to the expense and six of her ships to the armament it will be remembered that on the death in fifteen eighty of henry king of portugal philip of spain had possessed himself of that kingdom as rightful heir having compelled Don Antonio, an illegitimate nephew of the deceased sovereign, who had ventured to dispute the succession, to quit the country, and take refuge first in France, and afterwards in England. This pretender had hitherto received little support or encouragement at the hands of Elizabeth. In fact, she had suffered him to languish in the most abject poverty, for there is a letter extant from a person about him to Lord Burley, entreating that he would move Her Majesty either to advance don antonio two hundred thousand crowns out of her share of the rich portuguese carrack captured by sir francis drake to enable him to recover his kingdom or at least to take upon herself the payment of his debts amounting to twelve or thirteen pounds without which his poor creditors are likely to be ruined the first part of this extraordinary alternative the prudent princess certainly declined what might be the fate of the second does not in this place appear but we learn elsewhere that during the long vacancy of the see of Eli which the Queen caused to succeed to the death of Bishop Cox in 1581, a part of its revenues were appropriated to the maintenance of this unfortunate competitor for royalty. It was imagined, however, by the projectors of the present expedition, that the discontent of the Portuguese under the yoke of Spain would now incline them to receive as a deliverer even this furious representative of their ancient race of monarchs, and Don Antonio received an invitation which he joyfully embraced, to embark himself and his fortunes on board the English fleet. The armament consisted of one hundred and eighty vessels of all kinds, carrying twenty-one thousand men. It set sail from Plymouth on April 18th, Sir Francis Drake being admiral and Sir John Norris general. The Earl of Essex, urged by the romantic gallantry of his disposition, afterwards joined the expedition with several ships fitted out at his own expense, in support of Don Antonio's title, though he bore in it no regular command since he sailed without the consent or privity of her majesty the first landing of the forces was at coruna where having captured four ships of war in the harbour they took and burned the lower town and made some bold attempts on the upper which was strongly fortified but after defeating with great slaughter a body of spaniards who were entrenched in the neighbourhood sir john norris finding it impracticable to renew his assaults on the upper town on account of a general want of powder in the fleet 
re-embarked his men, already suffering from sickness, and made sail for Portugal. After some consultation they landed at Peniche, about thirty miles to the north of Lisbon, took the castle, and having thrown into it a garrison, every man of which was afterwards put to the sword by the Spaniards, they began their march for the capital. So ill was the army provided that many died on the road for want of food, and others who had fainted with the heat must also have perished had not Essex, with characteristic generosity, caused all his baggage to be thrown out, and the carriages to be filled with the sick and weary. Instead of the troops of nobility and gentry by whom Don Antonio had flattered himself and his companions that he should be joined and recognized, there only appeared upon their march a band of miserable peasants without shoes or stockings, and one gentleman who presented him with a basket of plums and cherries. The English, however, proceeded, and made themselves masters without difficulty of the suburbs of Lisbon, in which they found great riches. But the entreaties of Don Antonio, and his anxiety to preserve the good will of the people, caused the general to restrain his men from plunder. Essex distinguished himself in every skirmish, and knocking at the gates of Lisbon itself, challenged the governor, or any other of equal rank, to single combat. But this romantic proposal was prudently declined, and though the city was known to be weakly guarded, the total want of battering cannon in the English army precluded the general from making an assault. In the meantime, Drake, who was to have cooperated with the land forces by an attack upon the city from the waterside, found his progress effectually barred by the forts at the mouth of the Tagus, and was thus compelled to relinquish all share in the enterprise. This disappointment, joined to the want of ammunition and other necessaries, and the rapid progress of sickness among the men, rendered necessary a speedy retreat and re-embarkation. About sixty vessels lying at the mouth of the Tagus, laden with corn and other articles of commerce, was seized by the English, though the property of the Hans towns, and Drake and Norris in their return burned Vigo. But various disasters overtook the fleet on its homeward voyage, subsequently to its dispersion by a violent storm. On the whole, it was computed that not less than eleven thousand persons perished in this unfortunate and ill-planned expedition, by which no one important object had been attained, and that of eleven hundred gentlemen who accompanied it, not more than three hundred and fifty escaped the united ravages of famine, sickness, and the sword. The Queen, on discovering that Essex had without permission absented himself from her court and from the duties of his office of master of the horse, to embark in the voyage to Portugal, had instantly dispatched a peremptory order for his return, enforced by menaces of her utmost indignation in case of disobedience. But even to this pressing mandate he had dared to turn a deaf ear. During the four or five months, therefore, of his absence, the whole court had remained in fearful or exulting anticipation of the thunderbolt about to fall on his devoted head. But the laurels with which he had encircled his brows proved his safeguard. Elizabeth had listened with a secret complacency to the reports of his valour and generosity which reached her through various channels. Her tenderness had been strongly excited by the image of the perils to which he was daily exposing himself, and her joy at his safe return, too genuine and too lively for concealment, left her so little of the power or the wish to chide, that his pardon seemed granted even before it could be implored. Essex had too much sensibility not to be deeply touched by this affectionate behaviour on the part of his sovereign. He redoubled his efforts to deserve the oblivion of his past offence, and with a success so striking that it was soon evident to all that the temerity which might have ruined another had but heightened and confirmed his favour. Essex possessed, as much as Leicester himself, the art of stimulating Elizabeth in his own behalf to acts of munificence, and she soon consoled him by some valuable grants for any anxiety which her threatened indignation might have occasioned him, or any disappointment which he might have conceived in seeing Sir Christopher Hatton preferred by her to himself as Leicester's successor in the office of Chancellor of the University of Cambridge. Among the gallant adventurers in the cause of Don Antonio, Sir Walter Raleigh had made one, and he also was received by Her Majesty on his return with tokens of distinguished favour. But not long after he embarked for Ireland, in which country he remained without public employment till the spring of 1592, when he undertook an expedition against the Spanish settlements in South America. The ostensible purpose of his visit to Ireland was to superintend the management of those large estates which had been granted him in that country. But it was the story of the day that, quote, the Earl of Essex had chased Raleigh from court and confined him into Ireland, end quote. and the length of his absence, with the known enmity between these rival favourites, lend some countenance to the suggestion. That Essex, even in the early days of his favour, already assumed the right of treating as interlopers such as advanced too rapidly in the good graces of his sovereign, we learn from an incident which probably occurred about this time, and is thus related by Naunton. 
my lord mountjoy being but newly come to court and then but sir charles blount had the good fortune one day to run very well a tilt and the queen therewith was so well pleased that she sent him a token of her favour a queen at chess of gold richly enamelled which his servants had the next day fastened on his arm with a crimson ribbon which my lord of essex as he passed through the privy chamber espying with his cloak cast under his arm the better to commend it to the view inquired what it was and for what cause there fixed sir fulk greville told him that it was the queen's favour which the day before and after the tilting she had sent him whereat my lord of essex in a kind of emulation and as though he would have limited her favour said now i perceive every fool must have a favour this bitter and public affront came to sir charles blount's ear who sent him a challenge which was accepted by my lord and they went near maribone park where my lord was hurt in the thigh and disarmed the queen missing the men was very curious to learn the truth and when at last it was whispered out she swore by god's death it was fit that some one or other should take him down and teach him better manners otherwise there would be no rule with him notwithstanding her majesty's ostentation of displeasure against her favourite on this occasion it is pretty certain that he could not better have paid his court to her than by a duel of which in spite of her wisdom and her age she seems to have had the weakness to imagine her personal charms the cause she compelled however the rivals to be reconciled from this period all the externals of friendship were preserved between them and there is even reason to believe notwithstanding some insinuations to the contrary that latterly at least the sentiment became a genuine one if the queen had further insisted on cementing their reconciliation by an alliance she would have preserved from its only considerable blot the brilliant reputation of sir charles blount this courtier whilst he as yet enjoyed no higher rank than that of knighthood had conceived an ardent passion for a sister of the earl of essex the same who was once destined to be the bride of philip sidney she returned his attachment but her friends judging the match inferior to her just pretensions broke off the affair and compelled her to give her hand to lord rich a man of disagreeable character who was the object of her aversion in such a marriage the unfortunate lady found it impossible to forget the lover from whom tyrannical authority had severed her and some years after when mountjoy returned victorious from the irish wars she suffered herself to be seduced by him into a criminal connection which was detected after it had subsisted for several years and occasioned her divorce from lord rich her lover now earl of devonshire regarded himself as bound in love and in honour to make her his wife but to marry a divorced woman in the lifetime of her husband was at this time so unusual a proceeding and regarded as so violent a scandal that laud then chaplain to the earl of devonshire who joined their hands incurred severe blame and thought it necessary to observe the anniversary ever after as a day of humiliation king james in whose reign the circumstance took place long refused to avail himself further of the services of the earl and the disgrace and vexation of the affair embittered and some say abridged the days of this otherwise admirable person whether any incidents connected with this attachment had a share in producing that hostile state of feeling in the mind of essex towards blount which led to their combat remains matter of conjecture this year the customary festivities on the anniversary of her majesty's accession were attended by one of those romantic ceremonies which mark so well the taste of the age and of elizabeth this was no other than the formal resignation by that veteran of the tilt-yard sir henry lee of the office of queen's champion so long his glory and delight the gallant earl of cumberland was his destined successor and the momentous transfer was accomplished after the following fashion having first performed their respective parts in the chivalrous exercises of the band of knights tilters sir henry and the earl presented themselves to her majesty at the foot of the gallery where she was seated surrounded by her ladies and nobles to view the games they advanced to slow music and a concealed performer accompanied the strain with the following song Quote, my golden locks time hath to silver turned o oh, time too swift and swiftness never ceasing and age at youth hath spurned but spurned in vain youth waneth by increasing beauty strength and youth flowers fading bean duty faith and love are roots and ever green my helmet now shall make a hive for bees and lovers songs shall turn to holy psalms a man at arms must now sit on his knees and feed on prayers that are old age's alms and so from court to cottage i depart my saint is sure of mine unspotted heart and when i sadly sit in homely cell i'll teach my swains this carol for a song blessed be the hearts that think my sovereign well cursed be the souls that think to do her wrong goddess vouchsafe this aged man his right to be your beadsman now that was your knight during this performance there arose out of the earth a pavilion of white taffeta 
supported on pillars resembling a porphyry, and formed to imitate the temple of the Vestal Virgins. A superb altar was placed within it, on which were laid some rich gifts for Her Majesty. Before the gate stood a crowned pillar embraced by an eglantine, to which a votive tablet was attached, inscribed, To Elizabeth. The gifts and the tablet being with great reverence delivered to the queen, and the aged knight in the meantime disarmed, he offered up his armour at the foot of the pillar. Then kneeling, presented the Earl of Cumberland to Her Majesty, praying her to be pleased to accept of him for her knight, and to continue these annual exercises. The proposal being graciously accepted, Sir Henry armed the Earl and mounted him on his horse. This done, he clothed himself in a long velvet gown and covered his head, in lieu of a helmet, with, quote, a buttoned cap of the country fashion, end quote. End of section 36. Section 37 of Memoirs of the Court of Queen Elizabeth. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Memoirs of the Court of Queen Elizabeth, Volumes 1 and 2, by Lucy Aiken. Chapter 22, 1588 to 1591, Part 2. The King of Scots had now for a considerable time deserved extremely well of Elizabeth. During the whole period of the Spanish armament, he had remained unshaken in his attachment to her cause resolutely turning a deaf ear to the flattering offers of Philip the Second, with the shrewd remark that all the favour he had to expect from this monarch in case of his success against England was that of polyphemy to Ulysses, to be devoured the last. A bon mot which was carefully copied into the English Mercury. The ambassador to Scotland, from an unfounded opinion that the discomfited armada sought shelter in the ports of that country under the faith of some secret engagement with James, had thought it necessary to bribe him to fidelity by some brilliant promises, of which when the danger was past Elizabeth unhandsomely evaded the fulfilment. But even on this occasion he abstained from any vehement expressions of indignation. In short, his whole demeanour towards his lofty kinswoman was that of a submissive expectant much more than of a competitor and rival prince. True it is that he had begun to attach to himself among her nobles and courtiers as many adherents as his means permitted but besides that his manoeuvres remained for the most part concealed from her knowledge, they certainly carried with them no danger to her government. The partisans of James were not, like those of his mother, the adherents also of a religious faction leagued with the foreign powers most inimical to her rule, and from whose machinations she was exposed to daily peril of her throne and life. They were Protestants and Englishmen, and many of them possessed of such strong hereditary influence or official rank, that it could never become their interest to throw the country into confusion by ill-timed efforts in favour of the King of Scots, whose cause they in fact embraced with no other view than to secure the state from commotion, and themselves from the loss of power on the event of the Queen's demise. The Puritan party, indeed, by whom several attempts were afterwards made in Parliament to extort from the Queen a settlement of the Crown in James' favour, were doubtless actuated in part by discontent with the present church establishment, and the hope of seeing it superseded under James by a Presbyterian form resembling that of Scotland. For the present, however, these religionists were sufficiently repressed under the iron rod of the High Commission Court, and James had entered with them into no regular correspondence, and engaged their attachment by no promises of future indulgence or support. On the whole, therefore, the violent jealousy with which Elizabeth continued to regard this feeble and inoffensive young king, in every point so greatly her inferior, must rather be imputed to her narrowness and malignity of temper than to any dictates of sound policy or advisable precaution, and the measures with which it prompted her were impressed accordingly with every character of spite and meanness. She was peculiarly solicitous to prevent James from increasing his consequences by marriage, and through innumerable intrigues with his ministers and favourites she had hitherto succeeded in her object when he appeared to have set his mind on a union with the eldest daughter of the King of Denmark, she contrived to interpose so many delays and obstacles that this sovereign, conceiving himself trifled with, ended the affair by giving the princess in marriage to another. To embarrass matters still more, she next proposed to James a match with the sister of the King of Navarre, a princess much older than himself, destitute of fortune, and whose brother might be influenced to protract the negotiation to any length convenient to his valuable ally, the Queen of England. This proposal being declined by James, and overtures made in his name to a younger daughter of the Danish house, she again set her engines at work to thwart his wishes. 
but indignation and an amorous impatience for once lent to James resolution sufficient to carry his point. Disregarding a declaration of his privy council against the match, he instigated the citizens of Edinburgh to take up arms in his cause, and finally accomplished the sending out of a splendid embassy by which the marriage articles were speedily settled, and the princess conducted on board the fleet which was to convey her to Scotland. A violent storm having driven her for shelter into a port of Norway, the young monarch carried his gallantry so far as to set sail in quest of her, and reconducting her, at the request of the king her father, to Copenhagen, he there passed the winter in great joy and festivity, and as soon as the season would permit, conducted his royal consort home in triumph, and crowned her with all the magnificence that Scotland could display. Seeing the turn which matters had taken, Elizabeth now made a virtue of necessity, and dispatched a solemn embassy to express to her good brother of Scotland her hearty congratulations on his nuptials, and her satisfaction in his happy return from so adventurous a voyage. In April 1590 died Sir Francis Walsingham, principal secretary of state, whose name is found in such intimate connection with the whole domestic policy of Elizabeth during several eventful years, that his character is in a manner identified with that of the measures at this period pursued. This eminent person, in his youth and exile for the Protestant cause, retained through life so serious a sense of religion as sometimes to expose him to the suspicion of Puritanism. In his private capacity he was benevolent, friendly, and accounted a man of strict integrity. But it is right that public characters should principally be estimated by that part of their conduct in which the public is concerned, and to Walsingham as a minister the unsullied reputation of virtue and honour is not to be conceded. Unlike that pure and noble patriot who, quote, would have lost his life with pleasure to serve his country, but would not have done a base thing to save it, end quote. This statesman seems to have held that few base things ought to be scrupled by which his queen and country might be served. That Walsingham was of unimpeached fidelity towards his sovereign requires no proof. That he was not stimulated by views of private emolument seems also to be satisfactorily evinced, though somewhat to the discredit of his mistress by the load of debt incurred in his official capacity, under the pressure of which he lived and died. But here our praise of his public virtue must end. It is impossible to regard without indignation and disgust the system of artifice and intrigue which he contrived for the purpose of ensnaring the persecuted and therefore disaffected Catholics. And while due credit is given to his unwearied diligence and remarkable sagacity in detecting dangerous conspiracies, it cannot be doubted that the extraordinary encouragements held out by him to spies and informers, those pests of a commonwealth, must in numberless instances have rendered himself the dupe, and innocent persons the victims, of designing villainy. Looking even to the immediate results of his measures, it may be triumphantly demanded by the philanthropist and the sage whether a system less artificial, less treacherous, and less cruel would not equally well have succeeded in protecting the person of the queen from the machinations of traitors, with the further and inestimable advantage of preserving her government from reproach and the national character from degradation. That the system of Walsingham was in the main that also of his court and of his age is indeed true, and this consideration might in some degree plead his excuse, did it not appear that there was in his personal character a native subtlety and talent of insinuation, which, aptly conspiring with the nature of his office, might truly be said to render his duty his delight a feature of his mind which is thus happily delineated by a witty and ingenious writer. Quote, None alive did better ken the secretary's craft to get counsels out of others and keep them in himself. Marvellous his sagacity in examining suspected persons, either to make them confess the truth, or confound themselves by denying it to their detection. Cunning his hands, who could unpick the cabinets in the Pope's conclave. Quick his ears, who could hear at London what was whispered at Rome and numerous the spies and eyes of this Argus, dispersed in all places. The Jesuits, being outshot in their own bow, complained that he out-equivocated their equivocation, having a mental reservation deeper and further than theirs. They tax him for making heaven bow too much to earth, oft-times borrowing a point of conscience with full intent never to pay it again, whom others excused by reasons of state and dangers of the times. Indeed his simulation, which all allow lawful, was as like to dissimulation, condemned by all good men, as two things could be which were not the same. He thought that gold might, but intelligence could not, be bought too dear. The cause that so great a statesman left so small an estate, and so public a person was so privately buried in St. Paul's." 
the long state of infirmity which preceded the death of Walsingham had afforded abundant opportunity for various intrigues and negotiations respecting the appointment of his successor in office. Burley hoped to make the choice of Her Majesty fall on his son Robert. Essex was anxious to decide it in favour of the discarded Davison, who seems to have been performing some part of the functions of a Secretary of State during the illness of Walsingham, though he did not venture to appear in the sight of his still offended mistress. No one was more susceptible of generous emotions than Essex, and it ought not to be doubted that much of the extraordinary zeal which he manifested during two or three entire years in the cause of this unfortunate and ill-treated man is to be ascribed to genuine friendship. But neither must it be concealed that this struggle for the nomination of a secretary was in effect the great and decisive trial of strength between himself and the Cecils. Several letters have been printed, written by Essex to Davison and bearing date between the years 1587 and 1590, from which a few extracts may be worth transcribing, both for the excellence of the style and the light which they reflect on the behaviour and sentiments of Elizabeth in this matter. Quote, I had speech with Her Majesty yesternight after my departure from you, and I did find that the success of my speech, although I hoped for good, yet did much overrun my expectation. I made Her Majesty see that, in your health, in your fortune, in your reputation in the world, you had suffered since the time that it was her pleasure to commit you. I told her how many friends and well-wishers the world did afford you, and how, for the most part, throughout the whole realm her best subjects did wish that she would do herself the honour to repair for you and restore to you that state which she had overthrown. Your humble suffering of these harms, and reverent regard to Her Majesty, must needs move a princess so noble and so just to do you right. And more I had said, if my gift of speech had been any way comparable to my love. Her Majesty, seeing her judgment opened by the story of her own actions, showed a very feeling compassion of you. She gave you many praises, and among the rest that she seemed to please herself in was, that you were a man of her own choice. In truth she was so well pleased with those things that she spake and heard of you, that I dare, if of things future there be any assurance, promise to myself that your peace will be made to your content and the desire of your friends, I mean in her favour and your own fortune, to a better estate than, or at least the same you had, which with all my power I will employ myself to effect, end quote, etc. That these sanguine hopes were soon checked appears by the following passage of a subsequent letter. Quote, I have, as I could, taken my opportunity since I saw you to perform as much as I promised you, and though in all I have been able to effect nothing, yet even now I have had better leisure to solicit the Queen than in this stormy time I did hope for. My beginning was, as being amongst others, entreated to move her in your behalf. My course was to lay open your sufferings in your patience. In them you had felt poverty, restraint, and disgrace, and yet you showed nothing but faith and humility. Faith, as being never wearied nor discouraged to do her service. Humbleness, as content to forget all the burdens that had been laid upon you, and to serve Her Majesty with as frank and willing a heart as they that have received greatest grace from her. To this I received no answer but in general terms that her honour was much touched your presumption had been intolerable, and that she could not let it slip out of her mind. When I urged your access she denied it, but so as I had no cause to be afraid to speak again. When I offered in them both to reply, she fell into other discourse, and so we parted." Quote, etc. On the death of Walsingham he writes thus, quote, "'Upon this unhappy accident I have tried to the bottom what the Queen will do for you, and what the credit of your solicitor is worth.' I urge not the comparison between you and any other, but in my duty to her and zeal to her service I did assure her that she had not any other in England that would for these three or four years know how to settle himself to support so great a burden. She gave me leave to speak, heard me with patience, confessed with me that none was so sufficient, and would not deny but that which she lays to your charge was done without hope, fear, malice, envy, or any respects of your own, but merely for her safety, both of state and person. In the end she absolutely denied to let you have that place, and willed me to rest satisfied, for she was resolved. Thus much I write to let you know I am more honest to my friends than happy in their cases, quote, etc. As the fear of giving offence to the Queen of Scots was one reason or pretext for the implacability of the Queen towards Davison, Essex hazarded the step of writing to request, as a personal favour to himself, the forgiveness and good offices of this monarch in behalf of the man who bore the blame of his mother's death. Nothing could be more dexterous than the turn of this letter, but what reception it found we do not discover. On the whole, all his efforts were unavailing. 
the longer elizabeth reflected on the matter the less she felt herself able to forgive the presumption of the rash man who had anticipated her final resolution on the fate of mary other considerations probably concurred as the apprehension which seems to have been of perpetual recurrence to her mind of rendering her young favourite too confident and presuming by a uniform course of success in his applications to her the habitual ascendancy of burleigh and probably some distrust of the capacity of davison for so difficult and important a post in conclusion no principal secretary was at present appointed but robert cecil was admitted as an assistant to his father who resumed on this condition the duties of the office and held it as it were in trust till her majesty six years afterwards was pleased to sanction his resignation in favour of his son now fully established in her confidence and good opinion of davison nothing further is known probably he did not long survive some time in the year fifteen ninety the earl of essex married in a private manner the widow of sir philip sidney and daughter of walsingham a step with which her majesty did not scruple to show herself highly offended the inferiority of the connection in the two articles of birth and fortune to the just pretensions of the earl and the circumstance that the union had been formed without that previous consultation of her gracious pleasure which from her high nobility and favourite courtiers and especially from those who like essex and his lady shared the honour of her relationship she expected as an homage and almost claimed as a right were the ostensible grounds of her displeasure but that peculiar compound of ungenerous feelings which rendered her the universal foe of matrimony exalted on this occasion by a jealousy too humiliating to be owned but too powerful to be repressed formed without doubt the more genuine sources of her deep chagrin the courtiers quickly penetrated the secret of her heart for what vice what wickedness can long lurk unsuspected in a royal bosom and it is thus that john stanhope one of her attendants ventures to write on the subject to lord talbot Quote, this night god willing she will to richmond and on saturday next to somerset house and if she could overcome her passion against my lord of essex for his marriage no doubt she would be much quieter yet doth she use it more temperately than was thought for and god be thanked does not strike all that she threats the earl doth use it with good temper concealing his marriage as much as so open a matter may be not that he denies it to any but for her majesty's better satisfaction is pleased that my lady shall live very retired in her mother's house on the whole the indignation of the queen against essex stopped very short of the rage with which she had been transported against leicester on a similar occasion she never even talked of sending him to prison for his marriage her good sense came to her assistance somewhat indeed too late for her own dignity but soon enough to intercept any serious mischief to the earl and having found leisure to reflect on the folly and disgrace of openly maintaining an ineffectual resentment she soon after readmitted the offender to the same station of seeming favour as before there has appeared however some ground to suspect that the queen never entirely dismissed her feelings of mortification or again reposed in essex the same unbounded confidence with which she had once honoured him from a passage of a letter addressed by lord buckhurst to sir robert sidney then governor of the brill we learn that in the autumn of the next year she still retained such displeasure against sir robert for having been present at a banquet given by essex either on occasion of his marriage or with a view to the furtherance of some design of his which excited her suspicion that she could not be induced to grant him leave of absence for a visit to england but cares and occupations of a nature peculiarly uncongenial with the indulgence of sentimental sorrows now claimed and not in vain the serious thoughts of this prudent and vigilant princess the low state of her finances exhausted by no wasteful prodigalities but by the necessary measures of national defence and the politic aid which she had extended to the united provinces and to the french huguenot now threatened to place her in a painful dilemma she must either desert her allies and suffer her navy to relapse into the dangerous state of weakness from which she had exerted all her efforts to raise it or summon a new parliament for the purpose of making fresh demands upon the purses of her people and this at the risk either of shaking their attachment or a humiliation not to be endured seeing herself compelled to sacrifice to the importunities of the popular members some of the more oppressive branches of her prerogative the right of purveyance for instance or that of granting monopolies both of which she had suffered to grow into enormous grievances mature reflection discovered to her however a third alternative that of practising a still stricter economy on one hand and on the other of increasing the productiveness to the exchequer of the customs and other branches of revenue by reforming abuses by detecting frauds and embezzlements and by cutting off the exorbitant profits of collectors 
This last plan, which best accorded with her disposition, was that adopted by Elizabeth. It may be mentioned as a characteristic trait that a few years before she had accepted with thanks an offer secretly made to herself by some person holding an inferior station in the customs, of a full disclosure of the impositions practised upon her in that department. She had admitted this voluntary informer several times to her presence, had imposed silence in the tone of a mistress on the remonstrances of Leicester, Burley, and Walsingham, who indignantly urged that he was not of a rank to be thus countenanced in accusation of his superiors, and had reaped the reward of this judicious patronage by finding herself entitled to demand from her farmer of the customs an annual rent of forty two thousand pounds instead of the twelve thousand pounds which he had formerly paid she now exacted from him a further advance of eight thousand pounds per annum and stimulated burleigh to such a rigid superintendence of all the details of public economy as produced a very important general result it was probably in the ensuing parliament that a conference being held between the two houses respecting a bill for making the patrimonial estates of accounts liable for their arrears to the queen and the commons desiring that it might not be retrospective the lord treasurer pithily said quote, my lords if you had lost your purse by the way would you look back or forwards to find it the queen hath lost her purse End quote. this rigid parsimony at once the virtue and the foible of elizabeth was attended accordingly with its good and its evil it endeared her to the people whom it protected from the imposition of new and oppressive taxes but being united in the complex character of this remarkable woman with an extraordinary taste for magnificence in all that related to her personal appearance, it betrayed her into a thousand meannesses, which, in spite of all the arts of graciousness in which she was an adept, served to alienate the affections of such as more nearly approached her. Her nobles found themselves heavily burdened by the long and frequent visits which she paid them at their country seats, attended always by an enormous retinue, as well as by the contributions to her jewellery and wardrobe, which custom required of them under the name of new year's gifts and on all occasions when they had favours or even justice to ask at her hands there were few of the inferior suitors at court attendance composing the crowd by which she had a vanity in seeing herself constantly surrounded who did not find cause bitterly to rue the day when first her hollow smiles and flattering speeches seduced them to long years of irksome servile and often profitless assiduity bacon in his apothegms relates on this subject the following anecdote Quote, queen elizabeth seeing sir edward in her garden looked out at her window and asked him in italian what does a man think of when he thinks of nothing sir edward who had not had the effect of some of the queen's grants so soon as he had hoped and desired paused a little and then made answer madam he thinks of a woman's promise the queen shrunk in her head but was heard to say well sir edward i must not confute you anger makes dull men witty but it keeps them poor End quote. Quote, queen elizabeth says the same author was dilatory enough in suits of her own nature and the lord treasurer burleigh being a wise man and willing therein to feed her humour would say to her madam you do well to let suitors stay for i shall tell you bistad qui cito dat if you grant them speedily they will come again the sooner End quote. it is probable that the popular story of this minister's intercepting the very moderate bounty which her majesty had proposed to herself the honour of bestowing on spencer is untrue with respect to this great poet since the four lines relating to the circumstance quote, madam you bid your treasurer on a time to give me reason for my rhyme but from that time and that season i have had nor rhyme nor reason End quote. long attributed to spencer are now known to be churchyards yet that the author of the fairy queen had similar injuries to endure is manifest from those lines of unrivalled energy in which the poet from the bitterness of his soul describes the miseries of a profitless court attendance. Few readers will have forgotten a passage so celebrated, but it will here be read with peculiar interest as illustrative of the character of Elizabeth and the sufferings of her unfortunate courtiers. Quote, Full little knowest thou that hast not tried what hell it is in suing long to bide, to lose good days that might be better spent, to waste long nights in pensive discontent, to speed to-day, to be put back to-morrow, to feed on hope, to pine with fear and sorrow, to have thy prince's grace, yet want her peers, to have thy asking, yet wait many years, to fret thy soul with crosses and with cares, to eat thy heart through comfortless despairs, to fawn, to crouch, to wait, to ride, to run, to spend, to give, to want, to be undone. End quote. Mother Hubbard's Tale 
one of the most laudable objects of the parsimony exercised by elizabeth at this period was that of enabling herself to afford effectual aid to henry the fourth of france now struggling with adverse fortune but invincible resolution to conquer from the united armies of spain and the league the throne which was his birthright in the depth of his distress just when his swiss and german auxiliaries were on the point of disbanding themselves for want of pay the friendship of elizabeth came in aid of his necessities with a supply of twenty two thousand pounds a sum trifling as it may seem in modern estimation which sufficed to rescue henry from his immediate embarrassment and which he frankly avowed to be the largest he had ever seen the generosity of his ally did not stop here for she speedily equipped a body of four thousand men and sent them to join him at dieppe under the command of the gallant lord willoughby by this reinforcement henry was enabled to march to paris and possess himself of its suburbs and subsequently to engage in several other enterprises in which he gratefully acknowledged the eminent service rendered him by the valour and fidelity of this band of english the next year elizabeth alarmed at seeing several of the ports of bretagne opposite to her own shores garrisoned by spanish troops whom the leaguers had called in to their assistance readily entered into a new treaty with henry by virtue of which she sent a fresh supply of three thousand men to assist him in the recovery of this province her expenses however were to be repaid by the king after the expulsion of the enemy sir john norris the appointed leader of this force ranked among the most eminent of elizabeth's captains and was also possessed of some hereditary claims to her regard which she did not fail to acknowledge as far as the jealousy of her favourites would give her leave one of sir john's grandfathers was that norris who suffered in the cause of anne boleyn the other was lord williams of tame to whom she had herself been indebted for so much respectful attention in the days of her greatest adversity she had called up his father to the house of peers as lord norris of rico and his mother she constantly addressed by a singular term of endearment quote, my own crow end quote. this pair had six sons of whom sir john was the eldest all it is said brave men addicted to arms and much respected by her majesty but an unfortunate quarrel with the four sons of sir francis knowles their oxfordshire neighbour arising out of a tournament in which the two brotherhoods were opposed to each other procured to the norrises the lasting enmity of this family which strong both by its relationship to the queen and its close alliance with leicester was able to impede their advancement to stations equal to their merits sir john norris learned the rudiments of military science under the celebrated admiral coligny to whom in his early youth he acted as a page and he enlarged his experience as captain of the english volunteers who in fifteen seventy eight generously carried the assistance of their swords to the oppressed netherlanders when they had rushed to arms in the sacred cause of liberty and conscience this gallant band particularly signalized its valour in the repulse of an assault made by don john of austria upon the dutch camp a hot action in which norris had three horses shot under him in fifteen eighty eight he was a distinguished member of the council of war the expedition to portugal in which he commanded has been already related and its ill success was certainly imputable to no want of courage or conduct on his part in the war of bretagne he gained high praise by a skilful retreat in which he drew off his small band of english safe and entire amid a host of foes we shall afterwards hear of him in a high command in ireland military glory was the darling object of the ambition of essex and jealous perhaps of the fame which sir john norris was acquiring in the french wars he prevailed upon the queen to grant him the command of a fresh body of troops destined to assist henry in expelling the leaguers from normandy the new general was deeply mortified at being obliged to remain for some time inactive at dieppe while the french king was carrying his arms into another quarter whither essex was restrained by the positive commands of his sovereign from following him at length they formed in concert the siege of rouen but when the town was nearly reduced to extremity an unexpected march of the duke of parma compelled henry to desert the enterprise elizabeth made it a subject of complaint against her ally that the english soldiers were always thrust foremost on every occasion of danger but by themselves this perilous preeminence was claimed as a privilege due to the brilliancy of their valour and their leader delighted with the spirit which they displayed encouraged and rewarded it by distributing among his officers with a profusion which highly offended his sovereign the honour of knighthood bestowed by herself with so much selection and reserve essex supported his character for personal courage and indulged his impetuous temper by sending an idle challenge to the governor of rouen who seems to have known his duty too well to accept it but his sanguine anticipations of some distinguished success were baffled by a want of correspondence between the plans of henry and the commands of elizabeth 
perhaps also in some degree by his own deficiency in the skill of a general. He had the further grief to lose by a musket-shot his only brother, Walter d'Evreux, a young man of great hopes to whom he was fondly attached, and leaving his men before Rouen, under the conduct of Sir Roger Williams, a brave soldier, he returned with little glory in the beginning of 1592 to soothe the displeasure of the Queen and combat the malicious suggestions of his enemies. In this bloodless warfare better success awaited him. His partial mistress received with favour his excuses, and not only restored him to her wonted grace, but soon after testified her opinion of his abilities by granting him admission into the Privy Council. The royal progress of this year in Sussex and Hampshire affords some circumstances worthy of mention. Viscount Montacute, now written Montague, a nobleman in much esteem with Elizabeth, though a zealous Catholic, solicited the honour of entertaining her at his seat at Coudray, near Midhurst, a mansion splendid enough to attract the curiosity and admiration of a royal visitant. The manor of Midhurst, in which Coudray is situated, had belonged during several ages to a branch of the potent family of Bohun. Thence it passed into possession of the Nevilles, a race second to none in England in the antiquity of its nobility and the splendour of its alliances. It thus became a part of the vast inheritance of Margaret, Countess of Salisbury, daughter of George, Duke of Clarence. Coudray House was the principal residence of this illustrious and injured lady, and it was here that the discovery took place of those papal bulls and emblematical banners which afforded a pretext to malice and rapacity to arm themselves against the miserable remnants of her days. By the attainder of the Countess, this with the rest of her estates became forfeited to the crown but the tyrant Henry was prevailed upon to regrant it, in exchange for other lands, to the heirs of her great-uncle John Neville, Marquis Montague. From an heir female of this branch, Viscount Montague, son of Sir Anthony Brown, master of the horse to Henry VIII, derived it and his title, conferred by Queen Mary. But to the ancient mansion there had previously been substituted by his half-brother, the Earl of Southampton, a costly structure decorated internally with that profusion of homely art which displayed the wealth and satisfied the taste of a courtier of Henry the Eighth. The building was as usual quadrangular, with a great gate flanked by two towers in the centre of the principal front. At the upper end of the hall stood a buck, as large as life, carved in brown wood, bearing on his shoulder the shield of England, and under it that of brown, with many quarterings. Ten other bucks, in various attitudes and of the size of life, were planted at intervals. There was a parlour more elegantly adorned with the works of Holbein and his scholars, a chapel richly furnished, a long gallery painted with the twelve apostles, and a corresponding one hung with family pictures and with various old paintings on subjects religious and military, brought from Battle Abbey, the spoils of which had been assigned to Sir Anthony Brown as that share of the general plunder of the monasteries to which his long and faithful service had entitled him from the bounty of his master. Amongst other particulars of the visit of Her Majesty at Coudray, we are told that on the morning after her arrival she rode in the park, where a delicate bower was prepared, and a nymph with a sweet song delivered her a crossbow to shoot at the deer, of which she killed three or four, and the Countess of Kildare one. It may be added that this was a kind of amusement not unfrequently shared by the ladies of that age, an additional trait of the barbarity of manners. Viscount Montague died two years after this visit, and to complete his story lies buried in Midhurst Church under a splendid monument of many-coloured marbles, on which may still be seen a figure representing him kneeling before an altar in fine gilt armour, with a cloak and, quote, beard of formal cut, end quote. Beneath are placed recumbent effigies of his two wives, dressed in rich cloaks and ruffs, with chained unicorns at their feet, and the whole is surrounded with sculptured scrutchions laboriously executed with innumerable quarterings. End of section 37《ご視聴ありがとうございました》この番組は、日本の国の国の国の国の国の国の国の国の国の国の国の国の国の国の国の国の国の国の国の国の国の国の国の国の国の国の国の国の国の国の国の国の国の国の国の国の than any other person in the kingdom, and though the cruel imprisonment of nine years, by which Elizabeth had doomed him to expiate the offence of a clandestine union with the blood royal, could scarcely have been obliterated from his indignant memory, certain considerations respecting the interests of his children might probably render him not unwilling to gratify her by a splendid act of homage, though peculiar circumstances increased beyond measure 
the expense and inconvenience of her present visit. Elvetham, which was little more than a hunting-seat, was far from possessing sufficient accommodation for the court, and the earl was obliged to supply its deficiencies by very extensive erections of timber, fitted up and furnished with all the elegance that circumstances would permit. He likewise found it necessary to cause a large pond to be dug, in which were formed three islands, artificially constructed in the likeness of a fort, a ship, and a mount, for the exhibition of fireworks and other splendid pageantries. The water was made to swarm with swimming and wading sea-gods, who blew trumpets instead of shells, and recited verses in praise of Her Majesty. Finally, a tremendous battle was enacted between the tritons of the pond and certain sylvan deities of the park, which was long and valiantly disputed, with darts on one side and large squirts on the other, and suddenly terminated, to the delight of all beholders, by the seizure and submersion of old Sylvanus himself. Elizabeth quitted Elvetham so highly gratified by the attentions of the noble owner that she made him a voluntary promise of her special favour and protection, but we shall find hereafter that her long-enduring displeasure against him relative to his first marriage was not yet so entirely laid aside, but that a slight pretext was sufficient to bring it once more into malignant activity. Early in the same summer the Queen had also paid a visit to Lord Burley at his favourite seat in Hertfordshire, of which Sir Thomas Wilkes thus speaks in a letter to Sir Robert Sidney. Quote, I suppose you have heard of Her Majesty's great entertainment at Theobald's, of her knighting Mr. Robert Cecil, and of the expectation of his advancement to the secretaryship. But so it is, as we say in court, that the knighthood must serve for both. End quote. Sir Christopher Hatton died in the latter end of the year, 1591. It appears that he had been languishing for a considerable time under a mortal disease, yet the vulgar appetite for the wonderful and the tragical occasioned it to be reported that he died of a broken heart, in consequence of Her Majesty's having demanded of him, with a rigour which he had not anticipated, the payment of certain monies received by him for tenths and first fruits. It was added that, struck with compunction on learning to what extremity her severity had reduced him, Her Majesty had paid him several visits, and endeavoured by her gracious and soothing speeches to revive his failing spirits, but that the blow was struck, and her repentance came too late. It is indeed certain that the Queen manifested great interest in the fate of her Chancellor, and paid him during his last illness very extraordinary personal attentions, but it ought to be mentioned, in refutation of the former part of the story, that she remitted to his nephew and heir, who was married to a granddaughter of Burley's, all her claims on the property which he left behind him. During his lifetime, also, Hatton seems to have tasted more largely than those of his competitors of the solid fruits of royal favour. Elizabeth persevered in the practice of originating in the reigns of her father and brother, of endowing her courtiers out of the spoils of the church. Sometimes, to the public scandal, she would keep a bishopric many years vacant for the sake of appropriating its whole revenues to secular uses and persons, and still more frequently the presentation to a see was given under the condition, express or implied, that certain manors should be detached from its possessions, or beneficial leases of lands and tenements granted to particular persons. Thus the Bishop of Ely was required to make a cession to Sir Christopher Hatton of the garden and orchard of Ely House near Holborn. On the refusal of the prelate to surrender property which he regarded himself as bound in honour and conscience to transmit unimpaired to his successors, Hatton instituted against him a chancery suit, and having at length succeeded in wresting from him the land, made it the site of a splendid house surrounded by gardens, which have been succeeded by the street still bearing his name. He had even sufficient interest with Her Majesty to cause her to address to the bishop the following violent letter, several times, with some variations, reprinted. Quote, Proud prelate, I understand you are backward in complying with your agreement, but I would have you to know that I who made you what you are can unmake you, and if you do not forthwith fulfil your engagement, by God I will immediately unfrock you. Yours as you demean yourself, Elizabeth. End quote. Sir John Harrington, in his brief view of the Church of England, accuses the Lord Chancellor Hatton of coveting likewise a certain manner attached to the See of Bath and Wells, and of inflaming the Queen's indignation against Bishop Godwin on account of his second marriage, in order to frighten him into compliance. A manoeuvre which in part succeeded, since the Bishop was reduced, by way of compromise, to grant him a long lease of another manner somewhat inferior in value. With all this, Hatton, as we have formerly observed, was distinguished as the patron of the established church against the Puritans. But his zeal in its behalf, whether real or affected, 
was attended by a spirit of moderation then rare and always commendable. He disliked, and sometimes checked, the oppressions exercised against the papists by a rigid enforcement of recent statutes, and he is reported to have held the doctrine, at that time a novel one, that neither fire nor steel ought ever to be employed on a religious account. The Chancellor, besides his other merits and accomplishments, was a cultivator of the drama. In 1568 a tragedy was performed before Her Majesty, and afterwards published, entitled Tancred and Gismund, or Gismund of Salerne, the joint performance of five students of the temple, who appear each to have taken an act. The fourth bears the signature of Hatton. It is also probable that he gave the Queen some assistance in similar pursuits, as her translation of a part of the tragedy of Hercules Ateus, preserved in the Bodleian, is in his handwriting. But it was never forgotten by others, nor apparently by himself, that he was brought into notice by his dancing, and we learn from a contemporary letter-writer that even after he had attained the dignity of Lord Chancellor, he laid aside his gown to dance at the wedding of his nephew. The circumstance is pleasantly alluded to by Gray in the description of Stoke Poges house, with which his long story opens. Quote, in Britain's Isle, no matter where, an ancient pile of buildings stands. The Huntingtons and Hattons there employed the power of fairy hands. To raise the ceiling's fretted height, each panel in achievement's clothing, rich windows that exclude the light, and passages that lead to nothing. Full oft within the spacious walls, when he had fifty winters o'er him, my grave lord keeper led the brawls, the seal and maces danced before him. His bushy beard and shoestrings green, his high-crowned hat and satin doublet, moved the stout heart of England's queen, though Pope and Spaniard could not trouble it." As Chancellor of Oxford, Hatton was succeeded by Lord Buckhurst, to the fresh mortification of Essex, who again advanced pretensions to this honorary office, and was a second time baffled by Her Majesty's open interference in behalf of his competitor. The more important post of Lord Chancellor remained vacant for some months, the seals being put in commission, after which Sergeant Pickering was appointed Lord Keeper, a person of respectable character, who appears to have performed the duties of his office without taking any conspicuous part in the court factions, or exercising any marked influence over the general administration of affairs. Towards one person of considerable note in his day, Sir John Perrot, some time deputy of Ireland, Hatton is reported to have acted the part of an industrious and contriving enemy, being provoked by the taunts which Sir John was continually throwing out against him as one who, quote, had entered the court in a galliard, end quote, and further instigated by the complaints, well or ill-founded, against the deputy of some of his particular friends and adherents. Sir John Perrot derived from a considerable family of that name, seated at Haroldstone in Pembrokeshire, his name and large estates. But his features, his figure, his air and common fame gave him King Henry the Eighth for a father. Nor was his resemblance to this redoubted monarch merely external. His temper was haughty and violent, his behaviour blustering, his language always coarse, and in the fits of rage to which he was subject, abusive to excess. Yet was he destitute neither of merit nor abilities. As President of Munster he had rendered great services to Her Majesty in 1572 by his vigorous conduct against the rebels. As Lord Deputy of Ireland between the years 1584 and 1588, he had made efforts still more praiseworthy towards the pacification of that unhappy and ill-governed country, by checking as much as possible the oppressions of every kind exercised by the English of the Pale against the miserable natives, towards whom his policy was liberal and benevolent. But his attempts at reformation armed against him, as usual, a host of foes, amongst whom was particularly distinguished Loftus, Archbishop of Dublin, whom he had exasperated by proposing to apply the revenues of St. Patrick's Cathedral to the foundation of a university in the capital of Ireland. Forged letters were amongst the means to which the unprincipled malice of his adversaries resorted for his destruction. One of these atrocious fabrications, in which an Irish chieftain was made to complain of excessive injustice on the part of the deputy, was detected by the exertions of the supposed writer, whom Perrot had in reality attached to himself by many benefits. But a second letter, which contained a protection to a Catholic priest, and made him employ the words our castle of dublin our kingdom of ireland produced a fatally strong impression on the jealous mind of elizabeth meantime the ill-fated deputy conscious of his own fidelity and essential loyalty and unsuspicious of the snares spread around him was often unguarded enough to give vent in gross and furious invective against the person of majesty itself to the profound vexation which he 
in common with all preceding and following governors of Ireland under Elizabeth, was destined to endure from the penury of her supplies and the magnitude of her requisitions. His words were all carried to the Queen, mingled with such artful insinuations as served to impart to these unmeaning ebullitions of a hasty temper the air of deliberate contempt and meditated disloyalty towards his sovereign. Just before the sailing of the Armada, Parrot was recalled, partly indeed at his own request. A rigid, or rather a malicious inquiry, was then instituted into all the details of his actions, words, and behaviour in Ireland, and he was committed to the friendly custody of Lord Burley. Afterwards, the Lords Hunsdon and Buckhurst, with two or three other councillors, were ordered to search and seize his papers in the house of the Lord Treasurer, without the participation of this great minister, who was at once offended and alarmed at the step. Parrot was carried to the tower, and at length, in April 1592, put upon his trial for high treason. The principal heads of accusation were his contemptuous words of the Queen, his secret encouragement of O'Rourke's rebellion and the Spanish invasion, and his favouring of traitors. Of all these charges, except the first, he seems to have proved his innocence, and on this he excused himself by the heat of his temper and the absence of all ill intention from his mind. He was, however, found guilty by a jury much more studious of the reputation of loyalty than careful of the rights of Englishmen. On leaving the bar, he is reported to have exclaimed, quote, God's death! Will the Queen suffer her brother to be offered up as a sacrifice to the envy of my frisking adversaries? End quote. The Queen felt the force of this appeal to the ties of blood. It was long before she could be brought to confirm his sentence, and she would never sign a warrant for its execution. Burley shed tears on hearing the verdict saying with a sigh that hatred was always the more inveterate the less it was deserved. Elizabeth, when her first emotions of anger had passed away, was now frequently heard to praise that rescript of the Emperor Theodosius in which it is thus written, quote, Should any one have spoken ill of the Emperor, if through levity it should be despised, if through insanity pitied, if through malice forgiven, end quote. She is likewise said, in a language more familiar to her, to have sworn a great oath that they who accused Parrot were all knaves, and he an honest and faithful man. It was accordingly presumed that she entertained the design of extending to him the royal pardon. But her mercy, if such it merits to be called, was tardy, and in September 1592, six months after his condemnation, this victim of malice perished in the tower, of disease, according to Camden, but by other accounts of a broken heart. In either case the story is an affecting one, and worthy to be had in lasting remembrance, as a striking and terrible example of the potency of court intrigue, and the guilty subserviency of judicial tribunals under the jealous rule of the last of the Tudors. English literature, under the auspices of Elizabeth and her learned court, had been advancing with a steady and rapid progress, and it may be interesting to contemplate the state of one of its fairest provinces, as exhibited by the pen of an able critic, who in the year 1589 gave to the world an art of English poesy. This work, though addressed to the Queen, was published with a dedication by the printer to Lord Burley, for the author thought proper to remain concealed. On its first appearance its merit caused it to be ascribed to Spencer by some, and by others to Sidney. But it was traced at length to Putnam, one of Her Majesty's gentlemen pensioners, the author of some adulatory poems addressed to her, and called Partheniads, and of various other pieces now lost. The subject is here methodically treated in three books, the first, of Poets and Poesy, the second, of Proportion, the third, of Ornament. After some remarks on the origin of the art and its earliest professors, and an account of the various kinds of poems known to the ancients, in which there is an absence of pedantry, of quaintness, and of every species of puerility, very rare among the didactic writers of the age, the critic proceeds to an enumeration of our principal vernacular poets, or vulgar makers, as he is pleased to anglicize the words. Beginning with a just tribute to Chaucer, as the father of genuine English verse, he passes rapidly to the latter end of the reign of Henry the Eighth, when, as he observes, there, quote, sprung up a new company of courtly makers, of whom Sir Thomas Wyatt the Elder and Henry Earl of Surrey were the two chieftains, who, having travelled into Italy, and there tasted the sweet and stately measures and style of the Italian poesy, as novices newly crept out of the schools of Dante, Ariost, and Petrarch, they greatly polished our rude and homely manner of vulgar poesy, from that it had been before, and for that cause may justly be said the first reformers of our English metre in style." After slight notice of minor poets, who flourished under Edward the Sixth and Mary, he goes on to observe that, quote, in Her Majesty's time that now is, 
are sprung up another crew of courtly makers, noblemen and gentlemen of Her Majesty's own servants, who have written excellently well, as it would appear if their doing could be found out, and made public with the rest." And in a subsequent passage he thus awards to each of them his appropriate commendation. Quote, of the latter sort I think thus, that for tragedy the Lord Buckhurst and Master Edward Ferrers, for such doings as I have seen of theirs do deserve the highest price the Earl of Oxford and Master Edwards of Her Majesty's Chapel for comedy and interlude, for Eglog and pastoral poesy Sir Philip Sidney and Master Chaloner, and that other gentleman who wrote the late Shepherd's Calendar. For dirty and amorous ode I find Sir Walter Raleigh's vein most lofty, insolent and passionate. Master Edward Dyer for elegy most sweet, solemn and of high conceit. Gascoigne for a good metre and a plentiful vein. Fair and Golding, for a learned and well-corrected verse, specially in translation clear, and very faithfully answering their author's intent. Others have also written with much facility, but more commendably, perchance, if they had not written so much nor so popularly." The passage concludes with a piece of flattery to Her Majesty in her poetical capacity, unworthy of transcription. Under the head of poetical proportion, or metre, our author writes learnedly of the measures of the ancients, and on those employed by our native poets, with singular taste and judgment, except that the artist-like pride and difficulty overcome, has inspired him with an unwarrantable fondness for verses arranged in eggs, roundrels, lozenges, triquets, and other ingenious figures, of which he has given diagrams further illustrated by finished specimens of his own construction. Great efforts had been made about this period by a literary party, of which Stainhurst, the translator of Virgil, Sidney, and Gabriel Harvey, were the leaders, to introduce the Greek and Roman measures into English verse, and Putnam has judged it necessary to compose a chapter thus entitled, quote, How, if all manner of sudden innovations were not very scandalous, especially in the laws of any language or art, the use of Greek and Latin feet might be brought into our vulgar poesy, and with good grace enough, end quote. But it is evident on the whole that he bore no good will to this pedantic novelty. In treating of ornament, our author enumerates, explains, and exemplifies all the rhetorical figures of the Greeks, adding for the benefit of courtiers and ladies, to whom his work is principally addressed, translations of their names, several of which would require to be retranslated for the benefit of the modern reader, as for example the three following, all figures of derision, the fleering frump, the broad flout, the privy nip. At the present day, however, the work of Putnam is most of all to be valued for the remarks on language and on manners, and the contemporary anecdotes with which it abounds, and of which some examples may be quoted. After observing that, quote, as it hath been always reputed a great fault to use figurative speeches foolishly and indiscreetly, so it is esteemed no less an imperfection in man's utterance to have none use of figure at all, especially in our writing and speeches public, making them but as our ordinary talk, than which nothing can be more unsavoury and far from all civility. I remember, says he, in the first year of Queen Mary's reign, a knight of Yorkshire was chosen Speaker of the Parliament, a good gentleman and wise in the affairs of his shire, and not unlearned in the laws of the realm, but as well for lack of some of his teeth as for want of language, nothing well spoken, which at that time and business was most behoofful for him to have been. This man, after he had made his oration to the Queen, which ye know is of course to be done at the first assembly of both houses, a bencher of the temple, both well learned and very eloquent, returning from the Parliament House, asked another gentleman, his friend, how he liked Mr. Speaker's oration. Mary, quoth the other, methinks I heard not a better alehouse tale told this seven years, and though grave and wise counsellors in their consultations do not use much superfluous eloquence, and also in their judicial hearings do much mislike all scholastical rhetorics, yet in such a case, if the Lord Chancellor of England, or Archbishop of Canterbury himself were to speak, he ought to do it cunningly and eloquently, which cannot be without the use of figures, and nevertheless none impeachment or blemish to the gravity of the persons or of the cause, wherein I report me to them that knew Sir Nicholas Bacon, Lord Keeper of the Great Seal, or the now Lord Treasurer of England, and have been conversant with their speeches made in the Parliament House and Star Chamber. From whose lips I have seen to proceed more grave and natural eloquence than from all the orators of Oxford or Cambridge, but all is as it is handled and maketh no matter whether the same eloquence be natural to them or artificial, though I rather think natural. Yet were they known to be learned, and not unskilful of the art when they were younger men. I have come to the Lord Keeper Sir Nicholas Bacon, and found him sitting in his gallery alone, with the works of Quintilian before him. 
indeed he was a most eloquent man and of rare learning and wisdom as ever i knew england to breed and one that joyed as much in learned men and men of good wits end quote. he mentions being a bystander when a doctor of civil law quote, pleading in a litigious cause betwixt a man and his wife before a great magistrate who as they can tell that knew him was a man very well learned and grave but somewhat sour and of no plausible utterance the gentleman's chance was to say my lord the simple woman is not so much to blame as her lewd abettors who by violent persuasions have led her into this wilfulness quoth the judge what need such eloquent terms in this place the gentleman replied doth your lordship mislike the term violent and methinks i speak it to great purpose for i am sure she would never have done it but by force of persuasion quote, etc pursuing the subject of language which he says quote, in our maker or poet must be heedly looked unto that it be natural pure and the most usual of all his country end quote. after some other rules or cautions he adds quote, our maker therefore at these days shall not follow peers ploughman nor gower nor lydgate nor yet chaucer for their language is now out of use with us neither shall he take the terms of northern men such as they use in daily talk whether they be noblemen or gentlemen or of their best clerks all is a matter nor in effect any speech used beyond the river of trent though no man can deny but theirs is the purer english saxon at this day yet it is not so courtly nor so current as our southern english is no more is the far western man's speech ye shall therefore take the usual speech of the court and that of london and the shires lying about london within sixty miles and not much above i say not this but in every shire of england there be gentlemen and others that speak but specially write as good southern as we of middlesex or surrey do but not the common people of every shire to whom the gentlemen and also their learned clerks do for the most part condescend but herein we are ruled by the english dictionaries and other books written by learned men and therefore it needeth none other direction in that behalf albeit peradventure some small admonition be not impertinent for we find in our english writers many words and speeches amendable and ye shall see in some many inkhorn terms so ill affected brought in by men of learning as preachers and schoolmasters and many strange terms of other languages by secretaries and merchants and travellers and many dark words and not usual nor well sounding though they be daily spoken in court wherefore great heed must be taken by our maker in this point that his choice be good he modestly expresses his apprehensions that in some of these respects he may himself be accounted a transgressor and he subjoins a list of the new foreign or unusual words employed by him in this tract with his reasons for their adoption of this number are scientific conduit quote, a french word but well allowed of us and long since usual it sounds something more than this word leading for it is implied only to the leading of a captain and not as a little boy should lead a blind man idiom from the greek significative quote, borrowed of the latin and french but to us brought in first by some nobleman's secretary as i think yet doth so well serve the turn as it could not now be spared and many more like usurped latin and french words as method methodical placation function asuptiling refining compendious prolix figurative inveigle a term borrowed of our common lawyers impression also a new term but well expressing the matter and more than our english word end quote. penetrate penetrable indignity in the sense of unworthiness and a few more the whole enumeration is curious and strikingly exhibits the state of language at this epoch when the rapid advancement of letters and of all the arts of social life was creating a daily want of new terms which writers in all classes and individuals in every walk of life regarded themselves as authorized to supply at their own discretion in any manner and from any sources most accessible to them whether pure or corrupt ancient or modern the pedants of the universities and the travelled coxcombs of the court had each a neological jargon of their own unintelligible to each other and to the people at large on the other hand there were a few persons of grave professions and austere characters who like cato the censor during a similar period of accelerated progress in the roman state prided themselves on preserving in all its unsophisticated simplicity or primitive rudeness the tongue of their forefathers the judicious putnam uniting the accuracy of scholastic learning with the enlargement of mind acquired by long intercourse among foreign nations and with the polish of a courtier places himself between the contending parties and with a manly disdain of every species of affectation but especially that of rusticity and barbarism avails himself without scruple as without excess 
of the copiousness of other languages to supply the remaining deficiencies of his own. Several chapters of the book of Ornament are devoted to the discussion of the decent, or seemly, in words and actions, and prove the author to have been a nice observer of manners, as well as a refined critic of style. He severely censures a certain translator of Virgil, who said, quote, that Aeneas was fain to trudge out of Troy, which term better became to be spoken of a beggar, or of a rogue, or of a lackey, end quote and another who called the same hero, quote, by fate a fugitive, end quote, and who inquires, quote, what moved Juno to tug so great a captain, end quote, a word, quote, the most indecent in this case that could have been devised, since it is derived from the cart, and signifies the draught or pull of the horses, end quote. The phrase, quote, a prince's pelf, end quote, is reprobated, because pelf means properly, quote, the scraps or shreds of tailors and of skinners, end quote he gives strict rules for the decorous behaviour of ambassadors and all who address themselves to princes being himself a courtier and having probably exercised some diplomatic function quote, i have seen says he foreign ambassadors in the queen's presence laugh so dissolutely at some rare pastime or sport that hath been made there that nothing in the world could have worse become in them End quote. with respect to men in other stations of life he is pleased to say it is decent for a priest quote, to be sober and sad Quote, a judge to be incorrupted, solitary, and unacquainted with courtiers or courtly entertainments, without pleat or wrinkle, sour in look and churlish in speech, contrarywise a courtly gentleman to be lofty and curious in countenance, yet sometimes a creeper and a curry favel with his superiors. Quote, and in a prince it is decent to go slowly and to march with leisure, and with a certain grandity rather than gravity, as our sovereign lady and mistress, the very image of majesty and magnificence, is accustomed to do generally, unless it be when she walketh apace for her pleasure, or to catch her a heat in the cold mornings. Nevertheless it is not so decent in a meaner person, as I have discerned in some counterfeit ladies of the country, which use it much to their own derision. This comeliness was wanting in Queen Mary, otherwise a very good and honourable princess, and was some blemish to the Emperor Ferdinando, a most noble-minded man, yet so careless and forgetful of himself in that behalf, as I have seen him run up a pair of stairs so swift and nimble a pace, as almost had not become a very mean man, who had not gone in some hasty business. End quote. Respecting the poets mentioned by Putnam, whose names have not already occurred in the present work, it may be observed that excepting a few lines quoted by this critic, there is nothing remaining of Sir Edward Dyer's, except, which is highly probable, he is to be reckoned among the anonymous contributors to the popular collections of that day. Of Gascoigne, on the contrary, enough is left to exhaust the patience of any modern reader. In his youth, neglecting the study of the law for poetry and pleasure, he poured forth an abundance of amatory pieces, some of them sonnets closely imitating the Italian ones in style as well as structure. Afterwards, during a five years' service in the War of Flanders, he found pleasure for much serious thought, and discarding the levities of his early years, he composed by way of expiation a moral satire in blank verse called The Steel Glass, and several religious pieces. Notwithstanding, however, this newly assumed seriousness, he attended Her Majesty in her progress in the summer of 1575, and composed a large number of courtly verses as a contribution to, quote, the princely pleasures of Kenilworth, end quote. Gascoigne died in October 1577. Of his minor poems, the following may be cited as a pleasing specimen. The Lullaby of a Lover quote, Sing lullaby as women do, wherewith they bring their babes to rest, and lullaby can I sing too, as womanly as can the best. With lullaby they still the child, and if I be not much beguiled, full many wanton babes have I, which must be stilled with lullaby. First lullaby my youthful years, it is now time to go to bed, for crooked age and hoary years have won the haven within my head. With lullaby then youth be still, with lullaby content thy will, since courage quails and comes behind, go sleep and so beguile thy mind. Next lullaby my gazing eyes, which wanted were to glance apace, for every glass may now suffice to show the furrows in my face. With lullaby then wink a while, with lullaby your looks beguile, let no fair face or beauty bright entice you eft with vain delight. And lullaby my wanton will, let reason's rule now reign thy thought, since all too late I find by skill how dear I have thy fancies bought. With lullaby thy doubts appease, for trust to this, if thou be still, my body shall obey thy will. Thus lullaby my youth, mine eyes, my will, my wear, and all that was, 
I can no more delays devise, but welcome pain, let pleasure pass, with lullaby now take your leave, with lullaby your dreams deceive, and when you rise with waking eye, remember then this lullaby. End quote. Respecting another poet of greater popularity than Gascoigne, and of a more original turn of genius, Warner, the author of Albion's England, Putnam has preserved a discreet silence for his great work had been prohibited by the capricious tyranny or rigid decorum of archbishop whitgift and seizure made in fifteen eighty six of the copy surreptitiously printed this long and singular poem is a kind of metrical chronicle containing the remarkable events of english history from the flood the starting-point of all chroniclers to the reign of queen elizabeth it is written in the common ballad measure and in a style often creeping and prosaic sometimes quaint and affected but passages of beautiful simplicity and strokes of genuine pathos frequently occur to redeem its faults, and the tediousness of the historical narration is relieved by a large intermixture of interesting and entertaining episodes. The ballads of Queen Eleanor and Fair Rosamond, Argentile and Curan, and the Patient Countess, selected by Dr. Percy in his Relics of Ancient Poetry, may be regarded by the poetical student of the present day as a sufficient specimen of the talents of Warner but in his own time he was complimented as the Homer or Virgil of the age. The persevering reader travelled, not only with patience but delight, through his seventy-seven long chapters, and it is said that the work became popular enough, notwithstanding its prohibition by authority, to supersede in some degree its celebrated predecessor, the Mirror for Magistrates. End of section 38《セクション39オブ・メモアーズ・オブ・ザ・コート・オブ・クイーン・エリザベス》。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Memoirs of the Court of Queen Elizabeth, Volumes 1 and 2 by Lucy Aiken. Chapter 23, 1591 to 1593. The maritime war with Spain, notwithstanding the cautious temper of the Queen, was strenuously waged during the year 1591, and produced some striking indications of the rising spirit of the English navy. A squadron under Lord Thomas Howard, which had been waiting six months at the Azores to intercept the homeward-bound ships from Spanish America, was there surprised by a vastly more numerous fleet of the enemy which had been sent out for their convoy. The English admiral got to sea in all haste and made good his retreat, followed by his whole squadron, excepting the Revenge, which was entangled in a narrow channel between the port and an island. Sir Richard Grenville, her commander, after a vain attempt to break through the Spanish line, determined, with a kind of heroic desperation, to sustain alone the conflict with a whole fleet of fifty-seven sail, and to confront all extremities rather than strike his colours. From three o'clock in the afternoon till daybreak he resisted, by almost incredible efforts of valour, all the force which could be brought to bear against him, and fifteen times beat back the boarding parties from his deck. At length, when all his bravest had fallen, and he himself was disabled by many wounds, his powder also being exhausted, his small arms lost or broken, and his ship a perfect wreck, he proposed to his gallant crew to sink her, that no trophy might remain to the enemy. But this proposal, though applauded by several, was overruled by the majority. The revenge struck to the Spaniards, and two days after, her brave commander died on board their admiral's ship, of his glorious wounds, quote, with a joyful and quiet mind, end quote, as he expressed himself, and admired by his enemies themselves for his high spirit and invincible resolution. This was the first English ship of any considerable size captured by the Spaniards during the whole war, and it did them little good, for besides that the vessel had been shattered to pieces, and sunk a few days after with two hundred Spanish sailors on board, the example of heroic self-devotion set by Sir Richard Grenville long continued in the hour of battle to strike awe and terror to their hearts. Thomas Cavendish, elated by the splendid success of that first expedition in which, with three slender barks of insignificant size, carrying only one hundred and twenty-three persons of every degree, he had plundered the whole coast of New Spain and Peru, burned Paita and Acapulco, and captured a Spanish admiral of seven hundred tons, besides many other vessels taken or burned, then crossed the great South Sea, and circumnavigated the globe in the shortest time in which that exploit had yet been performed, set sail again in August 1591 on a second voyage. But by this time, when his far greater force and more adequate preparations of every kind seemed to promise results still more profitable and glorious, scarce anything but disasters awaited him. He took, indeed, the town of Santos in Brazil, 
which was an acquisition of some importance but delaying here too long he arrived at a wrong season in the straits of magellan and was compelled to endure the winter of that inhospitable clime where seeing his numbers thinned by sickness and hardship and his plans baffled by dissensions and insubordination he found it necessary to abandon his original design of crossing the south sea and resolved to undertake the voyage to china by the cape of good hope first however he was fatally prevailed upon to return to the coast of brazil where he lost many men in rash attempts against various towns which expecting his attacks were now armed for their defence and a still greater number by desertion baffled in all his designs worn out with fatigue anxieties and chagrin this brave but unfortunate adventurer breathed his last far from england on the wide ocean and so obscurely that even the date of his death is unknown at this period a peculiar education was regarded as not more necessary to enable a gentleman to assume the direction of a naval expedition than the command of a troop of horse and it is probable that even by cavendish whose exploits we read with amazement but a very slender stock of maritime experience was possessed when he first embarked on board the vessel in which he had undertaken to circumnavigate the globe he was the third son of a suffolk gentleman of large estate came early to court and having there consumed his patrimony in the fashionable magnificence of the time suddenly discovered within himself sufficient courage to attempt the reparation of his broken fortunes by that favourite resource the plunder of the spanish settlements on his return from his first voyage he sailed up the thames in a kind of triumph displaying a topsail of cloth of gold and making ostentation of the profit rather than the glory of the enterprise he appears to have been equally deficient in the enlightened prudence which makes an essential feature of the great commander and in that lofty disinterestedness of motive which constitutes the hero but in the activity the enterprise the brilliant valour which now form the spirit of the english navy he had few equals and especially few predecessors and amongst the founders of its glory the name of cavendish is therefore worthy of a conspicuous and enduring place by the failure of the late attempt to seat don antonio on the throne of portugal the sovereignty of philip the second over that country and its dependencies had finally been established and in consequence its trade and settlements in the east offered a fair and tempting prize to the ambition or cupidity of english adventurers the passage by the cape of good hope repeatedly accomplished by circumnavigators of this nation had now ceased to oppose any formidable obstacle to the spirit of maritime enterprise and the papal donation was a bulwark still less capable of preserving inviolate to the sovereigns of portugal their own rich indies the first expedition ever fitted out from england for those eastern regions where it now possesses an extent of territory in comparison of which itself is but a petty province consisted of three tall ships which sailed in this year under the conduct of george raymond and james lancaster after doubling the cape and refreshing themselves in saldana bay which the portuguese had named but not yet settled the navigators steered along the eastern coast of africa where the ship commanded by raymond was lost with the other two however they proceeded still eastward passed without impediment all the stations of the portuguese on the shores of the indian ocean doubled cape Comorin, and extended their voyage to the nicobar isles and even to the peninsula of malacca they landed in several parts where they found means to open an advantageous traffic with the natives and after capturing many portuguese vessels laden with various kinds of merchandise repassed the cape in perfect safety with all their booty in their way home they visited the west indies where great disasters overtook them for here their two remaining ships were lost and lancaster with the slender remnant of their crews was glad to obtain a passage to europe on board a french ship which happily arrived to their relief but as far as respected the eastern part of the expedition their success had been such as strongly to invite the attempts of future adventurers and nine years after its sailing her majesty was prevailed upon to grant a charter of incorporation with ample privileges to an east india company under whose auspices lancaster consented to undertake a second voyage annual fleets were from this period fitted out by these enterprising traders and factories of their establishment soon arose in surat in masulipatam in bantam in siam and even in japan the history of their progress makes no part of the subject of the present work but the foundation of a mercantile company which has advanced itself to power and importance absolutely unparalleled in the annals of the world forms a feature not to be overlooked in the glory of elizabeth these long and hazardous voyages of discovery of hostility or of commerce began henceforth to afford one of the most honourable occupations to those among the youthful nobility or gentry of the country whose active spirits disdained the luxurious and servile idleness of the court 
they also opened a welcome resource to younger sons and younger brothers impatient to emancipate themselves from the galling miseries of that necessitous dependence on the head of their house to which the customs of the age and country relentlessly condemned them thus shakespeare in his two gentlemen of verona quote, he wondered that your lordship would suffer him to spend his youth at home while other men of slender reputation put forth their sons to seek preferment out some to the wars to try their fortune there some to discover islands far away some to the studious universities for any or for all these exercises he said that protheus your son was meet and did request me to importune you to let him spend his time no more at home which would be great impeachment to his age in having known no travel in his youth but the advancement of the fortunes of individuals was by no means the principal or most permanent good which accrued to the nation by these enterprises the period was still indeed far distant in which voyages of discovery were to be undertaken on scientific principles and with large views of general utility but new animals new vegetables natural productions or manufactured articles before unknown to them attracted the attention even of these first unskilful explorers specimens in every kind were brought home and recommended as they never failed to be by fabulous or grossly exaggerated descriptions in the first instance only served to gratify and inflame the vulgar passion for wonders but the attention excited to these striking novelties gradually became enlightened a more familiar acquaintance disclosed their genuine properties and the purposes to which they might be applied at home raleigh introduced the potato on his irish estates an acceptable however inelegant luxury was discovered in the use of tobacco and somewhat later the introduction of tea gradually brought sobriety and refinement into the system of modern english manners many allusions to the prevailing passion for beholding foreign or as they were then accounted monstrous animals may be found scattered over the works of shakespeare and contemporary dramatists trinculo says speaking of caliban quote, were i but in england now and had but this fish painted not a holiday fool there but would give a piece of silver there would this monster make a man any strange beast there makes a man when they will not give a doit to relieve a lame beggar, they will lay out ten to see a dead Indian. End quote. And again, quote, do you put tricks upon us with savages and men of Ind? End quote, etc. The whole play of the Tempest, exquisite as it is, must have derived a still more poignant relish to the taste of that age from the romantic ideas of desert islands then floating in the imaginations of men. In the following year, fifteen ninety two, Raleigh, weary of his Irish exile, and anxious by some splendid exploit to revive the declining favour of the queen projected a formidable attack on the spanish power in america and engaged without difficulty in the enterprise a large number of volunteers but unavoidable obstacles arose by which the fleet was detained till the proper season for its sailing was passed elizabeth recalled raleigh to court and the only fortunate result of the expedition to the command of which martin frobisher succeeded was the capture of one wealthy carrick and the destruction of another Raleigh, in the meantime, was amusing his involuntary idleness by an intrigue with one of Her Majesty's maids of honour, a daughter of the celebrated Sir Nicholas Throgmorton. The Queen, in the heat of her indignation at the scandal brought upon her court by the consequences of this amour, resorted, as in a thousand other cases, to a vigour beyond the laws. And though Sir Walter offered immediately to make the lady the best reparation in his power by marrying her, which he afterwards performed, Elizabeth unfeelingly published her shame to the whole world by sending both culprits to the tower. Sir Walter remained a prisoner during several months. Meanwhile his ships returned from their cruise, and the profits from the sale of the captured Carrick were to be divided among the Queen, the Admiral, the sailors, and the several contributors to the outfit. Disputes arose, Her Majesty was dissatisfied with the share allotted her, and taking advantage of the situation into which her own despotic violence had thrown Raleigh, she appears to have compelled him to buy his liberty, and the undisturbed enjoyment of all that he held under her, by the sacrifice of no less than eighty thousand pounds due to him as admiral. Such was the disinterested purity of that zeal for morals, of which Elizabeth judged it incumbent on her to make profession. It may be curious to learn, from another incident which occurred about the same time, at what rate Her Majesty caused her forgiveness of lawful matrimony to be purchased. Robert Carey, third son of Lord Hunsdon, created Lord Leppington by James I and Earl of Monmouth by his successor, from whose memoirs of himself the following particulars are derived, was at this time a young man and an assiduous attendant on the court of his illustrious kinswoman. Being a younger son, he had no patrimony either in possession or reversion. 
he received from the exchequer only one hundred pounds per annum during pleasure, and by the style of life which he found it necessary to support, had incurred a debt of a thousand pounds. In this situation he married a widow possessed of five hundred pounds per annum, and some ready money. His father evinced no displeasure on the occasion, but his other friends, and especially the Queen, were so much offended at the match that he took his wife to Carlisle, and remained there without approaching the court till the next year. Being then obliged to visit London on business, his father suggested the expediency of his paying the Queen the compliment of appearing on her day. Accordingly, he secretly prepared caparisons and a present for Her Majesty, at a cost of more than four hundred pounds, and presented himself in the tilt-yard in the character of, quote, a forsaken knight who had vowed solitariness. End quote. The festival over, he made himself known to his friends in court, but the queen, though she had received his gift, would not take notice of his presence. It happened soon after that the king of Scots sent to Carey's elder brother, then Marshal of Berwick, to beg that he would wait upon him to receive a secret message which he wanted to transmit to the queen. The marshal wrote to his father to inquire her majesty's pleasure in the matter. She did not choose that he should stir out of Berwick, but, quote, knowing, though she would not know it, end quote, that Robert Carey was in court, she said at length to Lord Hunsdon, quote, I hear your fine son that is married lately so worthily is hereabouts. Send him, if you will, to know the king's pleasure. End quote. His lordship answered that he knew he would be happy to obey her commands. Quote, no, said she, do you bid him go, for I have nothing to do with him. End quote. Robert Carey thought it hard to be sent off without first seeing the queen. Quote, sir, said he to his father, who urged his going, if she be on such hard terms with me, I had need be wary what I do. If I go to the king without her license, it were in her power to hang me at my return, and that, for anything I see, it were ill-trusting her. End quote. Lord Hunsdon merrily told the queen what he said. Quote, if the gentleman be so distrustful, she answered, let the secretary make a safe conduct to go and come, and I will sign it. End quote. On his return with letters from James, Robert Carey hastened to court, and entered the presence-chamber, splashed and dirty as he was. But not finding the Queen there, Lord Hunsdon went to her to announce his son's arrival. She desired him to receive the letter, or message, and bring it to her. But the young gentleman knew the court and the Queen too well to consent to give up his dispatches even to his father. He insisted on delivering them himself, and at length, with much difficulty, gained admission. The first encounter was, as he expresses it, quote, stormy and terrible, end quote, which he passed over with silence. But when the queen had, quote, said her pleasure, end quote, of himself and his wife, he made her a courtly excuse, with which she was so well appeased, that she at length assured him all was forgiven and forgotten, and received him into her wonted favour. After this happy conclusion of an adventure so perilous to a courtier of Elizabeth, Carey returned to Carlisle and thus his father's death soon occurring, he had orders to take upon himself the government of Berwick till further orders. In this situation he remained a year without salary, impairing much his small estate, and unable to obtain from court either an allowance or leave of absence to enable him to solicit one in person. At length, necessity rendering him bold, he resolved to hazard the step of going up without permission. On his arrival, however, neither Secretary Cecil nor even his own brother would venture to introduce him to the Queen's presence, but advised him to hasten back before his absence should be known, for fear of her anger. At last, as he stood sorrowfully pondering on his case, a gentleman of the chamber, touched with pity, undertook to mention his arrival to Her Majesty in a way which should not displease her, and he opened the case by telling her that she was more beholden to the love and service of one man than of many whom she favoured more. This excited her curiosity, and on her asking who this person might be, he answered that it was Robert Carey, who, unable longer to bear his absence from her sight, had posted up to kiss her hand and instantly return. She sent for him directly, received him with greater favour than ever, allowed him after the interview to lead her out by the hand, which seemed to his brother and the secretary nothing less than a miracle, and what was more granted him five hundred pounds immediately, a patent of the wardenry of the East Marches and a renewal of his grant of Norham Castle. It was this able courtier, rather than grateful kinsman, who earned the good graces of King James by being the first to bring him the welcome tidings of the decease of Elizabeth. Incidental mention has already been made of Sir William Holes of Houghton in Nottinghamshire, the gentleman who refused to marry his daughter to the Earl of Cumberland, because he did not choose, quote, to stand cap in hand, end quote, to his son-in-law. This worthy knight died at a great age in the year 1590 
and a few further particulars respecting him and his descendants may deserve record on account of the strong light which they reflect on several points of manners sir william was distinguished perhaps beyond any other person of the same rank in the kingdom for boundless hospitality and a magnificent style of living Quote, he began his christmas says the historian of the family at all hallowtide and continued it until candlemas during which any man was permitted to stay three days without being asked whence he came or what he was end quote. For each of the twelve days of Christmas he allowed a fat ox and other provisions in proportion. He would never dine till after one o'clock, and being asked why he preferred so unusually late an hour, he answered that, quote, for aught he knew there might be a friend come twenty miles to dine with him, and he would be loath he should lose his labour. At the coronation of Edward the Sixth he appeared with fifty followers in blue coats and badges, then the ordinary costume of retainers and serving men, and he never went to the sessions at Retford though only four miles from his own mansion, without thirty quote-unquote proper fellows at his heels. What was then rare among the greatest subjects, he kept a company of actors of his own to perform plays and masks at festival times. In summer they travelled about the country. This Sir William was succeeded in his estates by Sir John Holes, his grandson, who was one of the band of gentlemen pensioners to Elizabeth, and in the reign of James I purchased the title of Earl of Clare. His grandfather had engaged his hand to a kinswoman of the Earl of Shrewsbury, but the young man declining to complete this contract, and taking to wife a daughter of Sir Thomas Stanhope, the consequence was a long and inveterate feud between the houses of Holes and of Talbot, which was productive of several remarkable incidents. Its first effect was a duel between Orme, a servant of Holes, and Pudsey, master of horse to the Earl of Shrewsbury, in which the latter was slain. The Earl prosecuted Orme, and sought to take away his life but Sir John Holes, in the first instance, caused him to be conveyed away to Ireland, and afterwards obtained his pardon of the Queen. For his conduct in this business he was himself challenged by Gervase Markham, champion and gallant to the Countess of Shrewsbury, but he refused the duel because the unreasonable demand of Markham, that it should take place in a park belonging to the Earl his enemy, gave him just ground to apprehend that some treachery was meditated. Anxious, however, to wipe away the aspersions which his adversary had taken occasion to cast upon his courage, he sought a re-encounter which might wear the appearance of accident, and soon after, having met Markham on the road, they immediately dismounted and attacked each other with their rapiers. Markham fell, severely wounded, and the Earl of Shrewsbury lost no time in raising his servants and tenantry to the number of one hundred and twenty in order to apprehend holes in case Markham's hurt should prove mortal. On the other side, Lord Sheffield, the kinsman of Holes, joined him with sixty men. Quote, I hear, cousin, said he on his arrival, that my lord of Shrewsbury is prepared to trouble you, but take my word, before he carry you it shall cost many a broken pate. End quote. And he and his company remained at Houghton till the wounded man was out of danger. Markham had vowed never to eat supper or take the sacrament till he was revenged, and in consequence found himself obliged to abstain from both to the day of his death. What appears the most extraordinary part of the story is, that we do not find the Queen in Council interfering to put a stop to this private war, worthy of the barbarism of the feudal ages. Gervase Markham, who was the portionless younger son of a Nottinghamshire gentleman of ancient family, became the most voluminous miscellaneous writer of his age, using his pen apparently as his chief means of subsistence. He wrote on a vast variety of subjects, and both in verse and prose but his works on farriery and husbandry appear to have been the most useful, and those on field sports the most entertaining, of his performances. The progress of the drama is a subject which claims in this place some share of our attention, partly because it excited in a variety of ways that of Elizabeth herself. By the appearance of Ferrex and Porrex in 1561, and that of Gammer Girton's Needle five years later, a new impulse had been given to English genius, and both tragedies and comedies approaching the regular models besides historical and pastoral dramas, allegorical pieces resembling the old moralities, and translations from the ancients, were from this time produced in abundance, and received by all classes with avidity and delight. About twenty dramatic poets flourished between 1561 and 1590, and an inspection of the titles alone of their numerous productions would furnish evidence of an acquaintance with the stores of history, mythology, classical fiction, and romance strikingly illustrative of the literary diligence and intellectual activity of the age. Richard Edwards produced a tragicomedy on the affecting ancient story of Damon and Pythias, besides his comedy of Palamon and Arcite, formerly noticed as having been performed for the entertainment of Her Majesty at Oxford. 
in connection with this latter piece it may be remarked that of the chivalrous idea of theseus in this celebrated tale and in the midsummer night's dream as well as of all the other gothicized representations of ancient heroes of which shakespeare's troilus and cressida his rape of lucrece and some passages of spenser's fairy queen afford further examples guido colonna's historia trojana written in twelve sixty was the original a work long and widely popular which had been translated paraphrased and imitated in french and english and which the barbarism of its incongruities however palpable had not as yet consigned to oblivion or contempt george gascoigne besides his tragedy from euripides translated also a comedy from ariosto performed by the students of gray's inn under the title of the supposes which was the first specimen in our language of a drama in prose italian literature was at this period cultivated amongst us with an assiduity unequalled either before or since and it possessed few authors of merit or celebrity whose works were not speedily familiarized to the english public through the medium of translations the study of this enchanting language found however a vehement opponent in roger ascham who exclaims against the quote, enchantments of circe brought out of italy to mar men's manners in england much by examples of ill life but more by precepts of fond books of late translated out of italian into english and sold in every shop in london end quote. he afterwards declares that quote, there be more of these ungracious books set out in print within these few months than have been seen in england many years before end quote. to these strictures on the moral tendencies of the popular writers of italy some force must be allowed but it is obvious to remark that similar objections might be urged with at least equal cogency against the favourite classics of ascham and that the use of so valuable an instrument of intellectual advancement as the free introduction of the literature of a highly polished nation into one comparatively rude is not to be denied to beings capable of moral discrimination from the apprehension of such partial and incidental injury as may arise out of its abuse italy in fact was at once the plenteous storehouse whence the english poets dramatists and romance writers of the latter half of the sixteenth century drew their most precious materials the school where they acquired taste and skill to adapt them to their various purposes and the parnassian mount on which they caught the purest inspirations of the muse elizabeth was a zealous patroness of these studies she spoke the italian language with fluency and elegance and used it frequently in her mottoes and devices by her encouragement as we shall see harrington was urged to complete his version of the orlando furioso and she willingly accepted in the year sixteen hundred the dedication of fairfax's admirable translation of the great epic of tasso but to return to our dramatic writers thomas kidd was the author of a tragedy entitled geronimo which for the absurd horrors of its plot and the mingled puerility and bombast of its language was a source of perpetual ridicule to rival poets while from a certain wild pathos combined with its imposing grandiloquence it was long a favourite with the people the same person also translated a play by garnier on the story of cornelia the wife of pompey a solitary instance apparently of obligation to the french theatre on the part of these founders of our national drama by thomas hughes the misfortunes of arthur son of uther pendragon were made the subject of a tragedy performed before the queen preston to whom when a youth her majesty had granted a pension of a shilling a day in consideration of his excellent acting in the play of palamon and arcite composed on the story of cambyses king of persia quote, a lamentable tragedy mixed full of pleasant mirth end quote, which is now only remembered as having been an object of ridicule to shakespeare lily the author of euphues composed six court comedies and other pieces principally on classical subjects but disfigured by all the barbarous affectations of style which had marked his earlier production christopher marlowe unquestionably a man of genius however deficient in taste and judgment astonished the world with his tamburlaine the great which became in a manner proverbial for its rant and extravagance he also composed but in a purer style and with a pathetic cast of sentiment a drama on the subject of king edward the second and ministered fuel to the ferocious prejudices of the age by his fiend-like portraiture of barabbas in the rich jew of malta marlowe was also the author of a tragedy in which the sublime and the grotesque were extraordinarily mingled on the noted story of dr faustus a tale of preternatural horrors which after the lapse of two centuries was again to receive a similar distinction from the pen of one of the most celebrated of german dramatists not the only example which could be produced of a coincidence of taste between the early tragedians of the two countries of the works of these and other contemporary poets the fathers of the english theatre some are extant in print others have come down to us in manuscript 
and of no inconsiderable portion the titles alone survive. A few have acquired an incidental value in the eyes of the curious, as having furnished the groundwork of some of the dramas of our great poet, but not one of the number can justly be said to make a part of the living literature of the country. It was reserved for the transcendent genius of Shakespeare alone, in that infancy of our theatre when nothing proceeded from the crowd of rival dramatists, but rude and abortive efforts, ridiculed by the learned and judicious of their own age, and forgotten by posterity, to astonish and enchant the nation with those inimitable works which form the perpetual boast and immortal heritage of Englishmen. By a strange kind of fatality, which excites at once our surprise and our unavailing regrets, the domestic and the literary history of this great luminary of his age are almost equally enveloped in doubt and obscurity. Even of the few particulars of his origin and early adventures which have reached us through various channels, the greater number are either imperfectly attested or exposed to objections of different kinds which render them of little value. And respecting his theatrical life, the most important circumstances still remain matter of conjecture, or at best of remote inference. When Shakespeare first became a writer for the stage, what was his earliest production, whether all the pieces usually ascribed to him be really his, and whether there be any others of which he was in whole or in part the author, what degree of assistance he either received from other dramatic writers or lent to them, in what chronological order his acknowledged pieces ought to be arranged, and what date should be assigned to their first representation, are all questions on which the ingenuity and indefatigable diligence of a crowd of editors, critics and biographers have long been exerted, without producing any considerable approximation to certainty or to general agreement. On a subject so intricate, it will suffice for the purposes of the present work to state a few of the leading facts which appear to rest on the most satisfactory authorities. William Shakespeare, who was born in 1564, settled in London about 1586 or 1587, and seems to have almost immediately adopted the profession of an actor. Yet his earliest effort in composition was not of the dramatic kind, for in 1593 he dedicated to his great patron the Earl of Southampton as, quote, the first heir of his invention, end quote, his Venus and Adonis, a narrative poem of considerable length in the six-line stanza, then popular. In the subsequent year he also inscribed to the same noble friend his Rape of Lucrece, a still longer poem of similar form in the stanza of seven lines, and containing passages of vivid description, of exquisite imagery, and of sentimental excellence, which, had he written nothing more, would have entitled him to rank on a level with the author of the Fairy Queen, and far above all other contemporary poets. He likewise employed his pen occasionally in the composition of sonnets, principally devoted to love and friendship, and written perhaps in emulation of those of Spencer, who, as one of these sonnets testifies, was at this period the object of his ardent admiration. Before the publication, however, of any of these poems, he must already have attained considerable note as a dramatic writer, since Robert Greene, in a satirical piece printed in 1592, speaking of theatrical concerns, stigmatizes this player as, quote, an absolute Joannes factotum, end quote, and one who was, quote, in his own conceit the only shake scene in a country, end quote. The tragedy of Pericles, which was published in 1609 with the name of Shakespeare in the title page, and of which Dryden says in one of his prologues to a first play, quote, Shakespeare's own muse his Pericles first bore, end quote, was probably acted in 1590, and appears to have been long popular. Romeo and Juliet was certainly an early production of his muse, and one which excited much interest, as may well be imagined, amongst the younger portion of theatrical spectators. There is high satisfaction in observing that the age showed itself worthy of the immortal genius whom it had produced and fostered. It is agreed on all hands that Shakespeare was beloved as a man, and admired and patronized as a poet. In the profession of an actor, indeed, his success does not appear to have been conspicuous, but the never-failing attraction of his pieces brought overflowing audiences to the Globe Theatre in Southwark, of which he was enabled to become a joint proprietor. Lord Southampton is said to have once bestowed on him a munificent donation of a thousand pounds to enable him to complete a purchase and it is probable that this nobleman might also introduce him to the notice of his beloved friend, the Earl of Essex. Of any particular gratuities bestowed on him by Her Majesty we are not informed, but there is every reason to suppose that he must have received from her on various occasions both praises and remuneration, for we are told that she caused several of his pieces to be represented before her, and that the Merry Wives of Windsor, in particular, owed its origin to her desire of seeing Falstaff exhibited in love. It remains to notice the principal legal enactments of Elizabeth respecting the conduct of the theatre, some of which are remarkable. 
during the early part of her reign sunday being still regarded principally in the light of a holiday her majesty not only selected that day more frequently than any other for the representation of plays at court for her own amusement but by her license granted to burbage in fifteen seventy four authorized the performance of them at the public theatre on sundays only out of the hours of prayer five years after however gosson in his school of abuse complains that the players quote, because they are allowed to play every sunday make four or five sundays at least every week end quote. to limit this abuse an order was issued by the privy council in july fifteen ninety one purporting that no play should be publicly exhibited on thursdays because on that day bear baiting and similar pastimes had usually been practised and in an injunction to the lord mayor four days after the representation of plays on sunday or the sabbath as it now began to be called among the stricter sort of people was utterly condemned and it was further complained that on quote, all other days of the week in diverse places the players do use to recite their plays to the great hurt and destruction of the game of bear baiting and like pastimes which are maintained for her majesty's pleasure end quote. in the year fifteen eighty nine her majesty thought proper to appoint commissioners to inspect all performances of writers for the stage with full powers to reject and obliterate whatever they might esteem unmannerly licentious or irreverent a regulation which might seem to claim the applause of every friend to public decency were not the state in which the dramas of this age have come down to posterity sufficient evidence that to render these impressive appeals to the passions of assembled multitudes politically and not morally offensive was the genuine or principal motive of this act of power in illustration of this remark the following passage may be quoted quote, at supper end quote, the queen quote, would divert herself with her friends and attendants she would put them upon mirth and pleasant discourse with great civility. She would then admit Tarleton, a famous comedian and pleasant talker, and other such men, to divert her with stories of the town, and the common jests and accidents. Tarleton, who was then the best comedian in England, had made a pleasant play, and when it was acting before the Queen, he pointed at Raleigh, and said, See the knave commands the Queen, for which he was corrected by a frown from the Queen, yet he had the confidence to add that he was of too much and too intolerable a power and going on with the same liberty he reflected on the too great power of the earl of leicester which was so universally applauded by all present that she thought fit to bear these reflections with a seeming unconcernedness but yet she was so offended that she forbade tarleton and all jesters from coming near her table End quote. End of section thirty nine Section forty of Memoirs of the Court of Queen Elizabeth. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Memoirs of the Court of Queen Elizabeth, Volumes one and two, by Lucy Aiken. Chapter twenty four, fifteen ninety three to fifteen ninety seven, Part one. Notwithstanding all the frugal acts of Elizabeth, the state of her finances compelled her in the spring of fifteen ninety three to summon a Parliament. It was four entire years since this assembly had last met but her majesty took care to let the commons know that the causes of offence which had then occurred were still fresh in her memory and that her resolution to preserve her own prerogative in its rigour and the ecclesiastical commission in all its terrors was still inflexible it even appeared that an apprehension lest her present necessities might embolden the parliament to treat her despotic mandates with a deference less profound than formerly irritated her temper and prompted her to assume a more haughty and menacing style than her habitual study of popularity had hitherto permitted her to employ in answer to the three customary requests made by the speaker for liberty of speech freedom from arrests and access to her person she replied by her lord keeper that such liberty of speech as the commons were justly entitled to liberty namely of i and no she was willing to grant but by no means a liberty for every one to speak what he listed and if any idle head should be found careless enough of their own safety to attempt innovations in the state or reforms in the church she laid her injunctions on the speaker to refuse the bills offered for such purposes till they should have been examined by those who were better qualified to judge of these matters she promised that she would not impeach the liberty of their persons provided they did not permit themselves to imagine that any neglect of duty would be allowed to pass unpunished under shelter of this privilege and she engaged not to deny them access to her person on weighty affairs and at convenient seasons when she should have leisure from other important business of state but threats alone were not found sufficient to restrain all attempts on the part of the commons to exercise their known rights and fulfil their duty to the country peter wentworth a member whose courageous and independent spirit had already drawn upon him repeated manifestations of royal displeasure 
presented to the Lord Keeper a petition, praying that the upper house would join with the lower in a supplication to the Queen for fixing the succession. Elizabeth, enraged at the bare mention of a subject so offensive to her, instantly committed to the fleet prison Wentworth, Sir Thomas Bromley, who had seconded him, and two other members to whom he had imparted the business, and when the House was preparing to petition her for their release, some privy councillors dissuaded the step as one which could only prove injurious to these gentlemen by providing additional offence to Her Majesty. Soon after, James Morris, an eminent lawyer, who was attorney of the Court of Wards and Chancellor of the Duchy, made a motion for redress of the abuses in the bishops' courts, and especially of the monstrous ones committed under the High Commission. Several members supported the motion, but the Queen, sending in wrath for the Speaker, required him to deliver up to her the bill, reminded him of her strict injunctions at the opening of the sessions, and testified her extreme indignation and surprise at the boldness of the Commons in intermeddling with subjects which she had expressly forbidden them to discuss. She informed him that it lay in her power to summon Parliaments and to dismiss them, and to sanction or to reject any determination of theirs, that she had at present called them together for the twofold purpose of enacting further laws for the maintenance of religious conformity, and of providing for the national defence against Spain, and that these ought therefore to be the objects of their deliberations. As for Morris, he was seized by a sergeant-at-arms in the house itself, stripped of his offices, rendered incapable of practising as a lawyer, and committed to prison, whence he soon after addressed to Burley the following high-minded appeal. Quote, right honourable my very good lord that i am no more hardly handled i impute next unto god to your honourable good will and favour for although i am assured that the cause i took in hand is good and honest yet i believe that besides your lordship and that honourable person your son i have never an honourable friend but no matter for the best causes seldom find the most friends especially having many and those mighty enemies i see no cause in my conscience to repent me of that i have done nor to be dismayed although grieved by this my restraint of liberty, for I stand for the maintenance of the honour of God and of my prince, and for the preservation of public justice and the liberties of my country against wrong and oppression, being well content at Her Majesty's good pleasure and commandment, whom I beseech God long to preserve in all princely felicity, to suffer and abide much more. But I had thought that the judges ecclesiastical, being charged in the great council of the realm to be dishonourers of God and of Her Majesty, perverters of law and public justice, and wrongdoers under the liberties and freedoms of all Her Majesty's subjects, by their extorted oaths, wrongful imprisonments, lawless subscription, and unjust absolutions, would rather have sought means to be cleared of this weighty accusation than to shroud themselves under the suppressing of the complaint and shadow of mine imprisonment. There was found fault with me that I, as a private person, preferred not my complaint to Her Majesty. Surely, my lord, your wisdom can conceive what a proper piece of work I had then made of that, the worst prison had been, I think, too good for me, since now, sustaining the person of a public councillor of the realm, speaking for Her Majesty's prerogatives, which by oath I am bound to assist and maintain, I cannot escape displeasure and restraint of liberty. Another fault or error is objected, in that I preferred these causes before the matters delivered from Her Majesty were determined. My good Lord, to have stayed so long, I verily think, had been to come too late. Bills of a size of bread, shipping of fish, pleadings, and such like, may be offered and received into the house, and no offence to Her Majesty's royal commandment, being but as the tithing of mint. But the great causes of the law and public justice may not be touched without offence. Well, good my lord, be it so. Yet I hope Her Majesty and you of her honourable privy council will at length thoroughly consider of these things, lest, as heretofore we prayed, from the tyranny of the Bishop of Rome, good lord deliver us, we be compelled to say, from the tyranny of the clergy of England, good lord deliver us. Pardon my plain speech, I humbly beseech your honour, for it proceedeth from an upright heart and sound conscience, although in a weak and sickly body. And by God's grace, while life doth last, which I hope now, after so many cracks and crazes, will not be long, I will not be ashamed in good and lawful sort to strive for the freedom of conscience, public justice, and the liberty of my country. And you, my good Lord, to whose hand the stern of this commonwealth is chiefly committed, I humbly beseech, as I doubt not but you do, graciously respect both me and the causes I have preferred, and be a mean to pacify and appease Her Majesty's displeasure conceived against me, her poor yet faithful servant and subject, end quote, etc. In October following, the Earl of Essex ventured to mention to Her Majesty this persecuted patriot amongst lawyers qualified for the post of Attorney General, when, quote, Her Majesty acknowledged his gifts, but said his speaking against her in such manner as he had done should be a bar against any preferment at her hands, end quote. He is said to have been kept for some years a prisoner in Tilbury Castle, 
and whether he ever recovered his liberty may seem doubtful, since he died in February 1596, aged forty-eight. The House of Commons, unacquainted as yet with its own strength, submitted without further question to regard as law the will of an imperious mistress, and passed with little opposition, quote, an act to retain Her Majesty's subjects in their due obedience, end quote, which vied in cruelty with the noted six articles of her tyrannical father. By this law, any person above sixteen who should refuse during a month to attend the established worship was to be imprisoned. When should he further persist in his refusal during three months longer, he must abjure the realm. But in case of his rejecting this alternative, or returning from banishment, his offence was declared felony without benefit of clergy. The business of supplies was next taken into consideration, and the commons voted two subsidies and four fifteenths. But this not appearing to the ministry sufficient for the exigencies of the state, the peers were induced to request a conference with the lower house, for the purpose of proposing the augmentation of the grant to four subsidies and six fifteenths. The commons resented at first this interference with their acknowledged privilege of originating all money bills, but dread of the well-known consequences of offending their superiors prevailed at length over their indignation, and first the conference, then the additional supply, was acceded to. Some debate, however, arose on the time to be allowed for the payment of so heavy an imposition, and the illustrious Francis Bacon, then member for Middlesex, enlarged upon the distresses of the people, and the danger lest the House, by this grant, should be establishing a precedent against themselves and their posterity, in a speech to which his courtly kinsman, Sir Robert Cecil, replied with such warmth, and of which Her Majesty showed a resentful remembrance on his appearing soon after as a candidate for the office of Attorney-General. His cousin, Sir Edward Hobby, also, whose speeches in the former Parliament had been ill-received by certain great persons, took such a part in some of the questions now at issue between the Crown and the Commons, as procured him an imprisonment till the end of the sessions, when he was at length liberated, quote, but not, as Anthony Bacon wrote to his mother, without a notable public disgrace laid upon him by Her Majesty's royal censure, delivered amongst other things, by herself, after my Lord Keeper's speech." In this parting harangue to her Parliament, the Queen, little touched by the unprecedented liberality of the supplies which it had granted her, and the passing of her favourite bill against the schismatics and recusants, animadverted in severe terms on the oppositionists, reiterated the lofty claims with which she had opened the sessions, and pronounced a eulogium on the justice and moderation of her own government. She also entered into the grounds of her quarrel with the King of Spain, showed herself undismayed by the apprehension of anything which his once dreaded power could attempt against her, and characteristically added, in adverting to the defeat of the Armada, the following energetic warning, quote, I am informed that when he attempted this last invasion, some upon the sea-coast forsook their towns, fled up higher into the country, and left all naked and exposed to his entrance. But I swear unto you by God, if I knew those persons, or may know hereafter, I will make them know what it is to be fearful in so urgent a cause." The appearance of Francis Bacon in the House of Commons affords a fit occasion of tracing the previous history of this wonderful man, and of explaining his peculiar situation between the two great factions of the court, and the influence exerted by this circumstance on his character and after fortunes. That early promise of his genius which in childhood attracted the admiring observation of Elizabeth herself, had been confirmed by every succeeding year. In the thirteenth of his age, an earlier period than was even then customary, he was entered, together with his elder brother Anthony, of Trinity College, Cambridge. At this seat of learning he remained three years, during which, besides exhibiting his powers of memory and application by great proficiency in the ordinary studies of the place, he evinced the extraordinary precocity of his penetrating and original intellect, by forming the first sketch of a new system of philosophy in opposition to that of Aristotle. His father, designing him for public life, now sent him to complete his education in the house of Sir Amias Paulet, the Queen's ambassador in France. He gained the confidence of this able and honourable man to such a degree as to be entrusted by him with a mission to Her Majesty requiring secrecy and dispatch, of which he acquitted himself with great applause. Returning to France, he engaged in several excursions through its different provinces, and diligently occupied himself in the collection of facts and observations, which he afterwards threw together in a, quote, brief view of the state of Europe, end quote a work, however juvenile, which is said to exhibit much, both of the peculiar spirit and of the method of its illustrious author. But the death of his father in 1580 put an end to his travels, and cast a melancholy blight upon his opening prospects. For Anthony Bacon, the eldest of his sons by his second marriage, the Lord Keeper had handsomely provided, by the gift of his manor of Gormbury, 
and he had amassed a considerable sum with which he was about to purchase another estate for the portion of the younger, when death interrupted his design. And only one-fifth of this money falling to Francis, under the provisions of his father's will, he unexpectedly found himself compelled to resort to the practice of some gainful profession for his support. That of the law naturally engaged his preference. He entered himself of Gray's Inn, and passed within its precincts several studious years, during which he made himself master of the general principles of jurisprudence, as well as of the rules of legal practice in his own country. And he also found leisure to trace the outlines of his new philosophy in a work not now known to exist in a separate state, but incorporated probably in one of his more finished productions. In 1588 Her Majesty, desirous perhaps of encouraging a more entire devotion of his talents to the study of the law, distinguished him by the title of her counsel extraordinary, an office of little emolument, though valuable as an introduction to practice. Both the genius of Bacon disdained to plod in the trammels of a laborious profession. He felt that it was given him for higher and larger purposes. Yet perceiving at the same time that the narrowness of his circumstances would prove an insuperable bar to his ambition of becoming, as he once beautifully expressed it, quote, the servant of posterity, end quote, he thus, in 1591, solicited the patronage of his uncle, Lord Burley, quote, Again the meanness of my estate doth somewhat move me, for though I cannot accuse myself that I am either prodigal or slothful, yet my health is not to spend, nor my course to get. Lastly, I confess that I have as vast contemplative ends as I have moderate civil ends, for I have taken all knowledge to be my province, and if I could purge it of two sorts of rovers, whereof the one with frivolous disputations, confutations and verbosities, the other with blind experiments and auricular traditions and impostures, hath committed so many spoils, I hope I should bring in industrious observations, grounded conclusions, and profitable inventions and discoveries, the best state of that province. This, whether it be curiosity, or vainglory, or nature, or if one take it favourably, philanthropia, is so fixed in my mind as it cannot be removed. And I do easily see that place of any reasonable countenance doth bring commandment of more wits than a man's own, which is the thing I do greatly affect." Burley was no philosopher, though a lover of learning, and it could not perhaps be expected that he should at once perceive how eminently worthy was this labourer of the hire which he was reduced to solicit. He contented himself, therefore, with procuring for his kinsman the reversion of the place of register of the Star Chamber, worth about sixteen hundred pounds per annum. Of this office, however, which might amply have satisfied the wants of a student, it was unfortunately near twenty years before Bacon obtained possession, and during this tedious time of expectation he was wont to say, quote, that it was like another man's ground abutting upon his house, which might mend his prospect, but it did not fill his barn, end quote. He made, however, a grateful return to the Lord Treasurer for this instance of patronage, by composing an answer to a popish libel entitled, quote, a declaration of the true causes of the late troubles, end quote, in which he warmly vindicated the conduct of this minister, of his own father, and of other members of the administration, not forgetting to make a high eulogium on the talents and dispositions of Robert Cecil, now the most powerful instrument at court, to serve or to injure. Unhappily for the fortunes of Bacon, and in some respects for his moral character also, this selfish and perfidious statesman was endowed with sufficient reach of intellect to form some estimate of the transcendent abilities of his kinsman, and struck with dread or envy, he seems to have formed a systematic design of impeding by every art his favour and advancement. Unmoved by the eloquent adulation with which Bacon sought to propitiate his regard, he took all occasions to represent him to the Queen, and with some degree of justice, though more of malice, as a man of too speculative a turn to apply in earnest to the practical details of business one, moreover, whose head was so filled with abstract and philosophical notions that he would not fail to perplex any public affairs in which he might be permitted to take a lead. The effect of these suggestions on the mind of Elizabeth was greatly aggravated by the conduct of Bacon in the Parliament of 1593, in consequence of which Her Majesty for a considerable time denied him that access to her person with which he had hitherto been freely and graciously indulged. Some years before this period, Francis Bacon had become known to the Earl of Essex, whose genuine love of merit induced him to offer him his friendship and protection. The eagerness with which these were accepted had deeply offended the Cecils, and their displeasure was about this time increased, on seeing Anthony Bacon, by his brother's persuasion, enlist himself under the banner of the same political leader. Anthony, whose singular history is on many accounts worthy of notice, was a man of an inquisitive and crafty turn of mind, and seemingly born for a politician. He, like his brother, had been induced to pay a visit to France as the completion of a liberal education, 
and not finding himself involved in the same pecuniary difficulties, he had been enabled to make his abode in that country of much longer duration. From Paris, which he first visited in 1579, he proceeded to Bourges, Geneva, Montpellier, Marseille, Montauban, and Bordeaux, in each of which cities he resided for a considerable length of time. In the latter place he rendered some services to the Protestant inhabitants at great personal hazard. In 1584 he visited Henry IV, then King of Navarre, at Bern, and in 1586 he contracted at Montauban an intimacy with the celebrated Huguenot leader Duplessis de Mornay. As Anthony Bacon was invested with no public character, his continued and voluntary abode in a Catholic country began at length to excite a suspicion in the mind of his mother, his friends, and the Queen herself, that his conduct was influenced by some secret bias towards the Romish faith, an impression which received confirmation from the intimacies which he cultivated with several English exiles and pensioners of the King of Spain. This idea appears, however, to have been unfounded. It was often by the express, though secret, request of Burley that he formed these connections, and he had frequently supplied this minister with important articles of intelligence procured from such persons, with whom it was by no means unusual to perform the office of spy to England and to Spain alternately, or even to both at the same time. At length, the urgency of his friends and the clamours of his mother, whose Protestant zeal, setting a sharper edge on a temper naturally keen, prompted her to employ expressions of great violence, compelled him, after many delays, to quit the continent, and in the beginning of 1592 he returned to his native country. His miserable state of health, from the gout and other disorders which rendered him a cripple for life, prevented his encountering the fatigues of the usual court attendants. Yet he lost no time in procuring a seat in Parliament, and his close connection with the Cecils, joined to the opinion entertained of his political talents, seems to have excited a general expectation of his rising to high importance in the State. But he was not long in discovering that for some unknown reason the Lord Treasurer was little his friend, and offended at the coolness with which his secret intelligence from numerous foreign correspondents was received by this minister and his son in their joint capacity of Secretaries of State, he was easily prevailed upon to address himself to Essex. The Earl had by this time learned that there was no surer mode of recommending himself to Her Majesty and persuading her of his extraordinary zeal for her service than to provide her with a constant supply of authentic and early intelligence from the various countries of Europe, on which she kept a vigilant and jealous eye. He was accordingly occupied in establishing news agents in every quarter, and the opportune offers of Anthony Bacon were accepted by him with the utmost eagerness. A connection was immediately established between them, which ripened with time into so confidential an intimacy that in 1595 the Earl prevailed upon Mr. Bacon to accept of apartments in Essex House, which he continued to occupy till commanded by Her Majesty to quit them on the breaking out of the last rash enterprise of his patron. Struck with the boundless affection manifested by Anthony towards his brother, with whom he had established an entire community of interests, Essex now espoused with more warmth than ever the cause of Francis. He strained every nerve to gain for him, in 1592, the situation of Attorney-General, but Burley opposed the appointment. Robert Cecil openly expressed to the Earl his surprise that he should seek to procure it for a raw youth, and Her Majesty declared that, after the manner in which Francis Bacon had stood up against her in Parliament, admission to her presence was the only favour to which he ought to aspire. She added that in her father's time such conduct would have been sufficient to banish a man from the court for life. Lowering his tone, Essex afterwards sought for his friend the office of Solicitor-General but the same prejudices and antipathies still thwarted him, and finding all his efforts vain to establish him in any public station of honour or emolument, he nobly compensated his disappointment and relieved his necessities by the gift of an estate. The spirit of Bacon was neither a courageous nor a lofty one. He too soon repented of his generous exertions in the popular cause, and sought to atone for them by so entire a submission of himself to Her Majesty, accompanied with such eloquent professions of duty, humility, and profound respect, that we can scarcely doubt that a word of solicitation from the lips of Burley might have gained him an easy pardon. It is painful to think that any party jealousies, or any compliance with the malignant passions of his son, should so have poisoned the naturally friendly and benevolent disposition of this aged minister, that he could bear to withhold the offices of kindness from the nephew of his late beloved wife, and the son of one of his nearest friends and most cordial coadjutors in public life. But according to the maxims of court factions, his desertion of the Bacons might be amply justified. They had made their election, and it was the patronage of Essex which they preferred. Experience taught them too late that for their own interests they had chosen wrong. 
Since the death of Leicester, the Cecils had possessed all the real power at the court of Elizabeth. They, and they only, could advance their adherents. Essex, it is true, through the influence which he exerted over the imagination or the affections of the Queen, could frequently obtain grants to himself of real importance and great pecuniary value. But Her Majesty's singular caprice of temper rendered her jealous of every mark of favour extorted from the tender weakness of her heart and she appears to have almost made it a rule to compensate every act of bounty towards himself by some sensible mortification which she made him suffer in the person of a friend so little was his patronage the road to advancement that sir thomas smith clerk of the council is recorded as a solitary instance of a man preferred out of his household to the service of her majesty and bacon himself somewhere says speaking of the queen quote, against me she is never positive but to my lord of essex end quote. Fulk Greville was one of the few who did honour to themselves by becoming at this time the advocate of Francis Bacon with the Queen. And his solicitations were heard by her with such apparent complacency that he wrote to Bacon that he would wager two to one on his chance of becoming attorney, or at least solicitor-general. But Essex was to be mortified, and the influence of this generous Mecenas was exerted finally in vain. To his unfortunate choice of a patron, then, joined to the indiscreet zeal with which that patron pleaded his cause, Quote, in season and out of season, end quote, we are to ascribe in part the neglect experienced by Bacon during the reign of Elizabeth. But other causes concurred, which it may be interesting to trace, and which it would be injustice both to the Queen and to Burleigh to pass over in silence. At the period when Bacon first appealed to the friendship of the Lord Treasurer, in the letter above cited, he was already in the thirtieth year of his age, and had borne for two years the character of Queen's Council extraordinary but to the courts of law he was so entire a stranger that it was not till one or two years afterwards that we find him pleading his first cause it was pretty evident therefore in fifteen ninety two when he sought the office of attorney-general that necessity alone had made it the object of his wishes and his known inexperience in the practice of law might reasonably justify in the queen and her ministers some scruple of placing him in so responsible a post as a philosopher indeed no encouragement could exceed his deserts but this was a character which very few, even of the learned of that day, were capable of appreciating. Physical science, disgraced by its alliance with the blind experiments of alchemy and the deluding dreams of judicial astrology, was in possession of few titles to the respect of mankind, and its professors, credulous enthusiasts for the most part, or designing impostors, usually ended by bringing shame and loss on such persons as greedy hopes or vain curiosity bribed to become their patrons that general instauration of the sciences which the mighty genius of Bacon had projected was a scheme too vast and too profound to be comprehended by the minds of Elizabeth and her statesmen, and as it was not of a nature to address itself to their passions and interests, we must not wonder if they should have regarded it with indifference. At this period, too, it existed only in embryo, and so little was the public intellect prepared to seize the first hints thrown out by its illustrious author, that even many years afterwards, when his system had been produced to the world nearly in a state of maturity, the general sentiment seems pretty much to have corresponded with the judgment of King James, quote, that the philosophy of Bacon was like the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, end quote. All these considerations, however, are scarcely sufficient to vindicate the boasted discernment of Elizabeth from disgrace, in having suffered the most illustrious sage of her reign and country, who was at the same time its brightest wit and most accomplished orator, known to her from his birth, and the son of a wise and faithful servant whose memory she held in honour, to languish in poverty and discouragement, useless to her and to the public affairs, and a burden to his own thoughts. The King of France found it expedient about this time to declare himself a convert to the Church of Rome. For this change of religion, whether sincere or otherwise, he might plead not only the personal motive of gaining possession of the throne of his inheritance, which seemed to be denied to him on other terms, but the patriotic one of rescuing his exhausted country from the miseries of a protracted civil war, and whatever might be the decision of a scrupulous moralist on the case, it is certain that Elizabeth, at least, had small title to reprobate a compliance of which, under the reign of her sister, she had herself set the example. But the character of the Protestant heroine with which circumstances had invested her obliged her to overlook this inconsistency, and as demonstrations cost her little, she not only indicted on the occasion a solemn letter of reproof to her ally, but actually professed herself so deeply wounded by his dereliction of principle that it was necessary for her to tranquillize her mind by the perusal of many pious works and the study of Bethius on consolation, which she even undertook the task of translating. Essex, whom she honoured with a sight of her performance, 
was adroit enough to suggest to the royal author, as a principal motive of his urgency with her to restore Francis Bacon to her favour, the earnest desire which he felt that Her Majesty's excellent translations should be viewed by those most capable of appreciating their merits. The indignation of Elizabeth against Henry's apostasy was not, however, so violent as to exclude the politic consideration that it was still her interest to support the King of France against the King of Spain. And besides continuing her wanted supplies, she soon after entered with him into a new engagement, purporting that they should never make peace but by mutual consent. Bretagne was still the scene of action to the English auxiliaries. Under Sir John Norris, their able commander, they shared in the service of resting from the Spaniards, by whom they had been garrisoned, the towns of Morlaix, Quimper Corentin, and Brest. Their valour was everywhere conspicuous, and the eagerness of the young courtiers of Elizabeth to share in the glory of these enterprises rose to a passion, which she sometimes thought it necessary to repress with a show of severity, as in the following instance related by Naunton. Sir Charles Blount, afterwards Lord Mountjoy, quote, having twice or thrice stolen away into Bretagne, where under Sir John Norris he had then a company, without the Queen's leave and privity, she sent a messenger unto him, with a strict charge to the general to see him sent home. When he came into the Queen's presence, she fell into a kind of reviling, demanding how he durst go over without her leave. "'Serve me so,' quoth she, "'once more, and I will lay you fast enough for running. You will never leave it until you are knocked on the head, as that inconsiderate fellow Sidney was. You shall go when I send you, and in the meantime see that you lodge in the court,' which was then at Whitehall, "'where you may follow your book, read and discourse of the wars.'" End quote. Philip II, unable to win glory or advantage against Elizabeth in open and honourable warfare, sought a base revenge upon her by proposing through secret agents vast rewards to any one who could be brought to attempt her destruction. It was no easy task to discover persons sufficiently rash, as well as wicked, to undertake from motives purely mercenary a villainy of which the peril was so appalling. But at length Fuentes and Ibarra, joint governors of the Netherlands, succeeded in bribing Dr. Lopez, domestic physician to the Queen, to mix poison in her medicine. Essex, whose watchfulness over the life of his sovereign was remarkable, whilst his intelligences were comparable in extent and accuracy to those of Walsingham himself, was the first to give notice of this atrocious plot. At his instance Lopez was apprehended, examined before himself, the treasurer, the Lord Admiral, and Robert Cecil, and committed to custody in the Earl's house. But nothing decisive appearing on his first examination, Robert Cecil took occasion to represent the charge as groundless, and Her Majesty, sending in heat for Essex, called him, quote, rash and temerarious youth, end quote, and reproached him for bringing on slight grounds so heinous a suspicion upon an innocent man. The Earl, incensed to find his diligent service thus repaid, through the successful artifice of his enemy, quitted the presence in a paroxysm of rage, and according to his practice on similar occasions, shut himself up in his chamber, which he refused to quit till the Queen herself two or three days afterwards sent the Lord Admiral to mediate a reconciliation. Further interrogatories, mingled probably with menaces of the torture, brought Lopez to confess the fact of his having received the King of Spain's bribe, but he persisted in denying that it was ever in his thoughts to perpetrate the crime. This subterfuge did not, however, save him from an ignominious death, which he shared with two other persons whom Fuentes and Ibarra had hired for a similar undertaking. The Spanish court disdained to return any satisfactory answer to the complaints of Elizabeth respecting these designs against her life, but either shame, or more likely the fear of reprisals, seems to have deterred it from any repetition of experiments so perilous. About two years afterwards, however, an English Jesuit named Walpole, who was settled in Spain and intimately connected with the noted Father Parsons, instigated an attempt worthy of record, partly as a curious instance of the exaggerated ideas then prevalent of the force of poisons. In the last voyage of Drake to the West Indies, a small vessel of his was captured and carried into a port of Spain, on board of which was one squire, formerly a purveyor for the Queen's stables. With his prisoner, Walpole, as a diligent servant of his church, undertook to make himself acquainted, and finding him a resolute fellow, and of capacity and education above his rank, he spared no pains to convert him to popery. This step gained, he diligently plied him with his Jesuitical arguments, and so thoroughly persuaded him of the duty and merit of promoting by any kinds of means the overthrow of heresy, that Squire at length consented to bind himself by a solemn vow to make an attempt against the life of Elizabeth, in the mode which should be pointed out to him. An enterprise, as he was assured, which would be attended with little personal danger, and in case of the worst, would assuredly be recompensed by immediate admission into the joys of heaven. Finally, the worthy father presented to his disciple a packet of some poisonous preparation, 
which he enjoined him to take an opportunity of spreading on the pommel of the queen's saddle. The queen, in mounting, would transfer the ointment to her hand. With her hand she was likely to touch her mouth or nostrils, and such, as he averred, was the virulence of the poison that certain death must follow. End of section 40《Section 41 of Memoirs of the Court of Queen Elizabeth. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Memoirs of the Court of Queen Elizabeth, Volumes 1 and 2, by Lucy Aiken. Chapter 24, 1593 to 1597, Part 2. Squire returned to England, enlisted for the Cadiz expedition, and on the eve of its sailing took the preparation and disposed of it as directed. Desirous of adding to his merits, he found means during the voyage to anoint in like manner the arms of the Earl of Essex's chair. The failure of the application in both instances greatly surprised him. To the Jesuit it appeared so unaccountable that he was persuaded Squire had deceived him, and actuated at once by the desire of punishing his defection, and the fear of his betraying such secrets of the party as had been confided to him, he consummated his villainy by artfully conveying to the English government an intimation of the plot. Squire was apprehended, and at first denied all, quote, but by good counsel, and the truth working with all, end quote, according to Speed's expression, was brought to confess what could not otherwise have been proved against him, and suffered penitently for his offence. Our chronicler admires the providence which interfered for the protection of Her Majesty in this great peril, and compares it to the miraculous preservation of St. Paul from the bite of the viper. The Jesuits are supposed to have employed more efficacious instruments for the destruction of Ferdinando, Earl of Derby, who died in April 1594. This nobleman had the misfortune to be grandson of Eleanor, Countess of Cumberland, the younger daughter of Mary, Queen Dowager of France, and sister of Henry VIII by her second husband, Charles Brandon, Duke of Suffolk. And although the children of Lady Catherine Grey, Countess of Hartford, obviously stood before him in this line of succession, occasion was taken by the Romish party from this descent to urge him to assume the title of King of England. One Hesket, a zealous agent of the Jesuits and Popish fugitives, was employed to temper with the Earl, who on one hand undertook that his claim should be supported by powerful succours from abroad, and on the other menaced him with certain and speedy death in case of his rejecting the proposal or betraying its authors. But the Earl was too loyal to hesitate a moment. He revealed the whole plot to government, and Hesket, on his information, was convicted of treason and suffered death. Not long after, the Earl was suddenly seized with a violent disorder of the bowels, which in a few days carried him off and on the first day of his illness his gentleman of the horse took his lord's best saddle-horse and fled. These circumstances might be thought pretty clearly to indicate poison as the means of his untimely end. But although a suspicion of its employment was entertained by some, the melancholy event appears to have been more generally ascribed to witchcraft. An examination being instituted, a waxen image was discovered in his chamber with a hair of the colour of the earl's drawn through the body. Also an old woman in the neighbourhood, a reputed witch, being required to recite after a prompter the Lord's Prayer in Latin, was observed to blunder repeatedly in the same words. But these circumstances, however strong, not being deemed absolutely conclusive, the poor old woman was apparently suffered to escape. After the gentleman of the horse, or his instigators, we do not find that any search was made. The mother of this Earl of Derby died two years after. At one period of her life we find her much in favour with the Queen, whom she was accustomed to attend, in quality of First Lady of the Blood Royal but she had subsequently excited her majesty's suspicions by her imprudent consultations of fortune-tellers and diviners on the delicate subject doubtless of succession to the crown the animosity between elizabeth and her savage adversary the king of spain was continually becoming more fierce and more inveterate undeterred by former failures philip was thought to meditate a fresh invasion either of england or of ireland which latter country was besides in so turbulent a state from the insurrections of native chieftains that it had been found necessary to send over Sir John Norris as General of Ulster, with a strong reinforcement of veterans from the Low Countries. The Queen, on her part, was well prepared to resist and retaliate all attacks. The spirit of the nation was thoroughly roused. Gallant troops and able officers formed in the Flemish School of Glory, or under the banners of the Bourbon hero, burned with impatience for the signal to revenge the wrongs of their Queen and country on their capital and most detested enemy. Still the conflict threatened to be an arduous one. Elizabeth felt all its difficulties, and loath to lose the support of one of her bravest and most popular captains, 
she addressed the following letter of recall to Lord Willoughby, who had repaired to Spa, ostensibly for the recovery of his health. Really, perhaps, in resentment of some injury inflicted by a venal and treacherous court, of which his noble nature scorned alike the intrigues and the servility. Quote, good Peregrine, we are not a little glad that by your journey you have received such good fruit of amendment, especially when we consider how great a vexation it is to a mind devoted to actions of honour, to be restrained by any indisposition of body from following those courses which, to your own reputation and our great satisfaction, you have formerly performed. And therefore we must now, out of our desire of your well-doing, chiefly enjoin you to an especial care to increase and continue your health, which must give life to all your best endeavours. So we next as seriously recommend to you this consideration, that in these times, when there is such an appearance that we shall have the trial of our best and noble subjects, you seem not to affect the satisfaction of your own private contentation, beyond the attending on that which nature and duty challengeth from all persons of your quality and profession. For if unnecessarily your health of body being recovered, you should alloin yourself by residence there from those employments whereof we shall have too good store, you shall not so much amend the state of your body, as happily you shall call in question the reputation of your mind and judgment, even in the opinion of those that love you, and are best acquainted with your disposition and discretion. Interpret this our plainness, we pray you, to an extraordinary estimation of you, for it is not common with us to deal so freely with many, and believe that you shall ever find us both ready and willing, on all occasions, to yield you the fruits of that interest which your endeavours have purchased for you in our opinion and estimation. Not doubting but when you have with moderation made trial of the successes of these your sundry peregrinations, you will find as great comfort to spend your days at home as heretofore you have done of which we do wish you full measure, howsoever you shall have cause of abode or return. Given under our signet at our manner of nonsuch, the 7th of October, 1594, in the thirty-seventh year of our reign, your most loving sovereign, E. R. We do not perceive the effects of this letter in the employment of Lord Willoughby in any of the expeditions against Spain which ensued, but he was afterwards appointed Governor of Berwick, and held that situation till his death in 1601. Sir Walter Raleigh, that splendid genius with a sordid soul, whom a romantic spirit of adventure and a devouring thirst of gain equally stimulated to activity, had unexpectedly found his advancement at court impeded, after the first steps, usually accounted the most difficult, had been speedily and fortunately surmounted. Several conspiring causes might, however, be assigned for this check in his career of fortune. His high pretensions to the favour of the Queen, joined to his open adherence to the party of Sir Robert Cecil, had provoked the hostility of Essex, who, in defiance of him, at one of the ostentatious tournaments of the day, is said to have, quote, filled the tilt-yard with two thousand orange tawny feathers, end quote, the distinction, doubtless, of his followers and retainers. He had incurred the resentment of more than one of the order of bishops, by his ceaseless and shameless solicitations of grants and leases, out of the property of the church. In Ireland, he had rendered Sir William Russell, the Lord Deputy, his enemy, by various demonstrations of opposition and rivalry. At court, his abilities and his first rapid successes with Her Majesty had stirred up against him the envy of a whole host of competitors. Elizabeth, who for the best reasons had an extreme dislike to any manifestations of a mercenary disposition in her servants, had been disgusted by the frequency and earnestness of his petitions for pecuniary favours. When, Sir Walter, she had once exclaimed, will you cease to be a beggar? He replied, quote, when your gracious Majesty ceases to be a benefactor, end quote. So dexterous an answer appeased her for a time, and the profusion of eloquent adulation with which he never failed to soothe her ear, engaged her self-love strongly in his behalf. But to complete the ill fortune of Raleigh, Father Parsons, provoked by the earnestness with which he had urged in Parliament the granting of supplies for a war offensive and defensive against Spain, had published a pamphlet charging him with atheism and impiety, which had not only found welcome reception with his enemies, but with the people, to whom he was ever obnoxious, and had even raised a prejudice against him in the mind of his sovereign. On this subject, a writer contemporary with the later years of Raleigh thus expresses himself, quote, Sir Walter Raleigh was the first, as I have heard, that ventured to tack about and sail aloof from the beaten track of the schools, who upon the discovery of so apparent an error as a torrid zone, intended to proceed in an inquisition after more solid truths, till the mediation of some whose livelihood lay in hammering shrines for this superannuated study, possessed Queen Elizabeth that such doctrine was against God no less than her father's honour, whose faith, if he owed any, was grounded upon school divinity, whereupon she chid him, 
who was by his own confession ever after branded with the name of an atheist, though a known asserter of God and providence. The business of Mrs. Throgmorton, and the disputes arising out of the sale of the captured Carrick, succeeded, to inflame still more the ill-humour of the Queen. And Raleigh, finding everything adverse to him at court, resolved to quit the scene for a time, in the hope of returning with better omens, when absence and danger should again have endeared him to his offended mistress, and when the splendour of his foreign successes might enable him to impose silence on the clamours of malignity at home. The interior of the pathless wilds of Guyana had been reported to abound in those exhaustless mines of the precious metals which filled the imaginations of the earliest explorers of the new world, and to their ignorant cupidity appeared the only important object of research and acquisition in regions where the eye of political wisdom would have discerned so many superior inducements to colonization or to conquest. The fabulous city of El Dorado, which became for some time proverbial in our language to express the utmost profusion and magnificence of wealth, was placed by the romantic narrations of voyagers somewhere in the centre of this vast country, and nothing could be more flattering to the mania of the age than the project of exploring its hidden treasures. Raleigh conceived this idea. The court and the city vied in eagerness to share the profits of the enterprise. A squadron was speedily fitted out, though at great expense, and in February 1595 the ardent leader weighed anchor from the English shore. Proceeding first to Trinidad, he possessed himself of the town of St. Joseph. Then, with the numerous pinnaces of his fleet, he entered the mouth of the great river Orinoco, and sailing upwards penetrated far into the bosoms of the country. But the intense heat of the climate, and the difficulties of this unknown navigation, compelled him to return without any more valuable result of his enterprise than that of taking formal possession of the land in Her Majesty's name. Raleigh, however, unwilling to acknowledge a failure, published on his return an account of Guyana, filled with the most disgraceful and extravagant falsehoods, falsehoods to which he himself became eventually the victim, when, on the sole credit of his assurances, King James released him from a tedious imprisonment to head a second band of adventurers to this disastrous shore. A still more unfortunate result awaited an expedition of greater consequence, which sailed during the same year, under Hawkins and Drake, against the settlements of Spanish America. Repeated attacks had at length taught the Spaniards to stand on their defence, and the English were first repulsed from Puerto Rico, and afterwards obliged to relinquish the attempt of marching across the Isthmus of Darien to Panama. But the great and irreparable misfortune of the enterprise was the loss, first of the gallant Sir John Hawkins, the kinsman and early patron of Drake, and afterwards of that great navigator himself, who fell a victim to the torrid climate, and to fatigue and mortification which conspired to render it fatal. A person of such eminence, and whose great actions reflect back so bright a lustre on the reign which had furnished to him the most glorious occasions of distinguishing himself in the service of his country, must not be dismissed from the scene in silence. The character of Francis Drake was remarkably not alone for those constitutional qualities of valour, industry, capacity, and enterprise, which the history of his exploits would necessarily lead us to infer, but for virtues founded on principle and reflection which render it in a high degree the object of respect and moral approbation. It is true that his aggressions on the Spanish settlements were originally founded on a vague notion of reprisals, equally irreconcilable to public law and private equity but with the exception of this error which may find considerable palliation in the deficient education of the man the prevalent opinions of the day and the peculiar animosity against philip the second cherished in the bosom of every protestant englishman the conduct of drake appears to demand almost unqualified commendation it was by sobriety by diligence in the concerns of his employers and by a tried integrity that he early raised himself from the humble station of an ordinary seaman to the command of a vessel when placed in authority over others he showed himself humane and considerate. His treatment of his prisoners was exemplary, his veracity unimpeached, his private life religiously pure and spotless. In the division of the rich booty which often rewarded his valour and his toils, he was liberal towards his crews and scrupulously just to the owners of his vessels, and in the appropriation of his own share of wealth he displayed that munificence towards the public, of which, since the days of Roman glory, history has recorded so few examples. With the profits of one of his earliest voyages, in which he captured the town of Venta Cruza, and made prize of a string of fifty mules laden with silver, he fitted out three stout frigates, and sailed with them to Ireland, where he served as a volunteer under Walter, Earl of Essex, and performed many brilliant actions. After the capture of a rich Spanish carrack at the Terceras in 1587, he undertook at his own expense to bring to the town of Plymouth, which he represented in Parliament, a supply of spring-water, 
of which necessary article it suffered a great deficiency. This he accomplished by means of a canal or aqueduct above twenty miles in length. Drake incurred some blame in the expedition to Portugal for failing to bring his ships up the river to Lisbon, according to his promise to Sir John Norris, the general. But on explaining the case before the Privy Council on his return, he was entirely acquitted by them, having made it appear that, under all the circumstances, to have carried the fleet up the Tagus would have been to expose it to damage without the possibility of any benefit to the service. By his enemies this great man was stigmatized as vain and boastful. A slight infirmity, in one who had achieved so much by his own unassisted genius, and which the great flow of natural eloquence which he possessed may at once have produced and rendered excusable. One trait appears to indicate that he was ambitious of a species of distinction which he might have regarded himself as entitled to despise. He had thought proper to assume, apparently without due authority, the armorial coat of Sir Bernard Drake also a seaman and a native of Devonshire. Sir Bernard, from a false pride of family, highly resented this unwarrantable intrusion, as he regarded it, and in a dispute on the subject gave Sir Francis a box on the ear. The Queen now deemed it necessary to interfere, and she granted to the illustrious navigator the following arms of her own device. Sable, a fess wavy between two pole-stars argent, and for crest, a ship on a globe under ruff, with a cable held by a hand coming out of the clouds, the motto auxilio divino and beneath sic parvis magna in the rigging of the ship a wyvern gules the arms of sir bernard drake hung up by the heels sir john baskerville who succeeded by the death of drake to the command of the unfortunate expedition to which he had fallen a sacrifice encountered the spanish fleet off cuba in an action which though less decisive on the english side than might have been hoped left at least no ground of triumph to the enemy Meantime, the court was by no means barren of incident, and we are fortunate in possessing a minute and authentic journal of its transactions in a series of letters addressed to Sir Robert Sidney, Governor of Flushing, by several of his friends, but chiefly by Roland White, a gentleman to whom, during his absence, he had recommended the care of his interests, and the task of transmitting to him whatever intelligence might appear either useful or entertaining. In October 1595, Mr. White mentions the following abominable instance of tyranny that the Earl of Hertford had been sent for by a messenger and committed to custody in his own house, because it had appeared by a case found among the papers of a Dr. Aubrey that he had formerly taken the opinions of civilians on the validity of his first marriage, and caused a record of it to be secretly put into the court of arches. White adds significantly that the Earl was accounted one of the wealthiest subjects in England. Soon after his lordship was committed to the Tower, and it was said that orders were given that his son, who since the establishment of the marriage had borne the title of Lord Beauchamp, should henceforth be again called Mr. Seymour. Several lawyers and other persons were also imprisoned for a short time about this matter, under what law or pretext of law it would be vain to inquire. Lady Hertford, though a sister of the Lord Admiral and nearly related to the Queen, was for some time an unsuccessful suitor at court for the liberty of her lord. Her Majesty, however, was graciously pleased to declare that, quote, neither his life nor living should be called in question, end quote, as if both had been at her mercy and though she would not consent to see the countess, she regularly sent her broths in a morning, meat from her own trencher, affecting, it should seem, in these trifles, to acquit herself of the promises of her special favour, with which she had a few years before repaid the splendid hospitality of this noble pair. We do not learn how long the durance of the earl continued, but it is highly probable that he was once more compelled to purchase his liberty. Great uneasiness was given about this time to the Earl of Essex by a book written in defence of the King of Spain's title to the English crown, which contained, quote, dangerous praises of his valour and worthiness, end quote, inserted for the express purpose of exciting the jealousy of the Queen and bringing him into disgrace. The work was shown him by Elizabeth herself. On coming from her presence he was observed to look, quote, pale and wane, end quote, and going home he reported himself sick, an expedient for working on the feelings of his sovereign to which, notwithstanding the truth and honour popularly regarded as his characteristics, Essex is known to have frequently condescended. On this, as on most occasions, he found it successful. Her Majesty soon made him a consolatory visit, and in spite of the strenuous efforts of his enemies, this attempt to injure him only served to augment her affection and root him more firmly in her confidence. Quote, her Majesty, writes White soon after, is in very good health, and comes much abroad. Upon Thursday she dined at Kew, at my Lord Keeper's house, who lately obtained of Her Majesty his suit for one hundred pounds a year in Fee Farm. Her entertainment for that meal was great and exceeding costly. At her first lighting she had a fine fan garnished with diamonds, 
valued at four hundred pounds at least. After dinner, in her privy chamber, he gave her a fair pair of virginals. In her bedchamber, he presented her with a fine gown and a juppin, which things were pleasing to her highness, and to grace his lordship the more, she of herself took from him a fork, a spoon, and a salt, of fair agate." End quote. It must be confessed that this was a mode of quote unquote, gracing a courtier peculiarly consonant to the disposition of her majesty. The further Elizabeth descended into the vale of years, the stronger were her efforts to make ostentation of a youthful gaiety of spirits and an unfailing alacrity in the pursuit of pleasure, though avarice, the vice of age, mingled strangely with these her juvenile affectations. To remark to her the progress of time was to wound her in the tenderest part and not even from her ghostly counsellors would she endure a topic so offensive as the mention of her age. An anecdote to this effect belongs to the year 1596, and is found in the account of Rudd, Bishop of St. David's, given in Harrington's brief view of the church. Quote, there is almost none that waited in Queen Elizabeth's court and observed anything, but can tell that it pleased her very much to seem, to be thought, and to be told that she looked young. The majesty and gravity of a sceptre born forty-four years could not alter that nature of a woman in her. This notwithstanding, this good bishop being appointed to preach before her in the Lent of the year 1596, wishing in a godly zeal, as well became him, that she should think some time of mortality, end quote, took a text fit for the purpose, on which he treated for a time well, learnedly, and respectively. Quote, but when he had spoken a while of some sacred and mystical numbers, as three for the Trinity, three for the heavenly hierarchy, seven for the Sabbath, and seven times seven for a jubilee, and lastly seven times nine for the grand climacterical year, she, perceiving whereto it intended, began to be troubled with it. The bishop discovering that all was not well, for the pulpit stands there vis-à-vis -vis to the closet, he fell to treat of some more plausible numbers, as of the number 666, making Latinus, with which he said he could prove the Pope to be Antichrist, also of the fatal number of eighty-eight, so long before spoken of for a dangerous year, but withal larding it with some passages of scripture that touched the infirmities of age, he concluded his sermon. The queen, as the manner was, opened the window, but she was so far from giving him thanks or good countenance that she said plainly he should have kept his arithmetic for himself. But I see, said she, the greatest clerks are not the wisest men, and so went away, for the time discontented. Quote, the Lord Keeper puckering, though reverencing the man much in his particular, yet for the present, to assuage the Queen's displeasure, commanded him to keep his house for a time, which he did. But of a truth Her Majesty showed no ill-nature in this, for within three days she was not only displeased at his restraint, but in my hearing rebuked a lady yet living for speaking scornfully of him and his sermon, only to show how the good bishop was deceived in supposing she was so decayed in her limbs and senses as himself, perhaps, and other of that age were wont to be she said she thanked god that neither her stomach nor strength nor her voice for singing nor fingering instruments nor lastly her sight was any whit decayed and to prove the last before us all she produced a little jewel that had an inscription of very small letters and offered it first to my lord of worcester and then to sir james crofts to read and both protested bona fide that they could not yet the queen herself did find out the poesy and made herself merry with the standers by upon it end quote. A point of some importance to the peers of England was about this time brought to a final decision by the following circumstance. Sir Thomas, son and heir of Sir Matthew Arundel of Warder Castle, a young man of a courageous and enterprising disposition, going over to Germany, had been induced to engage as a volunteer in the wars of the Emperor against the Turks, and in the assault of the city of Gran in Hungary had taken with his own hand a Turkish banner. For this and other good service, Rodolf the Second had been pleased to confer upon him the honour of Count of the Holy Roman Empire extending also, as usual, the title of counts and countesses to all his descendants for ever. On his return to England in the year following, the question arose whether this dignity, conferred by a foreign prince without the previous consent of his own sovereign, should entitle the bearer to rank, precedence, or any other privilege in this country. The peers naturally opposed a concession which tended to lessen the value of their privileges by rendering them accessible through foreign channels, and Her Majesty, being called upon to settle the debate, pronounced the following judgment that the closest tie of affection subsisted between sovereigns and their subjects, that as chaste wives should fix their eyes upon their husbands alone, in like manner faithful subjects should only direct theirs towards the prince whom it had pleased God to set over them, and that she would not allow her sheep to be branded with the mark of a stranger, or to be taught to follow the whistle of a foreign shepherd. And to this effect she wrote to the emperor, who by a special letter had recommended Sir Thomas Arundel to her favour. 
the decision appears to have been reasonable and politic, and would at the time be regarded as peculiarly so in the instance of honours conferred on a Catholic gentleman by a Catholic prince. King James, however, created Sir Thomas Lord Arundel of Warder, and he seems to have borne in common speech the title of Count. End of section 41《セクション42 of Memoirs of the Court of Queen Elizabeth》This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Memoirs of the Court of Queen Elizabeth, Volumes 1 and 2, by Lucy Aiken. Chapter 25, 1595 to 1598. From this period nearly of the reign of Elizabeth, her court exhibited a scene of perpetual contest between the faction of the Earl of Essex and that of Lord Burley, or rather of Robert Cecil and so widely did the effects of this intestine division extend, that there was perhaps scarcely a single court attendant or public functionary whose interests did not become in some mode or other involved in the debate. Yet the quarrel itself may justly be regarded as base and contemptible. No public principle was here at stake. Whether religious, as in the struggles between Papists and Protestants, which often rent the cabinet of Henry VIII, or civil, as in those of Whigs and Tories by which the administrations of later times have been divided or overthrown. It was simply and without disguise a strife between individuals for the exclusive possession of that political power and court influence of which each might without disturbance have enjoyed a share capable of contenting an ordinary ambition. In religion there was apparently no shade of difference between the hostile leaders. Neither of them had studied with so little diligence the inclinations of the Queen as to persist at this time in the patronage of the Puritans, though the early impressions certainly of Essex and probably of Sir Robert Cecil also, must have been considerably in favour of this persecuted sect. Still less would either venture to stand forth the advocate of the Catholics, though it was among the most daring and desperate of this body that Essex was compelled at length to seek adherence, when the total ruin of his interest with his sovereign fatally compelled him to exchange the character of head of a court party for that of a conspirator and a rebel. Of the title of the King of Scots both were steady supporters, and first Essex, and afterwards Cecil, maintained a secret correspondence with James, who flattered each in his turn with assurances of present friendship and future favour. On one public question alone of any considerable magnitude do the rivals appear to have been at issue, that of the prosecution of an offensive war against Spain. The age and the wisdom of Lord Burley alike inclined him to a pacific policy, and though Robert Cecil, for the purpose of strengthening himself and weakening his opponent, would frequently act a patron towards particular officers, those especially of whom he observed the Earl to entertain a jealousy, it is certain that warlike ardour made no part of his natural composition. Essex, on the contrary, was all on fire for military glory, and at this time he was urging the Queen with unceasing importunities to make a fresh attack upon her capital enemy in the heart of his European dominions. In this favoured object, after encountering considerable opposition from her habits of procrastination and from some remaining fears and scruples, he succeeded, and the zeal of the people hastening to give full effect to the designs of Her Majesty, a formidable armament was fitted out in all diligence, which in June 1596 set sail for Cadiz. Lord Howard of Effingham, as Lord Admiral, commanded the fleet. Essex himself received with transport the appointment of General of all the land forces and spared neither pains nor cost in his preparations for the enterprise. Besides his constant eagerness for action, his spirit was on this occasion inflamed by an indignation against the tyrant Philip, quote, which rose, according to the happy expression of one of his biographers, to the dignity of a personal aversion. End quote. In his letters he was wont to employ the expression, quote, I will make that proud king know, end quote, etc., a phrase, it seems, which gave high offence to Elizabeth, who could not tolerate what she regarded as arrogance against a crowned head, though her bitterest foe. Subordinate commands were given to Lord Thomas Howard, second son of the late Duke of Norfolk, who was at this time inclined to the party of Essex, to Raleigh, who now affected an extraordinary deference for the Earl, his secret enemy and rival, to that very able officer Sir Francis Vere of the family of the Earls of Oxford, who had highly distinguished himself during several years in the wars of the Low Countries, to Sir George Carew, an intimate friend of Sir Robert Cecil, and to some others who formed together a council of war. The Queen herself composed on this occasion a prayer for the use of the fleet, and she sent to her land and her sea commander jointly, quote, a letter of license to depart, besides comfortable encouragement, end quote. Quote, but ours in particular, adds a follower of Essex, 
had one fraught with all kind of promises and loving offers, as the like, since he was a favourite, he never had." End quote. Enterprise was certainly not the characteristic of the Lord Admiral as a commander, and when, on the arrival of the armament off Cadiz, it was proposed that an attack should be made by the fleet on the ships in the harbour, he remonstrated against the rashness of such an attempt, and prevailed on several members of the Council of War to concur in his objections. In the end, however, the arguments or importunities of the more daring party prevailed, and Essex threw his hat into the sea in a wild transport of joy on learning that the Admiral consented to make the attack. He was now acquainted by the admiral with the queen's secret order, dictated by her tender care for the safety of her young favourite, that he should by no means be allowed to lead the assault, and he promised an exact obedience to the mortifying prohibition. But once in presence of the enemy, his impetuosity would brook no control. He broke from the station of inglorious security which had been assigned him, and rushed into the heat of the action. The Spanish fleet was speedily driven up the harbour, under the guns of the fort of Puntal, where the admiral's ship and another first-rate were set on fire by their own crews, and the rest run aground. Of these, two fine ships fell into the hands of the English, and the Lord Admiral, having refused to accept of any ransom for the remainder, saying that he came to consume and not to compound, they were all, to the number of fifty, burned by the Spanish admiral. Meantime, Essex landed his men and marched them to the assault of Cadiz. The town was on this side well fortified, and the defenders, having also the advantage of the ground, received the invaders so warmly that they were on the point of being repulsed from the gate against which they had directed their attack. But Essex, just at the critical moment, rushed forward, seized his own colours, and threw them over the wall, quote, giving withal a most hot assault unto the gate, where, to save the honour of their ensign, happy was he that could first leap down from the wall, and with shot and sword make way through the thickest press of the enemy." End quote. The town, being thus stormed, was of course given up to plunder but Essex, whose humanity was not less conspicuous than his courage, put an immediate stop to the carnage by a vigorous exertion of his authority, protected in person the women, children, and religious, whom he caused to retire to a place of safety, caused the prisoners to be treated with the utmost tenderness, and allowed all the citizens to withdraw on payment of a ransom before the place with its fortifications was committed to the flames. It was indeed the wish and intention of Essex to have kept possession of Cadiz, which he confidently engaged to the council of war to hold out against the Spaniards, with a force of no more than three or four thousand men, till the succours could be sent from England, and with this view he had in the first instance sedulously preserved the buildings from all injury. But among his brother officers few were found prepared to second his zeal. The expedition was in great measure an adventure undertaken at the expense of private persons, who engaged in it with the hope of gain rather than glory and as these men probably attributed the success which had hitherto crowned their arms in great measure to the surprise of the Spaniards, they were unwilling to risk in a more deliberate contest the rich rewards of valour of which they had possessed themselves. The subsequent proposals of Essex for the annoyance of the enemy, either by an attack on Coruna, or on St. Sebastien, or St. Andero, or by sailing to the Azores in quest of the homeward-bound Carrex, all experienced the same mortifying negative from the members of the Council of War of whom Lord Thomas Howard alone supported his opinions. But, undeterred by this systematic opposition, he persevered in urging that more might and more ought to be performed by so considerable an armament, and the Lord Admiral, weary of contesting the matter, sailed away at length, and left him on the Spanish coast with the few ships and the handful of men which still adhered to him. Want of provisions compelled him in a short time to abandon an enterprise now desperate, and he returned full of indignation to England, where fresh struggles and new mortifications awaited him. The appointment during his absence of Robert Cecil to the office of Secretary of State, instead of Thomas Bodley, afterwards the founder of the library which preserves his name, for whom, since he had found the restoration of Davison hopeless, Essex had been straining every nerve to procure it, gave him ample warning of all the counteraction on other points which he was doomed to experience, and was, in fact, the circumstance which finally established the ascendancy of his adversaries yet to an impartial eye many considerations may appear to have entirely justified on the part of the queen this preference where it might be asked could a fitter successor be found to lord burleigh in the post which he had so long filled to the satisfaction of his sovereign and the benefit of his country than in the son who certainly inherited all his ability though not as was afterwards seen his principles or his virtues and who had been trained to business as the assistant of his father and under his immediate inspection why should the Earl of Essex interfere with an order of things so natural? On what pretext should the Queen be induced to disappoint the hopes of her old and faithful servant, and to cast a stigma upon a young man of the most promising talents, 
who was unwearied in his efforts to establish himself in her favour. By the Queen and the people, Essex, their common favourite, was welcomed, on his safe return from an expedition to himself so glorious, with every demonstration of joy and affection, and no one appeared to sympathise more cordially than Her Majesty in his indignation, that nothing had been attempted against the Spanish treasure-ships. On the other hand, no pains were spared by his adversaries to lessen in public estimation the glory of his exploits, by ascribing to the naval commanders a principal share in the success at Cadiz, which he accounted all his own. An anonymous narrative of the expedition which he had prepared was suppressed by means of a general prohibition to the printers of publishing anything whatsoever relating to that business, and no other resource was left him than the imperfect one of dispersing copies in manuscript. It was suggested to the Queen by some about her that though the treasure-ships had escaped her, she might at least reimburse herself for the expenses incurred out of the rich spoils taken at Cadiz, and no sooner had this project gained possession of her mind than she began to quarrel with Essex for his lavish distribution of prize-money. She insisted that the commander should resign to her a large share of their gains, and she had even the meanness to cause the private soldiers and sailors to be searched before they quitted the ships, that the value of the money or other booty of which they had possessed themselves might be deducted from their pay. Her first feelings of displeasure and disappointment over, the rank and reputation of the officers concerned, and especially the brilliancy of the actual success, were allowed to cover all faults. The influence of her kinsman, the Lord Admiral, over the mind of the Queen, was one which daily increased in strength with her advance in age, according to a common remark respecting family attachments, and it will appear that he finally triumphed so completely over the accusations of his youthful adversary, as to ground on this very expedition his claim of advancement to a higher title. It was the darling hope of Essex that he might be authorised to lead without delay his flourishing and victorious army to the recovery of Calais, now held by a Spanish garrison, and he took some secret steps with the French ambassador in order to procure a request to this effect from Henry the Fourth to Elizabeth. But this king absolutely refused to allow the town to be recaptured by his ally, on the required condition of her retaining it at the peace as an ancient possession of the English crown. The Cecil party also opposed the design, and the disappointed general saw himself compelled to pause in the career of glory. It was not in the disposition of Essex to support these mortifications with the calmness which policy appeared to dictate, and Francis Bacon, alarmed at the courses which he saw the Earl pursuing, and already foreboding his eventual loss of the Queen's favour, and the ruin of those, himself included, who had placed their dependence on him, addressed to him a very remarkable letter of caution and remonstrance, not less characteristic of his own peculiar mind than illustrative of the critical situation of him to whom it was written. After appealing to the Earl himself for the advantage which he had lately received by following his own well-meant advice, in renewing with the Queen, quote, a treaty of obsequious kindness, which did much attemper a cold malignant humour then growing upon Her Majesty towards him, end quote, he repeats his counsel that he should, quote, win the Queen, end quote, adding, quote, if this be not the beginning of any other course, I see no end, and I will not now speak of favour or affection, but of other correspondence and agreeableness, which, when it shall be conjoined with the other of affection, I durst wager my life, that in you she will come to question of quid fiat omni quem rex volt honorare, but how is it now? A man of a nature not to be ruled, that hath the advantage of my affection and knoweth it, of an estate not grounded to his greatness, of a popular reputation, of a military dependence. I demand whether there can be a more dangerous image than this represented to any monarch living, much more to a lady, and of Her Majesty's apprehension and is it not more evident than demonstration itself that whilst this impression continueth in her majesty's breast you can find no other condition than inventions to keep your estate bare and low crossing and disgracing your actions extenuating and blasting of your merit carping with contempt at your nature and fashions breeding nourishing and fortifying such instruments as are most factious against you repulses and scorns of your friends and dependents that are true and steadfast winning and inveigling away from you such as are flexible and wavering thrusting you into odious employments and offices to supplant your reputation, abusing you and feeding you with dalliances and demonstrations to divert you from descending into the serious consideration of your own case, yea, and per case venturing you in perilous and desperate enterprises." With his usual exactness of method, he then proceeds to offer remedies for the five grounds of offences to Her Majesty here pointed out, amongst which the following are the most observable that he ought to ascribe any former and irrevocable instance of an ungovernable humour in him to dissatisfaction, and not to his natural temper, that though he sought to shun, and in some respects rightly, any imitation of Hatton or Leicester, 
he should yet allege them on occasion to the queen as authors and patterns because there was no readier means to make her think him in the right course that when his lordship happened in speeches to do her majesty right quote, for there is no such matter as flattery amongst you all end quote, he had rather the air of paying fine compliments than of speaking what he really thought quote, so that adds he a man may read your formality in your countenance end quote. whereas quote, it ought to be done familiarly and with an air of earnest end quote. that he should never be without some particulars on foot which he should seem to pursue with earnestness and affection and then let them fall upon taking knowledge of her majesty's opposition and dislike of which kind the weightiest might be if he offered to labour in the behalf of some whom he favoured for some of the places then void choosing such a subject as he thought her majesty likely to oppose a less weighty sort of particulars might be the pretence of some journeys which at her majesty's request his lordship might relinquish as if he should pretend a journey to see his estate towards wales or the like and the lightest sort of particulars which yet were not to be neglected were in his habits apparel wearings gestures and the like end quote. with respect to a quote unquote, military dependence which the writer regards as the most injurious impression respecting him of all he declares that he could not enough wonder that his lordship should say the wars were his occupation and go on in that course he greatly rejoiced indeed now it was over in his expedition to cadiz on account of the large share of honour which he had acquired and which would place him for many years beyond the reach of military competition besides that the disposal of places and other matters relating to the wars would of themselves flow into him as he increased in other greatness and preserve to him that dependence entire it was indeed a thing which considering the times and the necessity of the service he ought above all to retain but while he kept it in substance he should abolish it in shows to the queen who loved peace and did not love cost and on this account he could not so well approve of his affecting the place of earl marshal or of master of the ordnance on account of their affinity to a military greatness and rather recommend it to his seeking the peaceful profitable and courtly office of lord privy seal in the same manner with respect to the reputation of popularity which was a good thing in itself and one of the best flowers of his greatness both present and future the only way was to quench it verbis non rebus to take all occasions to declaim against popularity and popular courses to the queen and to tax them in all others yet for himself to go on as before in all his honourable commonwealth courses quote, and therefore says he i will not advise to cure this by dealing in monopolies or any oppressions end quote. the last and most curious article of all respects his quality of a favourite as separated from all the other matters it could not hurt so joined with them he observes that he'd made her majesty more fearful and captious as not knowing her own strength for this the only remedy was to give place to any other favourite to whom he should find her majesty inclined quote, so as the subject had no ill or dangerous aspect end quote, towards himself quote, for otherwise adds this politic adviser whoever shall tell me that you may not have singular use of a favourite at your devotion i will say he understandeth not the queen's affection nor your lordship's condition end quote. these crafty counsels which steadily pursued would have laid the enemy the court and the people and in effect the queen herself at the feet of a private nobleman seemed to have made considerable impression for the time on the mind of essex though the impetuosity of his temper joined to a spirit of sincerity honour and generosity which not even the pursuits of ambition and the occupations of a courtier could entirely quench soon caused him to break loose from their intolerable restraint francis bacon in furtherance of the plan which he had suggested to his patron of appearing to sink all other characters in that of a devoted servant of her majesty likewise condescended to employ his genius upon a device which was exhibited by the earl on the ensuing anniversary of her accession with great applause first his page entering the tilt-yard accosted her majesty in a fit speech and she in return graciously pulled off her glove and gave it to him some time after appeared the earl himself who was met by an ancient hermit a secretary of state and a soldier each of whom presented him with a book recommending his own course of life and after a little pageantry and dumb show to relieve the solemnity of the main design pronounced a long and well-penned speech to the same effect all were answered by an esquire or follower of the earl who pointed out the evils attached to each pursuit and concluded says our reporter quote, with an excellent but too plain english that this knight would never forsake his mistress's love whose virtue made all his thoughts divine whose wisdom taught him all true policy whose beauty and worth made him at all times fit to command armies he showed all the defects and imperfections of their times and therefore thought his own course of life to be best in serving his mistress the queen said that if she had thought there had been so much said of her 
she would not have been there that night, and so went to bed." These speeches may still be read, with mingled admiration and regret, amongst the immortal works of Francis Bacon. In majesty of diction and splendour of allusion they are excelled by none of his more celebrated pieces, and with such a weight of meaning are they fraught, that they who were ignorant of the serious purpose which he had in view might wonder at the prodigality of the author in employing massy gold and real gems, on an occasion which deserved nothing better than tinsel and false brilliance. That full justice might be done to the eloquence of the composition, the favourite part of the Esquire was supported by Toby Matthew, whose father was afterwards Archbishop of York, a man of singular and wayward disposition, whose prospects in life were totally destroyed by his subsequent conversion to popery, but whose talents and learning were held in such esteem by Bacon that he eagerly engaged his pen in the task of translating into Latin some of the most important of his own philosophical works. Such were the, quote, wits, besides his own, end quote, of which the munificent patronage of Essex had given him, quote, unquote, the command. A few miscellaneous occurrences of the years 1595 and 1596 remain to be noticed. The size of London, notwithstanding many proclamations and acts of Parliament prohibiting the erection of any new buildings, except on the site of old ones, had greatly increased during the reign of Elizabeth, and one of the first effects of its rapid growth was to render its streets less orderly and peaceful. The small houses newly erected in the suburbs, being crowded with poor, assembled from all quarters, thefts became frequent and a bad harvest having plunged the lower classes into deeper distress, tumults and outrages ensued. In June 1595 great disorders were committed on Tower Hill, and the multitude having insulted the Lord Mayor who went out to quell them, Elizabeth took the violent and arbitrary step of causing martial law to be proclaimed in her capital. Sir Thomas Wilford, appointed provost-marshal for the occasion, paraded the streets daily with a body of armed men, ready to hang all rioters in the most summary manner and five of these offenders suffered for high treason on Tower Hill, without resistance on the part of the people, or remonstrance on that of the Parliament, against so flagrant a violation of the dearest rights of Englishmen. Lord Hunsdon, the nearest kinsman of the Queen, whose character has been already touched upon, died in 1596. It is related that Elizabeth, on hearing of his illness, finally resolved to confer upon him the title of Earl of Wiltshire, to which he had some claim as nephew and heir male to Sir Thomas Boleyn, Her Majesty's grandfather, who had borne that dignity. She accordingly made him a gracious visit, and caused the patent and the robes of an earl to be brought and laid upon his bed. But the old man, preserving to the last the blunt honesty of his character, declared that if Her Majesty had accounted him unworthy of that honour while living, he accounted himself unworthy of it now that he was dying, and with this refusal he expired. Lord Willoughby succeeded him in the office of Governor of Berwick, and Lord Cobham, a wealthy but insignificant person of the party opposed to Essex, in that of Lord Chamberlain. Henry, third Earl of Huntington, of the family of Hastings, died about the same time. By his mother, eldest daughter and co-heiress of Henry Pole, Lord Montacute, he was the representative of the Clarence branch of the family of Plantagenet, but no pretensions of his had ever awakened anxiety in the house of Tudor. He was a person of mild disposition, greatly attached to the Puritan party, which, bound together by a secret compact, now formed a church within the church. He is said to have impaired his fortune by his bounty to the more zealous preachers, and he largely contributed by his will to the endowment of Emmanuel College, the puritanical character of which was now well known. Richard Fletcher, Bishop of London, quote, a comely and courtly prelate, end quote, who departed this life in the same year, affords a subject for a few remarks. It was a practice of the more powerful courtiers of that day, when the lands of a vacant see had excited, as they seldom failed to do, their cupidity to, quote, find out some men that had great minds and small means or merits, that would be glad to leave a small deanery to make a poor bishopric, by new leasing lands that were almost out of lease, end quote. And on these terms, which more conscientious churchmen disdained, Fletcher had taken the bishopric of Oxford, and had in due time been rewarded for his compliance, by translation first to Worcester, and afterwards to London. His talents and deportment pleased the Queen, and it is mentioned, as an indication of her special favour, that she once quarrelled with him for wearing too short a beard. But he afterwards gave her more serious displeasure by taking a wife, a gay and fair court lady of good quality, and he had scarcely pacified Her Majesty by the propitiary offering of a great entertainment at his house in Chelsea, when he was carried off by a sudden death, ascribed by his contemporaries to his immoderate use of the new luxury of smoking tobacco. This prelate was the father of Fletcher, the dramatic poet. Bishop Vaughan succeeded him, of whom Harrington gives the following trait, quote, He was an enemy to all supposed miracles, insomuch as one arguing with him in the closet at Greenwich in defence of them, 
and alleging the queen's healing of the evil for an instance asking him what he could say against it he answered that he was loath to answer arguments taken from the topic place of the cloth of estate but if they would urge him to answer he said his opinion was she did it by virtue of some precious stone in possession of the crown of england that had such a natural quality but had queen elizabeth been told that he ascribed more virtue to her jewels though she loved them well than to her person she would never have made him bishop of chester of the justice of the last remark there can be little question in this reign the royal pretension referred to was asserted with unusual earnestness and for good reasons as we learn from a different authority in fifteen ninety seven a quarto book appeared written in latin and dedicated to her majesty by one of her chaplains which contained a relation of the cures thus performed by her in which it is related that a catholic having been so healed went away persuaded that the pope's excommunication of her majesty was of no effect Quote, for if she had not by right obtained the sceptre of the kingdom and her throne established by the authority and appointment of god what she attempted could not have succeeded because the rule is that god is not anywhere witness to a lie End quote. such were the reasonings of that age it is probably to bishop vaughan also that sir john harrington refers in the following article of his brief notes quote, one sunday april last my lord of london preached to the queen's majesty and seemed to touch on the vanity of decking the body too finely her majesty told the ladies that if the bishop held more discourse on such matters she would fit him for heaven but he should walk thither without a staff and leave his mantle behind him perchance the bishop hath never sought her highness's wardrobe or he would have chosen another text End quote. End of chapter twenty five and of section forty two section forty three of memoirs of the court of queen elizabeth this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Memoirs of the Court of Queen Elizabeth, Volumes 1 and 2, by Lucy Aiken. Chapter 26, 1597 and 1598, Part 1. A fresh expedition against the Spaniards was in agitation from the beginning of this year, which occasioned many movements at court, and as usual disturbed the mind of the Queen with various perplexities. Her captious favour towards Essex, and the arts employed by him to gain his will on every contested point, are well illustrated in the letters of Roland White, to which we must again recur. On February 22nd he writes, quote, My lord of Essex kept his bed the most part of all yesterday, yet did one of his chamber tell me he could not weep for it, for he knew his lord was not sick. There is not a day passes that the queen sends not often to see him, and himself every day goeth privately to her. End quote. Two days after, he reports that, quote, my lord of Essex comes out of his chamber in his gown and nightcap. Full fourteen days his lordship kept in. Her majesty, as I heard, resolved to break him of his will, and to pull down his great heart, who found it a thing impossible, and says he holds it from the mother's side. But all is well again, and no doubt he will grow a mighty man in our state, end quote. The Earl of Cumberland made, quote, some doubt of his going to sea, end quote because lord thomas howard and raleigh were to be joined with him in equal authority the queen mentioned the subject to him and on his repeating to herself his refusal he was quote unquote, well chidden in march raleigh was busied in mediating a reconciliation between essex and robert cecil in which he was so far successful that a kind of compromise took place and henceforth court favours were shared without any open quarrels between their respective adherents the motives urged by Raleigh for this agreement were that it would benefit the country, that the Queen's quote-unquote continual unquietness would turn to contentment, and that public business would go on to the hurt of the common enemy. Essex, however, was malcontent at heart. He began to frequent certain meetings held in Blackfriars at the house of Lady Russell, a busy Puritan, who was one of the learned daughters of Sir Anthony Cook. Quote, wearied, says White, with not knowing how to please, he is not unwilling to listen to those motions made him for the public good. End quote. He was soon after so much offended with her majesty for giving the office of warden of the sink ports to his enemy Lord Cobham after he had asked for it himself that he was about to quit the court, but the queen sent for him and to pacify him made him master of the ordinance. It is mentioned about this time that the queen had of late quote, used the fair Mrs. Bridges with words and blows of anger. End quote. This young lady was one of the maids of honour and the same referred to in a subsequent letter, where it is said, quote, It is spied out by envy that the Earl of Essex is again fallen in love with his fairest bee, end quote. on which White observes, quote, It cannot choose but come to the Queen's ears, and then is he undone, and all that depend upon his favour. A striking indication of the nature of the sentiment 
which the aged sovereign cherished for her youthful favourite. In May our intelligencer writes thus, quote, Here hath been much ado between the Queen and the Lords about the preparation to see, some of them urging the necessity of setting it forward for her safety, but she opposing it by no danger appearing towards her anywhere, and that she will not make wars, but arm for defence understanding how much of her treasure was already spent in victual, both for ships and soldiers at land. She was extremely angry with them that made such haste in it, and at Burley for suffering it, seeing no greater occasion. No reason nor persuasion by some of the lords could prevail, but that Her Majesty hath commanded order to be given to stay all proceeding, and sent my lord Thomas Howard word that he should not go to sea. How Her Majesty may be wrought to fulfil the most earnest desire of some to have it go forward, time must make it known. End quote. But the reconciliation, whether sincere or otherwise, brought about by Raleigh between Essex and the Cecils, rendered at this time the war-party so strong that the scruples of the Queen were at length overruled, and a formidable armament was sent to sea, with the double object of destroying the Spanish ships in their harbours and intercepting their homeward-bound West India fleet. Essex was commander-in-chief by sea and land, Lord Thomas Howard and Raleigh vice and rear admirals. Lord Montjoy was lieutenant-general, Sir Francis Vere, marshal. Several young noblemen attached to Essex joined the expedition as volunteers, as Lord Rich, his brother-in-law, the Earl of Rutland, afterwards married to the daughter of the Countess of Essex by Sir Philip Sidney, Lord Cromwell, and the Earl of Southampton. The last, whose friendship for Essex afterwards hurried him into an enterprise still more perilous, appears to have been attracted to him by an extraordinary conformity of tastes and temper. Like Essex, he was brave and generous, but impetuous and somewhat inclined to arrogance. Like him, a munificent patron of the genius which he loved. Like his friend again, he received from Her Majesty tokens of peculiar favour, which she occasionally suspended on his giving indications of an ungovernable temper or too lofty spirit, and which she finally withdrew on his presuming to marry without that consent which to certain persons she could never have been induced to accord. This Earl of Southampton was grandson of that ambitious and assuming but able and diligent statesman Lord Chancellor Risley, appointed by Henry the Eighth one of his executors. He was father of the virtuous Southampton Lord Treasurer, and by him grandfather of the heroical and ever-memorable Rachel, Lady Russell. A storm drove the ill-fated armament back to Plymouth, where it remained wind-bound for a month, and Essex and Raleigh posted together up to court for fresh instructions. Having concerted their measures, they made sail for the Azores, and Raleigh, with his division arriving first, attacked and captured the Isle of Fayal, without waiting for his admiral. Essex was incensed, and there were not wanting those about him who applied themselves to fan the flame, and even urged him to bring Sir Walter to a court-martial. But he refused, and his anger soon evaporating, Lord Thomas Howard was enabled to accommodate the difference, and the rivals returned to the appearance of friendship. Essex was destitute of the naval skill requisite for the prosperous conduct of such an enterprise. Owing partly to his mistakes, and partly to several thwarting circumstances, the West India fleet escaped him, and three rich Havana ships, which served to defray most of the expenses, were the only trophies of his island voyage, from which himself and the nation had anticipated results so glorious. The Queen received him with manifest dissatisfaction. His severity towards Raleigh was blamed, and it was evident that matters tended to involve him in fresh differences with Robert Cecil. During his absence the Lord Admiral had been advanced to the dignity of Earl of Nottingham, and he now discovered that by a clause in the patent this honour was declared to be conferred upon him in consideration of his good service at the taking of Cadiz, an action of which Essex claimed to himself the whole merit. To make the injury greater, this title, conjoined to the office of Lord High Admiral, gave the new earl precedency of all others of the same rank, Essex amongst the rest. To such complicated mortifications his proud spirit disdained to submit, and after challenging without effect to single combat the Lord Admiral himself or any of his sons who would take up the quarrel, the indignant favourite retired a sullen malcontent to Wanstead House, feigning himself sick. This expedient acted on the heart of the Queen with all its wonted force. She showed the utmost concern for his situation, chid the Cecils for wronging him, and soon after made him compensation for the act which had wounded him, by admitting his claim to the hereditary office of Earl Marshal, with which he was solemnly invested in December 1597, and in right of it once more took place above the Lord Admiral. It was during this summer that the arrogant deportment of a Polish ambassador, sent to complain of an invasion of neutral rights and the interruption given by the English navy to the trade of his master's subjects with Spain, 
gave occasion to a celebrated display of the spirit and the erudition of the queen of england speed the ablest of our chroniclers gives at length her extemporal latin reply to his harangue adding in his quaint but expressive phrase that she quote, thus lion-like rising daunted the malapert orator no less with her stately port and majestical departure than with the tartness of her princely checks and turning to the train of her attendants thus said god's death my lords for that was her oath ever in anger i have been enforced this day to scour up my old latin that hath lain long in rusting End quote. the same author mentions that the king of denmark having by his ambassador offered to mediate between england and spain the queen declined the overture adding quote, i would have the king of denmark and all princes christian and heathen to know that england hath no need to crave peace nor myself endured one hour's fear since i attained the crown thereof being guarded with so valiant and faithful subjects End quote. such was the lofty tone which elizabeth to the end of her days maintained towards foreign powers none of whom had she cause to dread or motive to court yet her cheerfulness and fortitude were at the same time on the point of sinking under the harassing disquietudes of a petty war supported against her by an irish chief of rebels the head of the sept o'neill which she had in vain endeavoured to attach permanently to her interests by conferring upon him the dignity of earl of tyrone had now for some years persevered in a resistance to her authority which the most strenuous efforts of the civil and military governors of this turbulent and miserable island had proved inadequate to overcome that brave officer sir john norris then general of ulster had found it necessary to grant terms to the rebel whom he would gladly have brought in bonds to the feet of his sovereign but the treaty thus made this perfidious barbarian according to his custom observed only till the english forces were withdrawn and he saw the occasion favourable to rise again in arms lord borough whom the queen had appointed deputy in fifteen ninety eight on which sir john morris appointed to act under him died as it is thought of chagrin began his career with a vigorous attack, by which he carried, though not without considerable loss, the fort of Blackwater, the only place of strength possessed by the rebels. But before he was able to pursue further his success, death overtook him, and the government was committed for a time to the Earl of Ormond. Tyrone, nothing daunted, laid siege in his turn to Blackwater, and Sir Henry Bagnall, with the flower of the English army being sent to relieve it, sustained the most signal defeat ever experienced by an English force in Ireland the commander himself, several captains of distinction, and fifteen hundred men were left on the field, and the fort immediately surrendered to the rebel chief, who now vauntingly declared that he would accept of no terms from the Queen of England, being resolved to remain in arms till the King of Spain should send forces to his assistance. Such was the alarming position of affairs in this island at the conclusion of the year 1598. At home several incidents had intervened to claim attention the king of france had received from spain proposals for a peace which the exhausted state of his country would not permit him to neglect and he had used his utmost endeavours to persuade his allies the queen of england and the united provinces to enter into the negotiations for a general pacification but philip the second still refused to acknowledge the independence of his revolted subjects the only basis on which the new republic would condescend to treat elizabeth besides that she disdained to desert those whom she had so long and so zealously supported was in no haste to terminate a war from which she and her subjects anticipated honour with little peril, and plunder which would more than repay its expenses, and both from England and Holland agents were sent to remonstrate with Henry against the breach of treaty which he was about to commit by the conclusion of a separate peace. Elizabeth wrote to admonish him that the true sin against the Holy Ghost was ingratitude, of which she had so much right to accuse him, that fidelity to engagements was the first of duties and of virtues and that union, according to the ancient apologue of the bundle of rods, was the source of strength. But to all her eloquence and all her invectives Henry had to oppose the necessity of his affairs, and the Treaty of Vervins was concluded, but not without some previous stipulations on the part of the French king which softened considerably the resentment of his ally. Of the commissioners named by Elizabeth to arrange this business with Henry, Robert Cecil was the chief, who held before his departure many private conferences with Essex, and would not move from court till he had bound him by favours and promises to do him no injury by promoting his enemies in his absence. The Earl of Southampton, having given some offence to Her Majesty, for which she had ordered him to absent himself a while from court, took the opportunity to obtain licence to travel, and attended the secretary to France, perhaps in the character of a spy upon his motions on behalf of Essex, who seems to have prepared him for the service by much private instruction. Quote, I acquainted you, says Roland White to his correspondent, with the care had to bring my lady of Leicester to the Queen's presence. It was often granted, 
and she brought to the privy galleries, but the Queen found some occasion not to come. Upon Shrove Monday the Queen was persuaded to go to Mr. Controller's at the tilt-end, and there was my Lady of Leicester with a fair jewel of three hundred pounds. A great dinner was prepared by my Lady Chandos, the Queen's coach ready, and all the world expecting Her Majesty's coming, when upon a sudden she resolved not to go, and so sent word. My Lord of Essex, that had kept his chamber all the day before, in his nightgown, went up to the Queen the privy way, but all would not prevail, and as yet my Lady Leicester hath not seen the Queen. It hath been better not moved, for my Lord of Essex, by importuning the Queen in these unpleasing matters, loses the opportunity he might take to do good unto his ancient friends." But on March 2nd he adds, quote, My Lady Leicester was at court, kissed the Queen's hand and her breast, and did embrace her, and the Queen kissed her. My Lord of Essex is in exceeding favour here. Lady Leicester departed from court exceedingly contented, but being desirous again to come to kiss the Queen's hand, it was denied, and as I heard, some wanted unkind words given out against her." End quote. This extraordinary height of royal favour was not merely the precursor, but by the arrogant presumption with which it inspired him, a principal cause of Essex's decline, which was now fast approaching. Confident in the affections of Elizabeth, he suffered himself to forget that she was still his queen, and still a tutor. He often neglected the attentions which would have gratified her. On any occasional cause of ill-humour, he would drop slighting expressions respecting her age and person, which, if they reached her ear, could never be forgiven. On one memorable instance he treated her with indignity openly and in her presence. A dispute had arisen between them in the presence of the Admiral, the Secretary, and the Clerk of the Signet, respecting the choice of a commander for Ireland, the Queen resolving to send Sir William Knowles, the uncle of Essex, while he vehemently supported Sir George Carew, because this person, who was haughty and boastful, had given him some offence, and he wanted to remove him out of his way. Unable either by argument or persuasion to prevail over the resolute will of Her Majesty, the favourite at last forgot himself so far as to turn his back upon her with a laugh of contempt, an outrage which she revenged after her own manner, by boxing his ears and bidding him, quote, go and be hanged, end quote. This retort so inflamed the blood of Essex that he clapped his hand on his sword, and while the Lord Admiral hastened to throw himself between them, he swore that not from Henry the Eighth himself would he have endured such an indignity, and foaming with rage he rushed out of the palace. His sincere friend, the Lord Keeper, immediately addressed to him a prudential letter, urging him to lose no time in seeking with humble submissions the forgiveness of his offended mistress. But Essex replied to these well-intentioned admonitions by a letter which, amid all the choler that it betrays, must still be applauded both for its eloquence and for a manliness of sentiment of which few other public characters of the age appear to have been capable. The Lord Keeper in his letter had strongly urged the religious duty of absolute submission on the part of a subject to everything that his sovereign, justly or unjustly, should be pleased to lay upon him, to which the Earl thus replies, quote, But, say you, I must yield and submit. I can neither yield myself to be guilty, or this imputation laid upon me to be just. I owe so much to the author of all truth, as I can never yield falsehood to be truth, or truth to be falsehood. Have I given cause, ask you, and take scandal when I have done? No, I gave no cause to take so much as Fimbria's complaint against me, for I did totum tellum corpore recipere. I patiently bear all, and sensibly feel all, that I then received, when this scandal was given me. Nay, more, when the vilest of all indignities are done unto me, doth religion enforce me to sue? Or doth God require it? Is it impiety not to do it? What, cannot princes err? Cannot subjects receive wrong? Is an earthly power or authority infinite? Pardon me, pardon me, my good lord, I can never subscribe to these principles. Let Solomon's fool laugh when he is stricken. Let those that mean to make their profit of princes show to have no sense of princes' injuries. Let them acknowledge an infinite absoluteness on earth that do not believe in an absolute infiniteness in heaven. As for me, I have received wrong, and feel it. My cause is good. I know it. And whatsoever come, all the powers on earth can never show more strength than constancy in oppressing, than I can show in suffering whatsoever can or shall be imposed upon me, etc. Several other friends of Essex, his mother, his sister, and the Earl of Northumberland, her husband, urged him in like manner to return to his attendance at court, and seek Her Majesty's forgiveness, while she, on her part, secretly uneasy at his absence, permitted certain persons to go to him as from themselves, and suggest terms of accommodation. Sir George Carew was made Lord President of Munster, and Sir William Knowles, who perhaps had not desired the appointment, assured his nephew of his earnest wish to serve him. Finally, this great quarrel was made up, we scarcely know how, and Essex appeared as powerful at court as ever. 
though some have believed and with apparent reason that from this time the sentiments of the queen for her once cherished favourite partook more of fear than of love and that confidence was never re-established between them this celebrated dispute appears to have been in some manner mingled or connected with the important question of peace or war with spain which had previously been debated with extreme earnestness between essex and burleigh the former who still thirsted for military distinction contended with the utmost vehemence of invective for the maintenance of perpetual hostility against the power of philip while the latter urged that he was now sufficiently humbled to render an accommodation both safe and honourable wearied and disgusted at length with the violence of his young antagonist the hoary minister in whom quote, old experience did attain to something like prophetic strain end quote, drew forth a prayer-book and with awful significance pointed to the text quote, men of blood shall not live out half their days end quote. but the clamour for war prevailed over the pleadings of humanity and prudence and it was left for the unworthy successor of elizabeth to patch up in haste an inconsiderate and ignoble peace in place of the solid and advantageous one which the wisdom of elizabeth and her better counsellor might at this time with ease have concluded the lord treasurer enjoyed however the satisfaction of completing for his mistress an agreement with the states of holland which provided in a satisfactory manner for the repayment of the sums which he had advanced to them and exonerated her from a considerable portion of the annual expense which she had hitherto incurred in their defence this was the last act of lord burleigh's life which terminated by a long and gradual decay on august fourth fifteen ninety eight in the seventy eighth year of his age on the character of this great minister identified as it is with that of the government of elizabeth during a period of no less than forty years a few additional remarks may here suffice good sense was the leading feature of his intellect moderation of his temper his native quickness of apprehension was supported by a wonderful force and steadiness of application and by an exemplary spirit of order his morals were regular, his sense of religion habitual, profound, and operative. In his declining age, harassed by diseases and cares, and saddened by the loss of a beloved wife, the worthy sharer of his inmost counsels, he became peevish and irascible, but his heart was good. In all the domestic relations he was indulgent and affectionate. In his friendships tender and faithful, nor could he be accused of pride, of treachery, or of vindictiveness rising as he did by the strength of his own merits unaided by birth or connections he seems to have early formed the resolution more prudent indeed than generous of attaching himself to no political leader so closely as to be entangled in his fall thus he deserted his earliest patron protector somerset on a change of fortune and is even said to have drawn the articles of impeachment against him he extricated himself with adroitness from the ruin of northumberland by whom he had been much employed and trusted and at some expense of protestant consistency contrived to escape persecution though not to hold office under the rule of mary towards the queen his mistress his demeanour was obsequious to the brink of servility he seems on no occasion to have hesitated on the execution of any of her commands and the kind of tacit compromise by which he and leicester in spite of their mutual animosity were enabled for so long a course of years to hold divided empire in the cabinet could not have been maintained without a general acquiescence on the part of burleigh in the various malversations and oppressions of that guilty minion another accusation brought against him is that of taking money for ecclesiastical preferments of the truth of this charge sufficient evidence might be brought from original documents but an apologist would urge with justice that his royal mistress who virtually delegated to him the most laborious duties of the office of head of the church both expected and desired that emolument should thence accrue to him and to the persons under him Thus we find it stated that Bishop Fletcher had, quote, bestowed in allowances and gratifications to diverse attendants about Her Majesty, since his preferment to the See of London, the sum of thirty-one hundred pounds or thereabouts, which money was given by him, for the most part of it, by Her Majesty's direction and special appointment, end quote. The ministers of a sovereign who scrupled not to accept of bribes from parties engaged in lawsuits for the exertion of her own interest with her judges, could scarcely be expected to exhibit much delicacy on this head in fact the venality of the court of elizabeth was so gross that no public character appears even to have professed a disdain of the influence of gifts and bribes and we find lord burleigh inserting the following among rules moral and prudential drawn up for the use of his son robert when young quote, be sure to keep some great man thy friend but trouble him not for trifles compliment him often present him with many yet small gifts and of little charge and if thou have cause to bestow any great gratuity let it be some such thing as may be daily in his sight. Otherwise, in this ambitious age, thou shalt remain as a hop without a pole. Live in obscurity, and be made a football for every insulting companion. 
End quote. In his office of Lord Treasurer, this minister is allowed to have behaved with perfect integrity and to have permitted no oppression on the subject, wisely and honourably maintaining that nothing could be for the advantage of a sovereign which in any way injured his reputation. His conduct in this high post, added to a general opinion of his prudence and virtue, caused his death to be sincerely deplored, and his memory to be constantly held in higher esteem by the people than that of any former minister of any English prince. Elizabeth was deeply sensible that to her the loss of such a servant, counsellor and friend, was indeed irreparable. Contrary to her custom, she wept much, and retired for a time from all company, and it is said that to the end of her life she could never hear or pronounce his name without tears. Although she was not sufficiently mistress of herself in those fits of rage to which she was occasionally liable, to refrain from treating him with a harshness and contempt which sometimes moved the old man even to weeping, her behaviour towards him satisfactorily evinced on the whole her deep sense of his fidelity and various merits as a minister, and her affection for him as a man. He was perhaps the only person of humble birth whom she condescended to honour with the garter. She constantly made him sit in her presence, on account of his being troubled with the gout, and would pleasantly tell him, quote, "'My lord, we make much of you, not for your bad legs, but for your good head.'" In his occasional fits of melancholy and retirement, she would woo him back to her presence by kind and playful letters, and she absolutely refused to accept of the resignation which his bodily infirmities led him to tender two or three years before his death. She constantly visited him when confined by sickness. On one of these occasions, being admonished by his attendant to stoop as she entered at his chamber door, she replied, quote, "'For your master's sake I will, though not for the King of Spain.'" His lady was much in Her Majesty's favour, and frequently in attendance on her and it has been surmised that her husband found her an important auxiliary in maintaining his influence. Elizabeth had the weakness, frequent among princes, and not unusual with private individuals, of hating her heir, a sentiment which gained ground upon her daily, in proportion as the infirmities of age admonished her of her approach towards the destined limit of her long and splendid course. Notwithstanding the respectful observances by which James exerted himself to disguise his impatience for her death, particular incidents occurred from time to time to aggravate her suspicion and exasperate her animosity. And the present year was productive of some remarkable circumstances of this nature. The Queen had long been displeased at the indulgence exercised by the King of Scots towards certain Catholic noblemen, by whom a treasonable correspondence had been carried on with Spain, and a very dangerous conspiracy formed against his person and government. Such misplaced lenity, combined with certain negotiations which he carried on with the Catholic princes of Europe, she regarded as evincing a purpose to secure to himself an interest with the popish party in england as well as scotland which she could not view without anxiety and her worst apprehensions were now confirmed by the information which reached her from two different quarters that james in a very respectful letter to the pope had given him assurance under his own hand of his resolution to treat his catholic subjects with indulgence at the same time requesting that his holiness would give a cardinal's hat to drummond bishop of Bezon. Almost at the same time, one Valentine Thomas, apprehended in London for a theft, accused the King of Scots of some evil designs against herself. Explanations, however, being demanded, James solemnly disavowed the letter to the Pope, which he treated as a forgery and imposture, though circumstances which came out several years afterwards render the King's veracity in this point very questionable. To the charge brought by Thomas, he returned a denial, probably better founded, and required that the accuser should be arraigned in presence of some commissioner whom he should send. But Elizabeth, less jealous of his dealings with the papal party, now that she no longer dreaded a Spanish invasion, judged it more prudent to bury the whole matter in silence, and resumed, in the tone of friendship, the correspondence which she regularly maintained with her kinsmen. End of section 43《This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Memoirs of the Court of Queen Elizabeth, Volumes 1 and 2, by Lucy Aiken. Chapter 26, 1597 and 1598, Part 2. This correspondence, which still exists in the manuscript in the Salisbury Collection, is rendered obscure and sometimes unintelligible by its reference to verbal messages which the bearers of the letters were commissioned to deliver but several of those of Elizabeth afford a rich display of character. She sometimes assures James of the tenderness of her affection, and her disinterested zeal for his welfare, in that tone of hypocrisy which was too congenial to her disposition. At other times she breaks forth into vehement invective against the weakness and mutability of his counsels, 
and offers him excellent instructions in the art of reigning but clouded by her usual uncouth and obscure phraseology and rendered offensive by their harsh and dictatorial style when she regards herself as personally injured by any part of his conduct her complaints are seasoned with an equal portion of menace and contempt as in the following specimen queen elizabeth to the king of scots Quote, when the first blast of a strange unused and seld heard of sound had pierced my ears i supposed that flying fame who with swift quills oft paceth with the worst had brought report of some untruth but when too too many records in your open parliament were witnesses of such pronounced words not more to my disgrace than to your dishonour who did forget that above all other regard a prince's word ought utter naught of any much less of a king than such as to which truth might say amen but you neglecting all care of yourself what danger of reproach besides somewhat else might light upon you have chosen so unseemly a theme to charge your only careful friend withal of such matter as were you not amazed in all senses could not have been expected at your hands of such imagined untruths as were never thought of in our time and do wonder what evil spirits have possessed you to set forth so infamous devices void of any show of truth i am sorry that you have so wilfully fallen from your best stay and will needs throw yourself into the hurlpool of bottomless discredit was the haste so great to hide to such opprobry as that you would pronounce a never thought of action afore you had but asked the question of her that best could tell it i see well we two be of very different natures for i vow to god i would not corrupt my tongue with an unknown report of the greatest foe i have much less could i detract my best deserving friend with a spot so foul as scarcely may be ever outraised could you root the desire of gifts of your subjects upon no better ground than this quagmire which to pass you scarcely may without the slip of your own disgrace shall ambassage be sent to foreign princes laden with instructions of your rash advised charge i never yet loved you so little as not to moan your infamous dealings which you are in mind we see that myself shall possess more princes witness of my causeless injuries which i should have wished had passed no seas to testify such memorials of your wrongs bethink you of such dealings and set your labour upon such men's as best may though not right yet salve some piece of this overslip and be assured that you deal with such a king as will bear no wrongs and endure infamy the examples have been so lately seen as they can hardly be forgotten of a far mightier and potenter prince than any europe hath look you not therefore that without large amends i may or will slupper up such indignities we have sent this bearer bows whom you may safely credit to signify such particularities as fits not a letter's talk and so i recommend you to a better mind and more advised conclusions End quote. dated january fourth fifteen ninety seven fifteen ninety eight from another of these letters we learn that james had addressed a love sonnet to the queen and complained of her having taken no notice of it reminding her that cupid was a god of a most impatient disposition an author has the following notice respecting sir roger aston frequently the bearer of these curious epistles quote, he was an englishman born but had his breeding wholly in scotland and had served the king many years as his barber an honest and free-hearted man and of an ancient family in cheshire but of no breeding answerable to his birth yet was he the only man ever employed as a messenger from the king to queen elizabeth as a letter-carrier only which expressed their own intentions without any help from him besides the delivery but even in that capacity was in very good esteem with her majesty and received very royal rewards which did enrich him and gave him a better revenue than most gentlemen in scotland for the queen did find him as faithful to her as to his master in which he showed much wisdom though of no breeding in this his employment i must not pass over one pretty passage i have heard himself relate that he did never come to deliver any letters from his master but ever he was placed in the lobby the hangings being turned towards him where he might see the queen dancing to a little fiddle which was to no other end than that he should tell his master by her youthful disposition how likely he was to come to the possession of the crown he so much thirsted after for you must understand the wisest in that kingdom did believe the king should never enjoy this crown as long as there was an old wife in england which they did believe we ever set up as the other was dead End quote. though in her own letters to james elizabeth made no scruple of treating him as the destined heir to her throne she still resisted with as much pertinacity as ever all the proposals made her for publicly declaring her successor and on this subject a lively anecdote is related by sir john harrington in his account of hutton archbishop of york which must belong to the year fifteen ninety five or fifteen ninety six i no sooner says he remember this famous and worthy prelate 
but methinks I see him in the chapel at Whitehall, Queen Elizabeth at the window in the closet, all the lords of the Parliament, spiritual and temporal, about them, and then, after his three curtsies, that I hear him out of the pulpit, thundering this text, The kingdoms of the earth are mine, and I do give them to whom I will, and I have given them to Nebuchodonosor and his son, and his son's son. Which text, when he had thus produced, taking the sense rather than words of the prophet, there followed first so general a murmur of one friend whispering to another, then such an erected countenance in those that had none to speak to, lastly so quiet a silence and attention in expectance of some strange doctrine, where text itself gave away kingdoms and sceptres, as I have never observed before or since. But he showed how there were two special causes of translating of kingdoms, the fullness of time and the ripeness of sin. Then coming nearer home, he showed how oft our nation had been a prey to foreigners, at first when we were all Britons subdued by these Romans, then when the fullness of time and ripeness of our sin required it, subdued by the Saxons, after this a long time prosecuted and spoiled by the Danes, finally conquered and reduced to perfect subjection by the Normans, whose posterity continued in great prosperity to the days of Her Majesty, who for peace, for plenty, for glory, for continuance, had exceeded them all, that had lived to change all her counsellors but one, all officers twice or thrice, some bishops four times, only the uncertainty of succession gave hopes to foreigners to attempt fresh invasions, and breed fears in many of her subjects of a new conquest. The only way, then, said he, that is in policy left to quail those hopes and to assuage those fears, were to establish the succession. At last, insinuating as far as he durst the nearness of blood of our present sovereign, he said plainly that the expectations and presages of all writers went northward, naming without any circumlocution Scotland, which, said he, if it prove an error, yet will it be found a learned error. When he had finished this sermon, there was no man that knew Queen Elizabeth's disposition, but imagined that such a speech was as welcome as salt to the eyes, or, to use her own word, to pin up her winding-sheet before her face, so to point out her successor and urge her to declare him, wherefore we all expected that she would not only have been highly offended, but in some present speech have showed her displeasure. It is a principle not to be despised. Qui nesit dissimulare nesit regnare. She considered, perhaps, the extraordinary auditory, she supposed many of them were of his opinion. She might suspect some of them had persuaded him to this motion. Finally, she ascribed so much to his years, to his place, to his learning, that when she opened the window we found ourselves all deceived, for very kindly and calmly, without show of offence, as if she had but waked out of some sleep, she gave him thanks for his very learned sermon. Yet when she had better considered the matter, and recollected herself in private, she sent two counsellors to him with a sharp message, to which he was glad to give a patient answer. The premature death of Edmund Spencer, under circumstances of severe distress, now called forth the universal commiseration and regret of the friends and patrons of English genius. After witnessing the plunder of his house and the destruction of his whole property by the Irish rebels, the unfortunate poet had fled to England for shelter. The annuity of fifty pounds which he enjoyed as poet laureate to Her Majesty, apparently his sole resource and having taken up his melancholy abode in an obscure lodging in London, he pined away under the pressure of penury and despondence. The genius of this great poet, formed on the most approved models of the time, and exercised upon themes peculiarly congenial to its taste, received in all its plenitude that homage of contemporary applause which has sometimes failed to reward the efforts of the noblest masters of the lyre. The adventures of chivalry, and the dim shadowings of moral allegory, were almost equally the delight of a romantic, a serious, and a learned age. It was also a point of loyalty to admire in Gloriana, Queen of Fairy, or in the Empress Mercilla, the avowed types of the graces and virtues of Her Majesty, and she herself had discernment sufficient to distinguish between the brazen trump of vulgar flattery with which her ear was sated, and the pastoral reed of antique frame tuned sweetly to her praise by Colin Clout. Spencer was interred with great solemnity in Westminster Abbey by the side of Chaucer the generous Essex defraying the cost of the funeral, and walking himself as a mourner. That ostentatious but munificent woman, Anne, Countess of Dorset, Pembroke, and Montgomery, erected a handsome monument to his memory several years afterwards. The brother poets who attended his obsequies threw elegies and sonnets into the grave, and of the more distinguished votaries of the muse in that day, there was scarcely one who has withheld his tribute to the fame and merit of this delightful author." Shakespeare, in one of his sonnets, had already testified his high delight in his works. Joseph Hall, afterwards eminent as a bishop, 
a preacher and polemic but at this time a young student of emmanuel college has more than one complimentary allusion to the poems of spenser in his toothless satires printed in fifteen ninety seven thus in the invocation to his first satire referring to spenser's description of the marriage of the thames and medway he inquires quote, what baser muse can bide to sit and sing by granta's naked side they haunt the tided thames and salt medway ere since the fame of their late bridal day not have we here but willow-shaded shore to tell our grant his banks are left forlorn and again in ridiculing the imitation of some of the more extravagant fictions of the orlando furioso he thus suddenly checks himself quote, but let no rebel satire dare traduce the eternal legends of thy fairy muse renowned spencer whom no earthly wight dares once to emulate much less dares despite salust of france and tuscan ariost yield up the laurel garland ye have lost these pieces of hall reprinted in fifteen ninety nine with three additional books under the uncouth title of virgidimiarum or a harvest of rods present the earliest example in our language of regular satire on the ancient model and have gained from an excellent poetical critic the following high elogium quote, these satires are marked with a classical precision to which english poetry had yet rarely attained they are replete with animation of style and sentiment the indignation of the satirist is always the result of good sense nor are the thorns of severe invective unmixed with the flowers of pure poetry the characters are delineated in strong and lively colouring and their discriminations are touched with the masterly traces of genuine humour. The versification is equally energetic and elegant, and the fabric of the couplets approaches to the modern standard. A few of his allusions to reigning follies may here be quoted. Contrasting the customs of our barbarous ancestors with those of his own times, he says, quote, They naked went, or clad in ruder hide, or homespun russet void of foreign pride. But thou canst mask in garish gaudery, to suit a fool's far-fetched livery a french head joined to neck italian thy thighs from germany and breast from spain an englishman in none a fool in all many in one and one in several shakespeare makes portia satirize the same affectation in her english admirer quote, how oddly he is suited i think he bought his doublet in italy his round hose in france his bonnet in germany and his behaviour everywhere other contemporary writers have similar allusions and it may be concluded that the passion for travelling then and ever since so prevalent amongst the english youth was fast eradicating all traces of a national costume by rendering fashionable the introduction of novel garments capriciously adopted by turns from every country of europe quote unquote, cadiz spoil is more than once referred to by hall and amongst expedients for raising a fortune he enumerates with a satirical glance at sir walter raleigh the trading to guyana for gold as also the search of the philosopher's stone he likewise ridicules the costly mineral elixirs of marvellous virtues vended by alchemical quacks and with sounder sense in this point than usually belonged to his age mocks at the predictions of judicial astrology in several passages he reprehends the new luxuries of the time among which coaches are not forgotten it should appear that the increasing conveniences and pleasures of a london life had already begun to occasion the desertion of rural mansions and the decay of that boundless hospitality which the former possessors had made their boast for thus feelingly and beautifully does the poet describe the desolation of one of these seats of antiquated magnificence quote, beat the broad gates a goodly hollow sound with double echoes doth again rebound but not a dog doth bark to welcome thee nor churlish porter canst thou chafing see all dumb and silent like the dead of night or dwelling of some sleepy sybarite the marble pavement hid with desert weed with house-leek thistle dock and hemlock seed look to the towered chimneys which should be the windpipes of good hospitality lo there the unthankful swallow takes her rest and fills the tunnel with her circled nest the translation of the orlando furioso through which that singular work of genius had just become known to the english reader was executed by sir john harrington the same who afterwards composed for henry prince of wales the brief view of the english church the godson of elizabeth and the child of her faithful servants james harrington and isabella markham after the usual course of school and college education young harrington who was born in fifteen sixty one presented himself at court where his wit and learning soon procured him a kind of distinction which was not however unattended with danger a satirical piece was traced to him as its author containing certain allusions to living characters 
which gave so much offence to the courtiers that he was threatened with the animadversions of the star-chamber but the secret favour of elizabeth towards a godson whom she loved and who amused her saved him from this very serious kind of retaliation a tale which he some time after translated out of ariosto proved very entertaining to the court ladies and soon met the eyes of the queen who in affected displeasure at certain indelicate passages ordered him to appear no more at court till he had translated the whole poem the command was obeyed with alacrity and he speedily committed his orlando to the press with a dedication to her majesty before this time our sprightly poet had found means to dissipate a considerable portion of the large estate to which he was born and being well inclined to listen to the friendly counsels of essex who bade him quote, lay good hold on her majesty's bounty and ask freely end quote he dexterously opened his case by the following lines slipped behind her cushion quote, for ever dear for ever dreaded prince you read a verse of mine a little since and so pronounced each word and every letter your gracious reading graced my verse the better sith then your highness doth by gift exceeding make what you read the better for your reading let my poor muse your pains thus far importune like as you read my verse so read my fortune from your highness's saucy godson end quote of the further progress of his suit and the various little arts of pleasing to which harrington now applied himself some amusing hints may be gathered out of the following extracts taken from a notebook kept by himself quote, i am to send good store of news from the country for her highness entertainment her highness loveth merry tales quote, the queen stood up and bade me reach forth my arm to rest her thereon oh what sweet burden to my next song petrarch shall eke out good matter for this business quote, the queen loveth to see me in my new frieze jerkin, and saith tis well enough cut. I will have another maid likened to it. I do remember she spit on Sir Matthew's fringed cloth, and said the fool's wit was gone to rags. Heaven spare me from such jibing. Quote, I must turn my poor wits towards my suit for the lands in the north. I must go in an early hour, before Her Majesty has special matters brought up to council on. I must go before the breakfast covers are placed, and stand uncovered as Her Highness cometh forth her chamber then kneel and say god save your majesty i crave your ear at what hour may suit for your servant to meet your blessed countenance thus will i gain her favour to follow to the auditory quote, trust not a friend to do or say in that yourself can sue or pray End quote. the lands alluded to in the last extract formed a large estate in the north of england which an ancestor of harrington had forfeited by his adherence to the house of york during the civil wars and which he was now endeavouring to recover this further mention of the business occurs in one of his letters. Quote, Yet I will adventure to give Her Majesty five hundred pounds in money, and some pretty jewel or garment, as you shall advise, only praying Her Majesty to further my suit with some of her learned counsel, which I pray you to find some proper time to move in. This some hold is a dangerous adventure, but five and twenty manners do well justify my trying it. End quote. How notorious must have been the avarice and venality of a sovereign, before such a mode of ensuring success in a lawsuit could have entered into the imagination of a courtier. But the fortunes of Harrington, as of persons of more importance, now become involved in the state of Irish affairs, to which the attention of the reader must immediately be directed. End of chapter 26 End of section 44section forty five of memoirs of the court of queen elizabeth this librivox recording is in the public domain memoirs of the court of queen elizabeth volumes one and two by lucy aiken chapter twenty seven fifteen ninety nine to sixteen o three part one the death in september fifteen ninety eight of philip the second and the succession of the feeble philip the third under whom the spanish monarchy advanced with accelerated steps towards its decline had finally released the queen from all apprehensions of foreign invasion and left her at liberty to turn her whole attention to the pacification of ireland the state of that island was in every respect deplorable the whole province of ulster in open rebellion under tyrone the rest of the country only waiting for the succours from the pope and the king of spain which the credulous natives were still taught to expect to join openly in the revolt and in the meantime reduced to such a state of despair by innumerable oppressions and by the rumour of further severities meditated by the queen of england that it seemed prepared to oppose the most obstinate resistance to every measure of government in what manner and by whom this wretched province should be brought back to its allegiance had been the subject of frequent and earnest debates in the privy council in which essex had vehemently reprobated the conduct of former governors in wasting time on inferior objects 
instead of first undertaking the reduction of Tyrone, and appears to have spared no pains to impress the Queen with an opinion of the superior justness of his own views of the subject. Elizabeth believed, and with reason, that she discovered in Lord Montjoy talents not unequal to the arduous office of Lord Deputy at so critical a juncture, but when the greater part of her council appeared to concur in the choice, Essex insinuated a variety of objections, that the experience of Montjoy in military affairs was small, that neither in the Low Countries nor in Bretagne, where he had served, had he attained to any principal or independent command, that his retainers were few or none, his purse inadequately furnished for the first expenses of so high an appointment, and that he was too much addicted to a sedentary and studious life. By this artful enumeration of the deficiencies of Montjoy, he was clearly understood to intimate his own superior fitness for the office. The Queen, notwithstanding certain suspicions, which had been infused into her of danger in committing to Essex the command of an army, and notwithstanding the unwillingness which she still felt to deprive herself of his presence, appears to have adopted with eagerness this suggestion of her favourite, for she held in high estimation both his talents and his good fortune. Montjoy promptly retired from a competition in which he must be unsuccessful. The adherents of the Earl, except a few of the more sagacious, eagerly forwarded his appointment with imprudent eulogiums of his valour and his genius, and still more imprudent anticipations of his certain and complete success. His enemies, desirous of his absence and hopeful of his failure, concurred with no less zeal in the promotion of his wishes, and he soon found himself importuned on every side to accept the command. But it now became his part to make objections. Perhaps he began to open his eyes to the difficulties to be confronted in Ireland. Perhaps he penetrated too late the designs and expectations of his adversaries at home. Perhaps, for his character was not free from artifice, he chose by a display of reluctance to enhance in the eyes of his sovereigns the merit of his final acquiescence. However this might be, the difficulties which he raised kept the business for some time in suspense. Secretary Cecil observed in a letter of December 4th, 1598, that, quote, the opinion of the Earl's going to Ireland had some stop, by reason of his lordship's indisposition to it, except with some such conditions as were disagreeable to Her Majesty's mind. Quote, although, he added, the cup will hardly pass from him in regard of his worth and fortune, but if it do, my lord Montjoy is named. End quote. It was in the midst of the debates and contentions on this matter that Essex endeavoured to work upon the feelings of Elizabeth by the following romantic but eloquent address. Quote, to the Queen. From a mind delighting in sorrow, from spirits wasted with passion, from a heart torn in pieces with care, grief, and travel, from a man that hateth himself and all things else that keep him alive, what service can your Majesty expect, since any service past deserves no more than banishment and proscription to the cursedest of all islands? It is your rebel's pride and succession must give me leave to ransom myself out of this hateful prison, out of my loathed body, which, if it happeneth so, your majesty shall have no cause to mislike the fashion of my death, since the course of my life could never please you. Happy could he finish forth his fate in some unhaunted desert most obscure from all society, from love and hate of worldly folk, than should he sleep secure. Then wake again, and yield God ever praise, content with hips and haws and brambleberry, in contemplation passing out his days, and change of holy thoughts to make him merry. Who, when he dies, his tomb may be a bush, where harmless robin dwells with gentle thrush. Your Majesty's exiled servant, Robert Essex. It seems also to have been at this juncture that on some public occasion he bore a plain morning shield, with the words, Par nulla figura dolori. A very sensible and friendly letter addressed to Harrington by his relation Robert Markham, may serve to throw additional light on the situation and sentiments of Essex, and on the state of court parties. Mr. Robert Markham to John Harrington, Esquire, quote, Notwithstanding the perilous state of our times, I shall not fail to give you such intelligence and advices of our matters here as may tend to your use and benefit. We have gotten good account of some matters, and as I shall find some safe conduct for bearing them to you, it may from time to time happen that I send tidings of our courtly concerns. Since your departure from hence, you have been spoken of, and with no ill will, both by the nobles and the queen herself. Your book is almost forgiven, and I may say forgotten, but not for its lack of wit or satire. Those whom you feared most are now bosoming themselves in the queen's grace, and though her highness signified displeasure in outward sort, yet did she like the marrow of your book. Your great enemy, Sir James, did once mention the star-chamber, but your good esteem in better minds outdid his endeavours, and all is silent again. 
the queen is minded to take you to her favour but she sweareth that she believes you will make epigrams and write misacmos again on her and all the court she hath been heard to say that merry poet her godson must not come to greenwich till he hath grown sober and leaveth the ladies sports and frolics she did conceive much disquiet on being told you had aimed a shaft at leicester i wish you knew the author of that ill deed i would not be in his best jerkin for a thousand marks you yet stand well in her highness's love and i hear you are to go to ireland with the lieutenant essex if so mark my counsel in this matter i doubt not your valour nor your labour but that uncovered honesty will mar your fortunes observe the man who commandeth and yet is commanded himself he goeth not forth to serve the queen's realm but to humour his own revenge be heedful of your bearings speak not your mind to all you meet i tell you i have ground for my caution essex hath enemies he hath friends too now there are two or three of montjoy's kindred sent out in your army they are to report all your conduct to us at home as you love yourself the queen and me discover not these matters if i did not love you they had never been told high concerns deserve high attention you are to take account of all that passes in your expedition and keep journal thereof unknown to any in the company this will be expected of you i have reasons to give for this order if the lord deputy performs in the field what he hath promised in the council all will be well but though the queen hath granted forgiveness for his late demeanour in her presence we know not what to think hereof she hath in all outward semblance placed confidence in the man who so lately sought other treatment at her hands we do sometime think one way and sometime another what betideth the lord deputy is known to him only who knoweth all but when a man hath so many showing friends and so many unshowing enemies who learneth his end here below i say do not you meddle in any sort nor give your jesting too freely among those you know not obey the lord deputy in all things but give not your opinion it may be heard in england though you obey yet seem not to advise in any one point your obeisance may be and must be construed well but your counsel may be ill thought of if any bad business follow you have now a secret from one that wishes you all welfare and honour i know there are overlookers set on you all so god direct your discretion sir william knowles is not well pleased the queen is not well pleased the lord deputy may be pleased now but i sore fear what may happen hereafter the heart of man lieth close hid oft time men do not carry it in their hand nor should they do so that wish to thrive in these times and in these places i say this that your own honesty may not show itself too much and turn to your own ill favour stifle your understanding as much as may be mind your books and make your jests but take heed who they light on my love hath overcome almost my confidence and trust which my truth and place demandeth i have said too much for one in my dependent occupation and yet too little for a friend and kinsman who putteth himself to this hard trial for your advantage you have difficult matters to encounter beside tyrone and the rebels there is little heed to be had to show of affection in state business i find this by those i discourse with daily and those too of the wiser sort if my lord treasurer had lived longer matters would go on surer he was our great pilot on whom all cast their eyes and sought their safety the queen's highness doth often speak of him in tears and turn aside when he is discoursed of nay even forbiddeth any mention to be made of his name in the council this i learn by some friends who are in good liking with my lord buckhurst my sister beareth this to you but doth not know what it containeth nor would i disclose my dealings to any woman in this sort for danger goeth abroad and silence is the safest armour etc such were the bodings of distant evil with which the more discerning contemplated the new and arduous enterprise in which the ambition of essex had engaged him in the meantime all things conspired to delude him into a false security and to augment that presumption which formed the most dangerous defect of his character all the obstacles which had delayed his appointment were gradually smoothed away the queen consented to invest him with powers far more ample than had ever been conferred on a lord deputy before all his requisitions of men and other supplies were complied with and an army of twenty thousand foot and thirteen hundred horse afterwards increased to two thousand a far larger force than ireland had yet beheld was placed at his disposal at parting the tenderness of the queen revived in full force and she dismissed him with expressions of regret and affection which as he afterwards professed to her had quote, pierced his very soul end quote. the people followed him with acclamations and blessings and the flower of the nobility now as in the cadiz expedition attended him with alacrity as volunteers it was in the end of march fifteen ninety nine that he embarked and landing after a dangerous passage at dublin 
his first act was the appointment of his dear friend the Earl of Southampton to the office of General of the Horse, a step which he afterwards found abundant cause to repent. An error of which consequences were much more pernicious to himself, and fatal to the success of his undertaking, was his abandoning his original resolution of marching immediately against Tyrone, and spending his first efforts in the suppression of a minor revolt in Munster, an attempt in which he encountered a resistance so much more formidable than he had anticipated, and found himself so ill supported by his troops, whom the nature of the service speedily disheartened, that its results were by no means so brilliant as to strike terror into Tyrone or the other insurgents. What was still worse, almost four months were occupied in this service, and the forces returned sick, wearied, and incredibly reduced in number by various accidents. Learning that the Queen was much displeased at this expedition into Munster, Essex addressed a letter to the Privy Council, in which, after affirming that he had performed his part to the best of his abilities and judgment, he thus proceeded, quote, But as I said, and ever must say, I provided for this service a breastplate, and not a cuirass. That is, I am armed on the breast, but not on the back. I armed myself with confidence that rebels in so unjust a quarrel could not fight so well as we could in a good. How be it if the rebels shall but once come to know that I am wounded on the back, not slightly, but to the heart, as I fear me they have too true and too apparent advertisement of this kind, then what will be their pride and the state's hazard your lordships in your wisdoms may easily discern." In a subsequent letter the warmth of his friendship for Southampton breaks out in the following eloquent and forcible appeal, quote, but to leave this, and to come to that which I never looked I should have come to, I mean your lordship's letter touching the displacing of the Earl of Southampton. Your lordship say that her majesty thinketh it strange, and taketh it offensively, that I should appoint him general of the horse, seeing not only her majesty denied it when I moved it, but gave an express prohibition to any such choice. Surely, my lord, it shall be far from me to contest with your lordships, much less with her majesty. How be it, God and my own soul are my witnesses, that I had not in this nomination any disobedient or irreverent thought, that I never moved her majesty for the placing of any officer, my commission fully enabling me to make free choice of all officers and commanders of the army. I remember that her majesty in her privy chamber at Richmond, I only being with her, showed a dislike of his having any office, but my answer was that if her majesty would revoke my commission, I would cast both it and myself at her majesty's feet. But if it pleased her majesty that I should execute it, I must work with my own instruments, and from this profession and protestation I never varied whereas if I had held myself barred from giving my lord of Southampton place and reputation some way answerable to his degree and expense, there is no one, I think, doth imagine that I loved him so ill as to have brought him over. Therefore, if Her Majesty punished me with her displeasure for this choice, pena dolenda venit. And now, my lords, were now, as then it was, that I were to choose, or were there nothing in a new choice but my lord of Southampton's disgrace and my discomfort, I should easily be induced to displace him and to part with him but when in obeying this command I must discourage all my friends, who now, seeing the days of my suffering draw near, follow me afar off, and are some of them tempted to renounce me. When I must dismay the army, which already looks sadly, as pitying both me and itself in this comfortless action. When I must encourage the rebels, who doubtless will think it time to hew upon a withering tree, and whose leaves they see beaten down, and the branches in part cut off when I must disable myself for ever in the course of this service, the world now perceiving that I want either reason to judge of merit, or freedom to fight it, disgraces being there heaped, where, in my opinion, rewards are due. Give just grief leave once to complain. O oh, miserable employment, and more miserable destiny of mine, that makes it impossible for me to please and serve Her Majesty at once! Was it treason in my Lord of Southampton to marry my poor kinswoman, that neither long imprisonment nor any punishment besides that hath been usual in like cases can satisfy and appease or will no kind of punishment be fit for him but that which punisheth not him but me this army and this poor country of ireland shall i keep the country when the army breaks or shall the army stand when all the volunteers leave it or will any voluntary stay when those that have will and cause to follow are thus handled no my lords they already ask passports and that daily end quote, etc in spite of all this earnestness, in spite of the remaining affection of the Queen for her favourite, she still persisted in requiring that he should displace his friend, and even chid him severely for having waited the result of his further representations and entreaties, after once learning her pleasure on the point. Success in the main object of his expedition might still have procured him a triumph over his court enemies, and a sweet reconciliation with his offended sovereign. But fortune had no such favour in store for Essex. 
the necessity of quelling some rebels in Leinster again impeded his march into Ulster, for which expedition he was obliged to solicit a further supply from England of two thousand foot, which was immediately forwarded to him, as if with the design of leaving him without excuse should he fail to reduce Tyrone. But by this time the season was so far advanced, and the army so sickly, that both the Earl and the Irish Council were of opinion that nothing effectual could be done and at the first notice of his intended march great part of his forces deserted. He nevertheless proceeded, and in a few days during which a little skirmishing took place, came in sight of the rebels' main army, considerably more numerous than his own. Tyrone, however, would not venture to give him battle, but sent to request a parley. This, after some delay, the Lord Deputy granted, and a conference was held between them, Essex standing on the bank of a stream which separated the two hosts, while the rebel sat on his horse in the middle of the water a truce was concluded to be renewed from six weeks to six weeks till terms of peace should be agreed on those proposed by tyrone containing several arrogant and unreasonable articles at a second meeting with the irish chief essex was attended by some of his principal officers but it was afterwards proved that previously to the first conference he had opened a very unwarrantable correspondence with this enemy of his queen and country who took upon himself to promise that if essex would come into his measures he would make him the greatest man in england during the whole of this time sharp letters were passing between Elizabeth and her Privy Council and the Earl, and it is hard to say on which side the heaviest list of grievances was produced. The Queen remonstrated against his contemptuous disobedience of her orders, and the waste and frivolous enterprises of the vast supplies of men and money which she had entrusted to her deputy for a specific and momentous object. The Earl, in addition to his usual murmurings against the sinister suggestions of his enemies, amongst whom he singled out by name Raleigh and Lord Cobham, found further grounds of complaint and alarm in the circumstance of her majesty's having caused some troops to be called out under the lord admiral on pretext of fears from the spaniard but really with a view of protecting her against certain designs imputed to himself and in her having granted to secretary cecil during his absence the office of master of the wards for which he was himself a suitor apprehensive lest by his longer delay her affection should be irrecoverably alienated from him by the discovery of his traitorous correspondence with tyrone he rashly resolved to risk yet another act of disobedience, that of deserting without license, and under its present accumulated circumstances of danger, his important charge, and hastening to throw himself at the feet of an exasperated, but he flattered himself not inexorable mistress. At one time he had even entertained the desperate and criminal design of carrying over with him a large part of his army, for the purpose of intimidating his adversaries, but being diverted from this scheme by the Earl of Southampton and Sir Christopher Blount his stepfather, he embarked with the attendance only of most of his household and a number of his favourite officers, and arrived at the court, which was then at Nonsuch, on Michaelmas Eve in the morning. On alighting at the gate, covered with mire and stained with travel as he was, he hastened up the stairs, passed through the presence and the privy chambers, and never stopped till he reached the Queen's bedchamber, where he found her newly risen with her hair about her face. He kneeled and kissed her hands, and she, in the agreeable surprise of beholding at her feet one whom she still loved, received him with so kind an aspect, and listened with such favour to his excuses, that on leaving her, after a private conference of some duration, he appeared in high spirits, and thanked God, that though he had suffered many storms abroad, he found a sweet calm at home. He waited on her again, as soon as he had changed his dress, and after a second long and gracious conference, was freely visited by all the lords, ladies, and gentlemen at court, excepting the secretary and his party, who appeared somewhat shy of him but all these fair appearances quickly vanished. On revisiting the Queen in the evening, he found her much changed towards him. She began to call him to account for his unauthorized return, and the hazard to which he had committed all things in Ireland, and four privy councillors were appointed by her to examine him that night and hear his answers. But by them nothing was concluded, and the matter was referred to a full council summoned for the following day, the Earl being in the meantime commanded to keep his chamber. Notwithstanding the natural impetuosity of his temper, Essex now armed himself with patience and moderation, and answered with great gravity and discretion to the charges brought against him, which resolved themselves into the following articles. Quote, his contemptuous disobedience of Her Majesty's letters and will in returning, his presumptuous letters written from time to time, his proceedings in Ireland contrary to the points resolved upon in England, ere he went, his rash manner of coming away from Ireland, his overbold going the day before to Her Majesty's presence to her bedchamber, and his making of so many idle nights. End quote. The council, after hearing his defence, remained a while in consultation, and then made their report to Her Majesty, 
who said she should take time to consider of his answers. Meanwhile the proceedings were kept very private, and the Earl continued a prisoner in his own apartment. An open division now took place between the two great factions, which had long divided the court in secret. The Earls of Shrewsbury and Nottingham, Lords Thomas Howard, Cobham, and Grey, Sir Walter Raleigh, and Sir George Carew, attended on the secretary, while Essex was followed by the Earls of Worcester and Rutland, Lords Montjoy, Rich, Lumley, and Henry Howard, the last of whom, however, was already suspected to be the traitor, which he afterwards proved to the patron whom he professed to love, to honour, and almost to worship. Sir William Knowles also joined the party of his nephew, with many other knights and gentlemen, and Lord Effingham, though son to the Earl of Nottingham, was often with him, and, quote, protested all service to him. Quote, it is a world to be here, adds White, and to see the humours of the place, end quote. On October the 2nd, Essex was commanded from court, and committed to the Lord Keeper, with whom he remained at York House. At his departure from court, few or none of his friends accompanied him. Quote, his lordship's sudden return out of Ireland, says White, brings all sorts of knights, captains, officers, and soldiers away from thence, that this town is full of them, to the great discontentment of Her Majesty, that they are suffered to leave their charge. But the most part of the gallants have quitted their commands, places, and companies, not willing to stay there after him, so that the disorder seems to be greater there than stands with the safety of that service." Harrington, the wit and poet, had the misfortune to be one of the threescore idle knights, dubbed by the Lord Deputy during his short and inglorious reign, and likewise one of the officers whom he selected to accompany him in his return, and we may learn from two of his own letters, written several years subsequently, after what manner he was welcomed on his arrival by his royal godmother. Quote, Sir John Harrington to Dr. Still, the Bishop of Bath and Wells, 1603. My worthy lord, I have lived to see that rebel Tyrone brought to England, courteously favoured, honoured, and well liked. O oh, my lord, what is there which doth not prove the inconstancy of worldly matters? How did I labour after that knave's destruction? I was called from my home by Her Majesty's command, adventured perils by sea and land, endured toil, was near starving, ate horse-flesh at Munster, and all to quell that man, who now smileth in peace at those that did hazard their lives to destroy him. Essex took me to Ireland, I had scant time to put on my boots. I followed with good will, and did return with the Lord Lieutenant to meet ill-will. I did bear the frowns of her that sent me, and were it not for her good liking, rather than my good deservings, I had been sore discountenanced indeed. I obeyed in going with the Earl to Ireland, and I obeyed in coming with him to England. But what did I encounter thereon? not his wrath, but my gracious sovereign's ill-humour. What did I advantage? Why, truly a knighthood, which had been better bestowed by her that sent me, and better spared by him that gave it. I shall never put out of memory Her Majesty's displeasure. I entered her chamber, but she frowned and said, What, did the fool bring you too? Go back to your business. In sooth, these words did sore hurt him that never heard such before. But heaven gave me more comfort in a day or two after. Her Majesty did please to ask me concerning our northern journeys, and I did so well quit me of the account that she favoured me with such discourse that the Earl himself had been well glad of. And now doth Tyrone dare us old commanders with his presence and protection, end quote, etc. Quote, Sir John Harrington to Sir Robert Barkham, 1606. My good cousin, herewith you will have my journal, with our history during our march against the Irish rebels. I did not intend any eyes should have seen this discourse but my own children's. Yet, alas, it happened otherwise, for the Queen did so ask, and I may say, demand my account, that I could not withhold showing it, and I even now almost tremble to rehearse Her Highness's displeasure hereat. She swore by God's son we were all idle knaves, and the Lord Deputy worse, for wasting our time and her commands in such wise as my journal doth write of. I could have told Her Highness of such difficulties, straits, and annoyance, as did not appear therein to her eyes, nor, I found, could be brought to her ear for her collar did outrun all reason, though I did meet it at a second hand. For what show she gave at first to my Lord Deputy at his return was far more grievous, as will appear in good time. I marvel to think what strange humours do conspire to patch up the natures of some minds. The elements do seem to strive which shall conquer and rise above the other. In good sooth our late Queen did enfold them all together. I bless her memory for all her goodness to me and my family, and now will I show you what strange temperament she did sometimes put forth. Her mind was oft-times like the gentle air that cometh from the westerly point in a summer's morn. T'was sweet and refreshing to all around her. Her speech did win all affections, and her subjects did try to show all love to her commands. For she would say, 
her state did require her to command what she knew her people would willingly do from their own love to her. Herein did she show her wisdom fully, for who did choose to lose her confidence, or who would withhold a show of love and obedience when their sovereign said it was their own choice, and not her compulsion? Surely she did play well her tables to gain obedience thus without constraint. Again could she put forth such alterations when obedience was lacking, as left no doubtings whose daughter she was. I say this was plain on the Lord Deputy's coming home, when I did come into her presence. She chafed much, walked fastly to and fro, looked with discomposure in her visage, and I remember she catched my girdle when I kneeled to her and swore, by God's son, I am no queen, that man is above me. Who gave him command to come here so soon? I did send him on other business. It was long before more gracious discourse did fall to my hearing, but I was then put out of my trouble, and bid go home. I did not stay to be bidden twice. If all the Irish rebels had been at my heels, I should not have made better speed, for I did now flee from one whom I both loved and feared, too." End quote. The fate of Essex remained long in suspense while several little circumstances seemed to indicate the strength of Her Majesty's resentment against him, especially her denying, to the personal request of Lady Walsingham, permission for the Earl to write to his Countess, her daughter, who was in childbed, and exceedingly troubled that she neither saw nor heard from her husband, and afterwards her refusing to allow his family physician access to him, though he was now so ill as to be attended by several other physicians, with whom, however, Dr. Brown was permitted to consult. At the same time, it was given out that if he would beg his liberty for the purpose of going back to Ireland, it would be granted him. But he appeared resolute never to return thither, and professed a determination of leading henceforth a retired life in the country, free from all participation in public affairs. Pamphlets were written on his case, but immediately suppressed by authority, and perhaps at the request of the Earl himself, whose behaviour at this time exhibited nothing but duty and submission his sister lady rich and lady southampton quitted essex house and went into the country because the resort of company to them had given offence he himself neither saw nor desired to see any one his very servants were afraid to meet in any place to make merry lest it might be ill taken Quote, lady scrope is only noted to stand firm to him for she endures much at her majesty's hands because she daily does all kind offices of love to the queen in his behalf she wears all black she mourns and is pensive enjoys in nothing but in a solitary being alone, and his thought she says much that few would venture to say but herself." This generous woman was daughter to the first Lord Hunsdon, and nearly related both to the Queen and to Essex. She was sister to the Countess of Nottingham, who is believed to have acted so opposite a part. About the middle of October strong hopes were entertained of the Earl's enlargement, but it was said that, quote, he stood to have his liberty by the like warrant he was committed, end quote. The secretary was pleased to express to him the satisfaction that he felt in seeing Her Majesty so well appeased by his demeanour, and his own wish to promote his good and contentment. The reasons which he had assigned for his conduct in Ireland appeared to have satisfied the Privy Council, and mollified the Queen. But Her Majesty characteristically declared that she would not bear the blame of his imprisonment, and before she and her council could settle amongst them on whom it should be made to rest, a new cause of exasperation arose. Tyrone, in a letter to Essex which was intercepted, declared that he found it impossible to prevail on his confederates to observe the conditions of truce agreed upon between them, and the Queen, relapsing into anger, triumphantly asked if there did not now appear good cause for the Earl's committal. She immediately made known to Lord Montjoy her wish that he should undertake the government of Ireland, but the friendship of this nobleman to Essex, joined with a hope that the Queen might be induced to liberate him by a necessity of again employing his talents in that country, induced Montjoy to excuse himself. The council unanimously recommended to Her Majesty the enlargement of the prisoner, but she angrily replied that such contempts as he had been guilty of ought to be openly punished. They answered that by her sovereign power and the rigour of law such punishment might indeed be inflicted, but that it would be inconsistent with her clemency and her honour. She, however, caused heads of accusation to be drawn up against him. All this time Essex continued very sick, and his high spirit condescended to supplications like the following, quote, when the creature entereth into account with the Creator, it can never number in how many things it needs mercy, or in how many it receives it. But he that is best stored must still say, Da nobis hodie, and he that hath showed most thankfulness must ask again, Quid retribuamus? And I can no sooner finish this my first audit, most dear and most admired sovereign, but I come to consider how large a measure of his grace, and how great a resemblance of his power, God hath given you upon earth and how many ways he giveth occasion to you to exercise these divine offices upon us that are your vassals. 
this confession best fitteth me of all men and this confession is most joyfully and most humbly now made by me of all times i acknowledge upon the knees of my heart your majesty's infinite goodness in granting my humble petition god who seeth all is witness how faithfully i do vow to dedicate the rest of my life next after my highest duty in obedience faith and zeal to your majesty without admitting any other worldly care and whatsoever your majesty resolveth to do with me i shall live and die your majesty's humblest vassal essex end quote. the earl abased himself in vain those courtiers who had formerly witnessed her majesty's tenderness and indulgence towards him now wondered at the violence of her resentment and somewhat of mystery still involves the motives of her conduct at one time she deferred his liberation quote, because she heard that some of his friends and followers should say he was wrongfully imprisoned end quote. and the french ambassador who spoke for him found her very short and bitter on that point soon after however on hearing that he continued very sick and was making his will she was surprised into some signs of pity and gave orders that a few of his friends should be admitted to visit him and that he should be allowed the liberty of the garden alarmed at these relentings raleigh to whose nature the basest court acts were not repugnant thought proper to fall sick in his turn and was healed in like manner by a gracious message from the queen the countess of essex was indefatigable in her applications to persons in power but with little avail all that was gained for the dejected prisoner was effected by the intercession of some of the queen's favourite ladies who obtained leave for his two sisters to come to court and solicit for him soon after the storm seemed to gather strength again a warrant was made out for the earl's committal to the tower and though it was not carried into force quote, the hopes of liberty grew cold end quote. about the middle of november lord montjoy received orders to prepare for ireland the appearance of the first part of a history in latin of the life and reign of henry the fourth by sir john hayward dedicated to the earl of essex was the unfortunate occasion of fresh offence to the queen the subject as containing the deposition of a lawful prince was in itself unpalatable but what gave the work in her jealous eyes a peculiar and sinister meaning was an expression addressed to the earl which may be thus rendered quote, you are great both in present judgment and future expectation end quote. hayward was detained a considerable time in prison and the queen from an idle suspicion that the piece was in fact the production of some more dangerous character declared that she would have him racked to discover the secret quote, nay madam answered francis bacon he is a doctor never rack his person but rack his style let him have pen ink and paper and help of books and be enjoined to continue the story where it breaketh off and i will undertake by collating the styles to judge whether he were the author or no end quote. and thus her mind was diverted from this atrocious purpose end of section forty five